Welcome to the Old Time Movie Radio Show, where we play a compilation of a great old time radio show based on your favorite movie characters and actors with the sounds of a crackling fireplace. Tonight's show is featuring The New Adventures of Michael Shane, starring Jeff Chandler as Shane. Now, Michael Shane was a character created in the 1930s by writer Brett Holiday. Starting in 1940, 20th Century Fox made a series of films with Lloyd Nolan playing Shane. Then in 1946, five more films were made with Hugh Beaumont in the title role. In 1944, the show Michael Shane, Private Detective, was broadcast on the Don Lee Network. Wally Mayer had the title role. Then in 1946, the radio show went to the Mutual Network, where it went nationwide. Now around 1948, there was a second incarnation of the show, The New Adventures of Michael Shane, with Jeff Chandler in the title role. Those are the episodes we're going to be listening to tonight. And then in 1952, ABC would carry The Adventures of Michael Shane. And it starred Donald Curtis, Robert Sterling, and Vinton Hayworth. But as I said tonight, we're focusing on the new adventures of Michael Shane with Jeff Chandler in the title role. These shows were produced in 1948-1949, and they're set in New Orleans. So it's an interesting backdrop for radio shows of this era, and I think we're in for a real treat. Tonight's show also features the relaxing sights and sounds of a crackling fireplace. Just before we get into the action, I want to mention that Hearth and Home Entertainment is not an ad-supported channel. While YouTube is free, it does take a lot of time and money to keep a channel like this going. So we really appreciate your support. Help keep us on YouTube. If you would, take a minute to check out the links in the description below. Check out coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. And many of you have asked about using PayPal and coffee.com. The first option would be the best for you. Another great way you can support the channel is to check out the Hearth and Home Shop on Etsy. I've got a link for that down below as well. There you'll find a great assortment of old-time radio-themed goodies and maybe a Bigfoot shirt or two. Well, now, without any further ado, let's get on with our program. So it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy Jeff Chandler in The New Adventures of Michael Shane. <laughs> Boy, fully tossed with the flesh on my left shoulder. There was nothing between him and me now except the tree. I stood there waiting. There were two more shots left in the gun. I caught the glint of the gun barrel in the moonlight, and then the granddaddy of all firecrackers blew up in my face. <laughs> New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to Michael Shane, that reckless red-headed Irishman back at his old haunts in New Orleans, in another transcribed episode. We call it The Hate That Killed. Michael, you old capitalist, how do you do it? Mr. Shane, Uh, Mr. Shane, you've got to listen to me. You've got to help me. I do. Oh, oh, Sanderson. Hey, you look better in your newspaper pictures. I thought I made it clear I wasn't interested in your case. But on the telephone, you wouldn't let me tell you what I want. I've got plenty of money. I'm not interested in your money either. Right on that door, it says Michael Shane, private detective, doesn't it? Well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It cost me two bits a letter, too. You said something about somebody wanting to kill you. Yeah. Well, why don't you take your troubles to the police? I can't. I don't have anything to tell them. You think I'm a crank, don't you? No, I think you're very charming, Mr. Sanderson. Just keep your voice down. I know. I know a weak, dissipated body and a mind that's crazy half the time. But if you lived one day, just one day, in the atmosphere I do, you'd be shaking just like me. I tell you, I tell you, death is in the air. Yeah, yeah, sure. What's the matter? That scare you? I suppose you like divorce cases, alimony, spying on women. I'll bet you like spying on women. Well, that's enough, Buster. Goodbye now. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I tell you, I, I'm going to die. Not in my office. I'm busy. Beat it. You don't, you don't believe me. Look, look, just tell me one thing. Yeah? One thing. Why did the insurance company refuse to sell me any life insurance? From where I sit, you look like a mighty bad risk. No. No, I've had an examination for my personal physician. There's nothing wrong with me. That is a matter of opinion. They wouldn't tell me the real reason. That was just an out. All right, so what? Just find out, that's all. Just find out why they refused me. Well, it'll cost you 20 a day in expenses. Oh, here's my address. You, yeah. You'll find three houses on the estate. Mine's on the uh, on the right of the big house. I know all about you, Sanderson, and your famous father. He died the other day, didn't he? Yes. 
Yes, he's dead. And he wasn't my father. Huh? He was my stepfather. That's why I used the name of Mark Sanderson. But his corruption lives on like... Like something rotten inside you that you can't get out. Like something in your blood and your heart. And you can't tear it out. Hey, that's cute. You ought to set it to music. Are you always this jittery? Why shouldn't I be jittery? I, uh... Do you, do you have some water? Water? You mean you drink water, too? Yes, sir. My, my medicine, my, my capsules, you know, my nerves. You'll find some water down the hall. You'll, you'll let me know tonight, huh? You'll find out? Yeah, yeah. I got a pretty good hunch why they refused your policy. You do? Why? Why? Because they probably don't expect you to live very long, Mr. Sanderson. <laughs> We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the hate that killed. He was a fancy client, all right. Mark Sanderson, stepson of the late Gregory Lawson. He was still young, maybe 30, but all his stepfather's filthy millions could never make a man out of him or give him anything decent out of life. He sat in my office, slobbering with fear, his eyes dull and empty. I don't need clients like that, but the insurance company angle intrigued me. Why had they refused Mark Sanderson's policy? Well, I turned toward my phone, feeling like a Hollywood agent doing his best for a client he didn't have much hope for, and dialed the life insurance company. I'm sorry, you'll have to speak to Miss Bennett. It was the old chevron. Miss Bennett was maybe the 30th vice president in charge of bathtub accidents. We cannot give out that information, but if you speak to Mr. Forsyth, he's the branch manager. All I had to do was mention Mark Sanderson's name, and there'd be a long pause on the other end, and then... No, sir, we can't discuss our policy with you, Mr. Shane. The matter is closed. It is entirely within our own discretion whether or not we choose to insure Mr. Sanderson's life or anyone else's. No, I wasn't getting anywhere. Nobody was going to tell me the real reason they'd refused Mark Sanderson life insurance. I got Dave Sizenby on the phone. Dave used to be a private eye and then went to work as a detective for the insurance company. He said he'd see what he could do. I waited about ten minutes and then... Jane speaking. Mike? Yeah, Dave. It's hush, hush. Hey, what's going on? You're beginning to make me think Sanderson really has something to worry about. I don't know. All I could tell you is that it might be a good idea to see a lawyer by the name of Almsby. Who? Almsby. O-L-M-S-B-Y. In the Lee building downtown. That's all? No, one more thing. You, uh, didn't get the information from me. <laughs> Olmsby, attorney at law. The office was easily as old as Olmsby himself. About 70. Dried up like a prune. His voice was like parchment, dry as dust and ready to crack. You're a shrewd young man by the look of you. And if you have in your head the good sense to avoid unnecessary trouble, you will desist from inquiring into the affairs of the Larson family. Well, that's as pretty a turn threat as I've ever heard. It's excellent advice, Mr. Shane. As for your question, I am not at liberty to divulge any information. You mean to me? To you or anyone else. I realize Mark's hysteria has caused you some trouble. And as the family attorney, I'll be glad to pay. Smooth. I didn't think I was going to take this case, Mr. Ormsby, but you know I'm getting more and more interested. Then you will get yourself more and more involved. Well, that's my business, Mr. Ormsby. Mr. Shane... You must anticipate a short life. Could be, Mr. Olsby. At least a happy one. So long, Pop. Well, I found out a few things before I went out to the swamps where the old man had dug in after he retreated from the New Orleans reform movement. He'd built a large house for himself, a smaller one for his second wife and stepdaughter, and another for his stepson. He kept his cousin Agatha with him. Seems he separated from his immediate family, kept tight hold on them, but didn't want them too close. And he'd finally died two days ago after a long illness. I went down there to his little kingdom in the swamp and got a funny feeling. 
A little chill, even though it was a warm night. Little rolling wisps of fog. Night sounds that had a death knell in them. There were lights on downstairs in the old man's house, but I headed for young Mark Sanderson's place. It was dark, and I thought I'd mosey around the house to the back when... Somebody was playing hide-and-seek with me. Okay, Uh, take it easy. Who is it? Just a friend, pal. A word to the wise thing. All right, I'm listening. You're not wanted around here. Who doesn't want me? Nobody. Okay, I get the message. Why don't you guys ever listen? This is for your own good, pal. I don't want to have to use this blackjack. You made a mistake. Never tip your mitt. You asked for it, bro. Yeah, you move pretty fast for a big guy, but not fast enough. All right, I got the blackjack now. Come on, get up. Yeah, now beat it. Yeah. Shane, you surprised me. Must be something to it, after all. The bigger they are. Well, that was quite an exhibition. Oh, are they wearing revolvers with dinner dresses this year? Who are you? Mike Shane. There's a flagstone path here. Let's get around front, out of the shadows. You must be Celia, Mark's sister. But do you, uh, you have to keep pointing that gun at me? Yes, for a while. Well, anyhow, I'm glad to... Oh. Yes? Oh, my. What's the matter? Haven't you ever seen a woman before? Not very often like you. Is that really the color of your hair? My hair has been red since the day I was born. You've got nice shoulders. Oh, I like yours better. You're going to catch cold in that outfit. You have what so many men lack these days. A sense of virility and strength. Well, that comes from eating all my vegetables. What are you snooping around here for? I was looking for Mark. Oh. You're the detective he hired. Check. Now you do interest me. Who's the man you were fighting with? Don't you know? No, I don't, Mr. Shane, isn't it? That's right. Mark and Aunt Agatha and Mother are in the house. Oh? The reading of Stepfather's Will tonight. Um, Mr. Ernsby, the lawyer. May I come along? Why not? Don't go in. They've already started. So what? I want to hear that word. Who's in there? They all are. I don't want to interrupt. I'll open the door a little. Yeah. Quite a gathering. Yes. Mother, Aunt Agatha, Mark. Hold it on. I want to listen. All my property, real and personal, owned by me at the time of my death, to that person, from among my four heirs, who outlives all others. Oh, oh, no. Whether it be my cousin Agatha, my stepdaughter Celia, my dissolute stepson Mark, or my neglectful wife Margaret. Well, I know you do something like that all the time. These goods shall be bequeathed, therefore. Only after the death of my last heir, but one. And in the event my inheritor cannot by law inherit, then these goods shall pass to Philip Armsby or his heirs and decide. Well, that's it. That's going, Mr. Shane. Okay. Well, we waited for you, Miss Celia. We didn't know where you were. Thank you, Mr. Armsby. Mr. Shane, did you hear that? Did you hear? There's your answer, Mark. That's the reason your insurance was refused. Yes, he couldn't stop hating. It's so obvious, isn't it? Dear father wants us to kill one another off. Mother. (laughs) Poor mother. He couldn't leave you alone, could he? Even after he died. My mother, Mr. Shane. Mrs. Larson. And my aunt Agatha, father's cousin. Apparently, cousin Agatha was bored by the proceedings. Oh, and Agatha's always taking catnaps. Agatha, Agatha, wake up. Maud, stop shaking her. Oh, she doesn't want to wake up. I... Oh, Aunt Agatha. She... She's not moving. She... She's not breathing. For a very good reason. Your Aunt Agatha's taken her last catnip. She's dead. <laughs> We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the hate that killed. I 
didn't want to take the case in the first place, but it was the insurance angle that got me. Why was Mark Sanderson's insurance refused? I couldn't get any information from the insurance company. I couldn't get it from the lawyer Olmsby either. But then I found out what it was all about. The insurance company must have got wind of the terms of the old man's will. <laughs> and what a will. Old Gregory Larson's wife and Mark and Celia and his cousin Agatha, all of them were heirs in a sort of ten little Indians routine. All his money to go to the last one to stay alive or to lawyer Olmsby. And the old man wanted them to kill each other off. It was that simple. I wanted a few words with my client, Mark, and I waited while Sergeant Lavery went through his routine with him and then decided to bust it up. I want protection. I'm a taxpayer. I don't care what you have to do. Put me in jail if you want to. Now, I slow demand down, protection. Sanderson. You'll blow a gasket. Where do you fit in here, Shane? Well, like I told you, Sergeant, this is my client. I suppose now you're convinced someone is going to try to kill me, Shane? I had a talk with your sister, Celia, Mark. You didn't tell me you lived here a few days before your stepfather died. Celia and I came here just before he died. But it didn't mean anything. You heard his will. Yeah. Uh, Sergeant. What? Why don't you lock him up? Maybe jail is the safest place for him. Okay. Speak to Denton inside. Yes. Yes, I will. I will. All right, Shane. Your client's taken care of. You can go home now. No, I think I'll stick around, Sergeant. Why? You think there's going to be more killings? Well, now, Sergeant, don't you? I was curious about Margaret Lusk, Mark's mother. Why hadn't she been with her husband the last days of his life? Why had he called Mark and Celia, not her? The more time I spent in this atmosphere of death and hate, the more jittery I got. Margaret Larson was sitting in her living room. A low fire crackled in the fireplace. That was the only light in the room. She sat erect in an old, creaky rocking chair by the fire, a light glinting on her dark brown eyes that were just a little too bright. When will it stop, Mr. Shane? As long as I can remember, it's been like this. The fear, the hate. Yeah. I don't remember anything else. It's never been normal. Mm. His hatred touched all of us. That horrible, sick man inside his house. Never going outside. But you felt him all the time. Well, you weren't smart enough of him to marry him. That was my mistake. He hated you more than the others. Yes. Mr. Shane... Yes. How did Agatha die? She was poisoned. What kind of poison? I don't know yet. What about Celia and Mark? What's going to happen to them? Yeah, Mark, by his own request, is in jail or on his way. Jail? Yeah, he said he wanted protection. Oh. And Celia, she's the kind who can take care of herself. Hey, look, I'm getting the willies or something. Can't we have some more light in here? I... What's the matter? Mr. Shane. You know what? In all the years I've spent in this swamp land, I've, I've seemed to develop an extra sense what of... What are you it. trying to say? There's someone in this room. I don't hear anyone. You weren't supposed to. Oh. What? Oh. The sucker for a left hook. My pal with a warning. Don't move, pal. Don't even blink your eyes. I got a gun. I'm not getting too close to you. Come back for a rematch? I, uh, I better answer the phone. You better not. You. Yes. Answer it. Hello? Yes, Sergeant. This is Mrs. Larson. <gasps> Thank you, Sergeant. What is it, Mrs. Larson? Mark. Isn't it funny? I, I can hardly feel anything. It's, it's Mark. Poison? The same as Agatha. Where? In his car. He stopped to take a drink. There was poison in it. The same poison that killed Agatha. <laughs> all right, Shane. This is all very touching. Come on, let's go. No, wait just I a minute. Let's go. I'm getting out of this place is giving me the creeps. Mrs. Larson, tell Celia about Mark. She's in danger. Tell her. That's just so you'll know it's loaded, Shane. I'm sorry to spoil your rug, lady. Well, Shane, I won't aim at the rug next time. He was smart. He kept me at arm's length. The way he handled me, you'd think I had the plague. He was so calm and so careful, I began to worry. Give me the nervous guys. Give me the guys who think they're tough. I can take care of myself with them. But this bird knew exactly what he was going to do. 
He acted like a trapper who'd caught a wildcat and was measuring him for the kill. We went down the hall and out the rear door. If I was going to do anything, it better be pretty quick. It had turned cold and a damp fog clung to my clothes, got into my nostrils. I took a little path that led into the swamp. Funny, I kept worrying about Celia, about protecting her, not about myself. It was all screwy, sort of detached, almost a dream sequence. Things were happening too fast, and I couldn't stop them. All right, how much farther into this swamp, laddie? We're here. Okay. Uh, go stand up against that tree over there. Here? Right there. <laughs> it was a big, fat old cypress tree, and I loved it. He thought it was going to be like an execution without a blindfold, but you can tell about these punks. You can tell when their finger itches. Before he lifted his sights, I was around on the other side, and his bullets tore chest high. I got plenty of time. I got nothing but time. This is the most important thing I ever did in my life, and I'm going to do it right. Now, careful, Shane. I'm starting to come around. Oh, it was going to be a dilly. I ducked my head out and <laughs> pulled it back in. If I counted right, that made four and one in the house. Five. It was starting to edge around. <laughs> it cut like a knife through the meat on my shoulder. It must have been just a nick because it only burnt. It didn't slug me. Six. He was still edging around, coming a little closer, but he still wasn't taking any chances on my jumping him. A nick, you Shane? <laughs> Watch it now. I'm going to run. Which side, Shane? <laughs> that spun me around, caught my other arm. Bullet hit solid. I almost went down. Seven. <laughs> you counting them, Shane? I got a couple of more clips when this one's finished. Here I come again. Who wrote that story about the hunter who wasn't happy unless he was hunting a human being? He must have laughed like this punk. He must have went off his trolley. I caught a look at the weasel's face and then... <laughs> it was like the granddaddy of all fuses blowing out. I'd heard about people feeling the wind of a bullet, but this wasn't a wind. It was a gentle sigh, a little puff. He missed my nose by a 32nd of an inch. And that was eight. I dashed out after him. But he was on his way, fumbling with his gun, putting the new clip in while he ran. Only he wasn't watching where he was going. He tripped over a log. I pulled up short and I stared. There were several logs laid out in a rough circle, sort of protecting a patch of ground. Ground? A punk had tripped and gone in head first and started to sink. His body thrashed around. The head came up covered with what looked like oily mud, only then I knew what it was. Quicksand. It didn't take 15 seconds. And he disappeared. Even if I wanted to help him, I couldn't. It came too fast. I looked and he was gone. A couple of big bubbles came up, slick and moldy. And then that was all. On the way back out to the house, my mind was wrestling with angles. Worrying about Celia so hard, I almost forgot I had a slug in my shoulder. I could see a light on the second floor of Mrs. Larson's house. I prayed that that meant Celia was still alive. I ran to the front door and began pounding. Why, uh, Mr. Shane? Oh, why all the commotion? Oh, you're still okay. Uh, how about your mother? She's fast asleep in her bed. Come on in. Yeah. What's that? Oh, her cat must have followed me here. That's good luck, Mr. Shane. And all new all in superstition. Let her in. Yeah. Sit down. Now, what... Oh, Mr. Shane, you're bleeding. Yeah, I almost forgot. Here, let's get that jacket off. Okay. Oops. Easy. Sorry. Yeah. Now, I'll just tear the shirt open. You, uh, heard about your brother? Yes. Mother told me. In a way, I... I think perhaps he's better off. He never was very happy. My stepfather saw to that. Oh. Sorry. I've got to clean it out, you know. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Celia, I'm going nuts trying to figure this thing out. Your stepfather hoped you'd kill each other off. He planned it that way. But you and your mother wouldn't bite on that kind of bait. Thank you. The only other answer is Olmsby. He gets everything if all of you are taken care of. I don't have anything on him. It, it won't gel. I'm afraid this will sting a little. <laughs> oh. There. It's all over until the doctor takes over. Here, have a little of this. It's from my dear departed stepfather's wine cellar. Napoleon Brandy, 1812. Yeah. Come off and get a whiff of anything out there. Thank you. 
Oh, I'm sorry. That was clumsy of me. I'll pour you another. <laughs> Anyhow, that stray cat's going to have a good time. He likes Napoleon Brandy, too. Yes, he does, doesn't he? You know, I think I'll join you. I have a weakness for good brandy. All right. I have a weakness for women who have a weakness for good brandy. <laughs> Here you are, Mr. Shane. I... Mike. Hey. You were right, Sid. That cat was good luck. He'll be stiff in another few minutes. What? Yeah, that brandy is spiked with enough poison to kill Gargantua. Where'd you get this brandy, Celia? Why, I... I think Mr. Olmsby gave it to me. We'll be back in a moment with Mike Shane and the thrilling climax to our story. Thinking about Olmsby almost sent me off on a tent. The big idea was slow in coming, but it paid off. The whole thing fell into place. It was kind of hard to see all at once. It, it came out gradually. Celia, your mother didn't go into your stepfather's house before he died, did she? She hasn't been inside that house in 15 years, Mr. Shane. Oh, that's it. Now, it's so simple, so so very simple. Hey, hey, let me have that brandy bottle. I'm taking it down to headquarters for a little fingerprint job. I don't understand. I'll be back. Now, you probably don't know it, but you called me Mike a few seconds ago. It's enough of a start for me. But what about Mr. Olmsby? There's a payoff for him, too. It's hard to believe, Shane. There's no other explanation, Sergeant. Olmsby was the only one who knew the exact terms of the will. He'd get everything if the family were all out of the way. Yeah, he had a good idea what would happen. And he decided to wait it out. That's why he hired that, that character to get rid of me. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Almost he didn't want anybody to get in the way of the natural course of events. Yeah, an old man hates so much he can't let it die with him. He wasn't satisfied until he'd fixed it so his rotten touch reached out from the grave. It's still hard to believe, but you can't argue with fingerprints. <laughs> Sure. There was only one answer. The fingerprints on the bottle of Napoleon brandy and the fingerprints on Mark's flask and Aunt Agatha's special milk bottle, they all matched. His plan was simple. He figured all the suspicion would rest on his wife after Agatha and Mark and Celia were dead. Yes, the fingerprints all matched. They were the fingerprints of Gregory Larson. He kept right on killing even after he was dead. There's a moral in all this somewhere. Something about evil turning on the evil door and paying him back. I, uh, I haven't quite figured it out yet, but Celia's a pretty clever girl. I think I'll show her how the other half of New Orleans lives. Take her to dinner tonight and uh, discuss it with gestures. <laughs> Bill Russo again. Our story was based on characters created by Brett Halliday. Our music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chan. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure. <laughs> Look, dog girl, I've got to know what goes. Last night, someone ran me down. Later on, they killed an old man who tried to tell me something. My nerves are like radar, and they're sending out all kinds of danger signals. I'm on somebody's list. Whose list, dog girl? Come on, Q. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, back in his old haunts in New Orleans. Ready, as always, to risk his neck for law, order, and an occasional dollar. Listen now as we bring you the new adventures of Michael Shane. Yeah. 
Hello. Michael Shane, private detective. Speaking. Mr. Shane, I have a job for you, but I can't pay you very much. Keep talking, I'm listening. My name is Marina Lau. I want you to come over to 1612 Wentworth Street. I meet you on the porch. On the porch? Yes, that is why I call you. My father has locked all the doors and windows. He's in the house, sitting in the dark, waiting. Waiting for what? For death, Mr. Shane. Now we return to New Orleans and a new adventure with Mike O'Shane. So I was on my way across New Orleans to see Marina LaRue, whose papa was waiting for death. The 1612 Wentworth Street was a couple of minutes by cab in ordinary times. But these were not ordinary times, so it was taking me a half hour to walk it. Yeah, yeah, this had been a bad month for little Mike. Police headquarters had suspended my license for 60 days for being a stunk. But even stunks have stomachs and creditors. And that last buck in my wallet was so lonely it was getting psychoneurotic. So, license or no license, I wasn't letting Marina LaRue get away. And just like she said, she was waiting on the porch and she was some baby doll. Creole from way back and round and ripe like a cantaloupe busting its seams. Only I'd been living on shredded wheat and canned milk for so long, all Marina LaRue meant to me then was ham and eggs and pork chops and maybe pie a la mode. Mr. Shane. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. I'm half out of my mind. I don't want to call the police if nothing is really wrong. Hey, hey, slow down, slow down. Your, your father's inside the house? Yes. He has been in there for the last eight days, just sitting in his room in the dark. Like I said, waiting for death. What's the matter? Is he sick? No. He's as healthy as you are. I. That's why I don't understand. Tonight, he won't even let me in the house. He has locked all the doors and the windows. I, I don't know what to think. Well, I think we ought to tap a brick against one of those windows and have a talk with Papa. Yes. Yeah, but first I ought to tell you that I... I break windows and talk to Papa's who wait for death for something more than the sheer joy of it. For something like 20 bucks a day. You, uh, you understand that, of course. I told you I'd pay you. Okay. I always like to begin business on a friendly basis. Ah, where's that brick? I broke the window, reached in and unlocked it, and then slid over the sill. The house was as black as a mug of GI coffee. I found a light switch and clicked it back and forth, but nothing happened. Then I let the girl in through the front door. Come on in. What happened to the lights? I don't know. And where is Papa? Yeah. Papa! Papa! I started lighting matches, and we wandered through the house. Papa, where are you? A single flare of light cast crazy shadows against the walls and the ceiling. Papa! You got the screwy feeling that the house itself was alive and watching you. Except for our footsteps, there wasn't a sound. Papa, where are you? Oh, my error. Yeah, yeah, there was a sound, all right, coming from the next room down the hall. I felt a nerve deep down inside me start jangling like a burglar alarm. Papa! I knew that sound like I know my heartbeat. We were at the door of the room. I struck another match, and the girl saw it. Papa! No. No, Papa! No, Papa! He was hanging like a pig in a butcher shop, tied to the chandelier. His head lolled on his shoulder and his eyes stared up at a nothing at all. Then suddenly the girl's sobbing ended as though somebody had clamped a hand over her mouth. When she spoke, she sounded like a stranger. Strike another match. A lip close to him. Wasn't one look enough? Strike a match. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Funny, Mark. Looks like a brand or something. A coiled snake. I should have known. I should have known that's why he was so frightened. That is who he was waiting for. And do guy. Hey, 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 kid. Snap out of it. Hey, what's wrong with you? What are you talking about? Who's Carell? Guy? I didn't say... I didn't... I didn't hey, say hey, that. hey, hey, hey. You call the police? Tell him my father committed suicide and then go away. I did what the lady said. I called the cops, collected my 20 bucks and beat it. Because if the police found me working without a license, they might send me to bed without supper. With 20 bucks, I was once again a man of distinction. So I took a cab downtown. On the way, I debated whether to sample Antoine's elegant crawfish or... Galatoire's savory bouillabaisse. Yeah, I settled for Charlie's hash and beer. 
Charlie was an ancient moth-eaten character who kept a basement bar on Beale Street just so he'd have somebody to talk to. And there weren't many customers tonight, and he stayed close to me, polishing the mahogany and looking annoyed. New Orleans. How quaint. Huh? Yeah, that's what they said. How quaint. What are you talking about, Charlie? Tourists, I'm talking about six of them. Came down a while back from Peoria, they said. Just looking, they said. How quaint. All right, quaint pour me they... another one, Charlie. Yeah, okay, okay, Mike. Uh, quaint, they think this is. I should have told them how my place used to be. But the cockfights we had right there in the center of the floor by candlelight. And the 12 ladies from Natchez doing the can-can. Peoria. Charlie. Huh? Did you ever hear of anyone named Anthony Carell? Charlie, I'm talking to you. I heard you, Shane. Well? You better stick to looking through hotel transoms and forget Anthony Carell. Why? Because it's something out of the past. Something that hasn't got any place in this world. What are you talking about? You see, according to the story, there's something special about Anthony Carell. Special? Yeah. He ain't like you and me, Shane. You see, Anthony Carell ain't never gonna die. That tickled me. Oh. I finished my drink, waved goodbye to old Charlie, yelled something about getting Carell's formula and putting Perona out of business, and then I was on my way. The air was better outside, and I decided to walk. <laughs> It was a nice, quiet street. Great place to start a cemetery. As it turned out, I was just the kid to start one. I didn't hear the car behind me. All I saw was the cab on the next corner. The cab driver was leaning against the open door waiting for me. I stepped off the curb and a couple of heads... Hey, look out! And I was rolling on cobblestones, watching a red tail light disappear in the distance. Next thing, the, the cab driver was bending over me. You okay, Pally? Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess so. Hey, take me home, will you? That sure was close. No, no I, I just got careless crossing the street. Careless? <laughs> I was watching, Pally. That car followed you for maybe two blocks, waiting to get a chance at you. Huh? Yeah. Somebody in this town don't like you very much, Pally. The cabbie drove Pally home. Between my evening of hilarity and my nosedive in the gutter, I felt kind of rocky. As soon as I got in the room, I flopped down in bed and bid the world good night. But the world wasn't finished with me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Mike, this is Charlie. Oh, yeah, Charlie. Listen to me, boy. Something funny's going on. Yeah, yeah, funny. They're trying to scare me. But old Charlie's been around too long to scare. Ah, oh, good for old Charlie. You come on over now. I'll tell you what they're up to, boy. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah you come sure. come on over right away. Okay, okay. You know where I bunk? In the room behind the bar. Just knock on the front door. I'll let you in. Yeah, Get yeah. here quick as you can. Sure, sure. Sure, Charlie. Yeah, sure. The last thing I saw before I fell asleep again was the luminous green dial on my bedside clock. 3.47. It said 10.20 when I saw it again. The room was lousy with sunshine. I was brushing my teeth and trying to avoid my reflection in the mirror when I remembered Charlie calling me. I found the phone number of his joint in the book and I called him. Only it wasn't Charlie who answered. Yeah? I want to speak to Charlie. Who is this? Uh, just let me talk to Charlie. Sorry, mister. Charlie isn't here. Where is he? They took him to the morgue an hour ago. He's dead. Now, back to New Orleans to the new adventures of Michael Shane. In the beginning, it hadn't made much sense. Marina LaRue calling me to break into her father's house. Him hanging from the chandelier with a snake brand on his forehead. And now, old Charlie dead. Well, I, I went down to the morgue. The attendant took me to the basement of where Charlie was on his table. Lieutenant Burns of headquarters was just taking a peek. Nasty, a redhead. Yeah. Yeah, necks of bum sheep for butchering. What's that on his forehead? Mm. Looks like a brand. 
Like a coiled snake. I probably banged his head. It's nothing. Oh, you want a bet, Lieutenant? Say, look, Shane, what are you doing around here? You're not forgetting that your license is suspended. A uh, guy can get in here without a license? Look at Charlie. All he had was a license to sell bad booze. You're not doing any work for anybody? No. Nah, just keeping in train. Come on, be a good boy, redhead. You've only got a couple of weeks to go. Then it'll be legal for you to start bothering us. Burns, tell me about Anthony Carell. Who? It's sometimes called the, uh, the deathless one. Oh, my back. Don't tell me that's going around again. Well, what about him? Ah, oh, that's what I love about this town. No matter how modern it may look on the outside, underneath it's still a jungle. Still dancing to voodoo drums. Voodoo? Yeah, every so often some scared sucker comes in and whispers in our ears that Anthony Carell is still alive and terrifying the countryside. When we ask him for one teeny little bit of proof, the little sucker vanishes in a puff of smoke. Anthony Carell. Oh, redhead, you can do better than that. <laughs> Yeah, when I got outside on Jackson Street, it did seem kind of silly. What was so silly about that car trying to run me down last night? What was so silly about Charlie under a white sheet in the basement of that morgue? Oh, I had enough questions in my head to start a quiz show, but not enough answers to win a yo-yo. I knew a good place to ask questions, though. And I had to start asking questions fast. Something was happening, something big, and it was happening to me. I took a cab out to the Brownstone House on Wentworth Street, where all this began. Come on, you're going to have to open up sometime, baby doll. Ah. Please, go away, Mr. Shane. In a little while, Marina, honey. Please, I'm in mourning. Have some respect. Sure, I'll take off my hat. Inside. What do you want? Why are you so scared? I'm not scared. Tell that to the little nerve in your cheek. It's twitching overtime. Look, I want to know about Anthony Carell. No, please, no. Yes, please, yes. Mr. Shane, I will... Rather glad when I saw you come up the steps. Yeah. Yes, really I was. I had trouble forgetting you, Mike. Oh, uh-huh, dog girl, turn off the warm water. I'd love to, but I can't. How about Anthony Carell? Why do you bother with something that does not concern me? That's just it, dog girl. It concerns me clear up to here. Last night, somebody tried to run me down. Later on, they killed an old man who wanted to tell me something. Look, I've been in this business a long time. My nerves are like radar, and they're sending out all kinds of danger signals. I'm on somebody's list. Oh, I'm not one of those storybook detectives, doll girl. I've got to know what I'm fighting. I cannot help you. You've got to. No. Okay. Mind if I use the phone? Who are you calling? The Daily Bulletin. I got a pal working in the city room. I'm going to tell him Marina LaRue of 1612 Wentworth Street says Anthony Carell was responsible for the death of her father. Can't. Bulletin? Let me speak to Fraser in the city room. You give me the phone? No. Oh, you can't do this. They kill me. I'm fighting for my own neck, honey. Hello. Hello, Fraser. It's Mike Shane. Yeah, I think I got a story I for you. I tell you what, tell you. Goodbye, Fraser. Okay, Dr. Here. Yes. I tell you. And you go out, try to do something about it, the way men have done for a hundred years. And if they find you at all, they find branded into your flesh the coiled snake. The mask of Anthony Carell. Just as they have found it on all the others. Who is this guy, Anthony Carell? You have heard of Madame Lorette? Madame Lorette? Sure, wasn't she supposed to be some kind of big shot in a voodoo racket around New Orleans? She was the voodoo queen more than a century ago. Yeah? In the 1820s, she married another voodoo worshiper. A man already old. He'd come to New Orleans from Haiti. He was the greatest of them all. His name was Anthony Kyle. And this guy who's causing all the trouble today, he's his descendant, huh? Descendant, you fool, don't you understand that he's the same man? But that couldn't be. Why do you think we're all in such terror of him? He cannot die. Do you know what that means? Hey, hey, take it he cannot die. His food has been wanton. The house he was riding in had been shot at. Once the house he was staying in was dynamited. Men stood at every door with guns. But in less than a week, the plotters were dying one by one. And on their foreheads, the snake brand of Anthony Kyle. That's crazy. That is the story, Mr. Shane. Believe it. Don't believe it as you wish. What does his big shot look like? No living man has ever seen his face. There are no pictures. And who takes care of it? The Carroll clan, one generation after another. Today, there are only two left. One, Philippe. They do Anthony Carroll's work. Collect his tribute. One and Philippe. Where do they live? I don't know. I don't know. I've told you everything I know. What else? You are, Mr. Shane. What else you are? 
What else do I want? A little while ago, you said you had trouble forgetting me. Well? Come here, doll girl. I don't want you to forget it. After I left Marina, I went to the library and spent half the day looking up the old history books of New Orleans. Madame Lorette and Anthony Carell were in every one. And every book agreed that Madame had died in 1845. There was no mention of Anthony Carell ever having died at all. I called an old guy I knew over at the Bureau of Records. I told him I was looking for the death certificate of one Anthony Carell. He laughed over the phone, asked me if I was falling for that old story. But three hours later, he called me back. Yeah? Jane, this is the Bureau of Records. Well? You were right. There is no death certificate for Anthony Carell. I had a couple of drinks after that. Then I started walking the streets. My head throbbed. Felt like a guy trapped in a nightmare, trying with all his might to wake up out of it. Around midnight, I found a small park near Jackson Square and sat down on a bench trying to think of an answer. May I sit down, Mr. Shane? Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Hey, how come you know my name? Oh, you are a very famous man, Mr. Shane. Known particularly for your tenacity. Cigarette? Thanks. What do you want? Mr. Shane, it's very unfortunate that you saw fit to interest yourself in Anthony Carrera. Oh? Why? Because now I must kill you. I felt the bullet smash against me. But at first there was so little pain, that same crazy feeling of maybe it's a dream came back. I lunged for the guy trying to get hold of his gun hand. Like wrestling with an octopus. He was soft and wet skinned and a neat little fella. He even wore cologne. It was slipping out of my reach. I jumped up and started running. I said the prayer that came to my mind Catholic, Hebrew, Episcopalian, who cared? I saw a row of shrubbery and dived in. Now that bullet had been real all right. My side was beginning to ache like a whole mouthful of sore teeth. My friend with the gun came so close to the brush I could smell his sweet stinking cologne. I remembered a couple of other prayers. Something must have worked. A siren started sobbing the blues far off, and the guy beat it. He climbed into a little black coupe parked at the curb. Pulled away, but he was playing it very safe. There was a long stoplight at the corner, and he waited for every second of it. A nice, law-abiding, perfumed young man. There was a parking lot half a block down the street. I ran for it. As I ducked in, I saw the light on the corner change, the black coupe down Canal Street. I hopped into the first car and turned on the ignition. A sleepy-eyed attendant came out of a little shed, and I kicked the starter. I got the ticket, mister! Hey, come back! Come back! I wasn't so law-abiding. I went down side streets like somebody lit a fuse. Yeah, just like in the movies, except my, my side hurt, my shirt felt sticky and warm, and sick to my stomach. When I was sure no cops were following me, I cut back to Canal Street, and pretty soon I saw the black coupe again, still obeying all the laws. Now we're on the outskirts of town, along the wharves that reached out into the gulf. The black coupe picked up speed. I picked up speed. Oh, it was a long ride through little country roads that stretched through the bayous. Once I managed to slip my hand into my shirt, made the happy discovery my wound felt a lot worse than it really was. Yeah, and I had another good break. In the dashboard compartment, I found a pint of bourbon that had hardly been touched. Oh, I touched it good. It was almost as fine as a blood transfusion. And then before I knew it, the black coupe had turned into a driveway. I went on a few hundred yards, pulled up under some trees and turned the lights off. It was a battered, weather-beaten farmhouse, standing all by itself in the middle of nothing. The windows were boarded up. Everything about it said nobody home except the black coupe. I snuck around the back. The screen door was open. I walked across the porch and almost knocked over a row of milk bottles. I tried the back door. The door was open. Oh, no, I wasn't having any. You didn't have to be a quiz kid to know what this setup was. I started back across the porch. I reached the screen door and then I stopped. The only sound in all the world was a mosquito buzzing like mad in the darkness. Hey, Shane, where are you going? Oh, I, I realized I'd said that out loud. And it giggled to myself. I rubbed my head. It, it was hot. The, the bullet hole. Maybe I was already getting delirious. Yeah. yeah. But where was I going? Back to little New Orleans? For what? The cops wouldn't listen to me. To them, I was just a big-nosed redhead out for a quick buck. And my sweet-smelling friend had slipped up twice now. If I went back to town, he'd come after me again, and he was just about due for the jackpot. No. Well, there was no place to go except inside the house. I picked up one of the milk bottles. Me and my homogenized blackjack. 
I went back to the door. Pushed it open. Went into the kitchen. Everything dark. I could just make out some dishes on the sink. Place smelled of bad, greasy cooking. Then I found another door. Now I was in a short hallway that led to a flight of stairs. Not a sound at all. Oh, I'd even been glad to hear that mosquito. Stairs. Started up a step at a time. Slow. Easy. Slow. Easy. Then when I was close to the top, there was something about the darkness that looked wrong. Real close to me, I smelled sweet cologne. <laughs> I spun around and started down the stairs fast, but it was all wasted. At the foot of the stairs, a cigarette glowed in the dark. I was boxed in real nice. The guy downstairs spoke first. So this is Mr. Shane Wan. Yes, this is him, Philippe. Juan and Philippe. The brothers Carell. And where is old man Anthony? You have come for Anthony. Well, he is in the last room at the end of the hall, but... I don't think you will reach him. I think you are going to die on those stairs. Keep coming up the steps, Mr. Shane. Yeah. Yeah, sure. How's this? Oh, look out! I lunged at him. There was a swirl of cologne. I brought the milk bottle down hard. The one crumpled on the floor. Nice as you please. Behind me, I heard Philippe coming up after me. I raced down the hall. I tried the first door. Oh, locked. The second door. Oh, locked. The third door was unlocked. I opened it and slammed it shut behind me. I snapped the lock. Oh, friend Philippe was at the door breaking through. I did the first thing that came to my mind. I picked up a chair and smashed it through the window. And then I ducked into a corner as the door flung open. Philippe came into the room holding his gun. He headed straight to the broken window. He stood looking out of it into the darkness for a long time. You won't get away, Mr. Shane. And his back was to me. I started for him. My side was throbbing again. My throat was so dry you could have struck matches on it. Something must have warned Philippe. He started turning around. I brought the milk bottle down hard. He staggered, fell to his knees, got up. I started clawing at my legs. I went into a deep purple fog. When I came out of it, Philippe was very quiet. The milk bottle was broken into a thousand pieces. I, I sat down on a chair. I felt about as peppy as a Florida girl. And then I remember, Anthony Carell, the man who couldn't die, was down the hall. I went over to Philippe and dug around until I found his gun. He groaned a little bit, but that's ah. all. I went back out into the hall. The last room at the end of the hall. I started toward it. Then in front of the door, I saw one. I... I will not let you in this room. He wasn't able to stand up. He was on his knees in front of the door, and his mouth hung open as though he didn't have the strength to close it. Oh. Five generations, he has been our strength. With him, we've been able to rule everyone. I will not let you destroy him. Then I saw the gun in his hand. I saw him try to raise it. I shot three times. He collapsed in a heap. Even while dying, he wasn't going to let me into that room. As I reached for the knob, with his last strength, Juan flung his arm up and wildly tried to block me. What was there in that room that a guy would die like this just to protect I reached for the knob and raised my gun. I entered the room, slowly, looked around. Then I realized why Juan and Philippe had tried so hard to keep me out of here. Then I realized why Anthony Carell would not die, why he could not be killed. There was no Anthony Carell. The room was empty. Yeah. Yeah, that was the story of Anthony Carell. He'd lived and died in his own time just as any man. But the Carell clan, knowing the power of fear, had made it appear that the old man was still alive and kicking. Oh, I wonder how many people go through life being afraid of empty rooms. Well, as soon as I got back to town that night, I went to the emergency hospital and had myself pasted together. Then I called on Marina LaRue. I told her all about Anthony Carell... When I finished, she didn't say a word. Just came over and looked at me a long time, and she kissed me. After a while, I began to realize that trip to the hospital was wasted. Moreno was so much better than penicillin.
Shane. Think yourself out of this one. Jasper will have that door down in just another second. And there'll be nothing between you and his sort of shotgun, but air. Think fast, Shane, because... The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to Michael Shane, that reckless, red-headed Irishman, back at his old haunts in New Orleans, in another transcribed episode. We call it The Case of the Phantom Gun. Yes? Oh, Mr. Shane, come on in. I wasn't expecting anybody. I'll only be a minute. I just dropped by to tell you I've finished your job. You... You found out? Yep. Well, is this... No, Mrs. Kinney, your husband isn't seeing another woman on the night she stays away from home. Oh, thank you, Mr. Shane. I'm just... What is he doing? I suggest you keep him home nights. Mr. Shane, what do you mean? Look, you hired me to find out if he's running around with another woman. Well, I found out he isn't. Now, Mrs. Kinney, if you don't mind, I'll... Well, the way you're evading it, I... Well, you just can't walk out on me. If Dick is in some sort of trouble, I... I should only follow my hunches. Look, uh, I didn't want your case in the first place, but you looked like a good kid, and I didn't like the idea of some guy pushing you around. Well, I... I don't understand. I've only been on the case three days, Mrs. Kinney. But from the very beginning, I've been getting phone calls from a character who's been warning me they'd find my head in a basket if I didn't lay off. Uh, well, what could Dick be doing that would possibly... This morning. This morning, I couldn't get into my office with a stuff piled knee-high all over the place. Now, my furniture isn't exactly Chippendale, but it does have a sentimental value. And as for my files, they look like the morning after Mardi Gras. Your office was ransacked? Yeah, it looked more like the Ringling Brothers had used it as a detention room for naughty elephants. Well, certainly Dick had nothing to do with that. I'm not on any other case, Mrs. Kinney, and the gal who cleans up doesn't know any elephants. But I, I just don't understand. If Dick really is in trouble, why do you... Look, can you understand me? Keep Dickie at home. But why? Why, Mr. Shane? Oh, all right. I'll tell you. And then it's your problem. Your husband has picked up an unsavory playmate. He's up to his clavicle in some very hot blackmail. And if I'm any judge, his clavicle is about to be chopped off. In a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Phantom Gun. Want a recipe for trouble? Take one part shame, add a pretty young thing in trouble up to her ears through no fault of her own, mix well in a solution of tears, and you have a guy who let his emotion sway his good judgment. Something I do as often as a police commissioner treats me to a steak dinner. Now, Phyllis Kinney had hired me to find out if her husband wasn't, but he'd gotten himself mixed up with a character named Jasper. This Jasper was following his usual routine, getting close to his blackmail victim by working for him. In this case, he was the gardener at the Duval estate. And that's how Dick Kinney got mixed up with him. Dick was the Duval chauffeur. What made it pretty clear something was in the air was what happened after I'd stuck my nose in there just briefly. I got threatening phone calls and a cyclone hit my office. Typical Jasper stunts. Anyway, I agreed to try talking some horse sense into young Dick Kinney before I bowed out of the case. It was getting dark when I pulled up outside the ancestral grounds of the Duval Estate. I walked up the gravel driveway toward the house. Couldn't see a car anywhere in front, but there were lights on in the house, so chances were Dick was around back. Hello there. Uh, oh, hello. I haven't seen you before, have I? Mm. Mm, yourself, you'd remember if you had. Nice. Everything nice. Even the hair. Nice and red. You wouldn't be Mrs. Duval, would you? You read the society page. No, this was on the front page. Oh, that. Wasn't that nasty of you? 62 marrying 22, that kind of thing. I'm glad I'm 22. Come here. But... Yeah. Kind of impulsive, aren't you? I don't believe in stifling inhibition. 
It's unhealthy, Mr. Uh... Shane. Did you come here to see my husband? No, I just want a word with Dick Kenny, your chauffeur. Dick? Oh. He's pretty, too. He's around back somewhere, probably in the garage. Uh, going to stick around a while? Nope. Oh, too bad. I'll see you again, Mr. Shane. Goodbye. She ran off like the young animal she was. Disappeared into the house. When I got around to the back of the house, I saw a light burning in the four-car garage and walked in. Somebody in coveralls was working on a town and country. He must have heard me come in because he pulled his head out of the motor and looked up. A blonde, wavy hair, the blue eyes and weak mouth matched the picture on Phyllis Kinney's mantle. I started to say, you're Dick Kinney, aren't you? When I saw Kinney's eyes get wide, I wheeled around, I caught a glimpse of an upraised arm, and then... Oh. fell in, plowed me under. And then I smelled gasoline. It was one big ache all over. I opened my eyes just in time to see the heel of a shoe come down to my face. And then it was nothing for a while. The smell of dust and blood, leather and blood, and gasoline and blood crept back into my nose. I opened my eyes again. It was pitch dark. The roaring in my head blended with the low hum of the motor. I was on the floor of a car. We were driving somewhere. I jounced around like I was on a mechanical horse and out of time with the bucking. Then the car stopped. The door was open. I was yanked out by my ankles and my head bounced as it hit the ground. I waited for something to happen. It did. I didn't feel any new pains. I was lying on the grass and it was cold with a little dew on it. Maybe the shots weren't for me. You were told, Shane. You were told and you didn't behave. Now you're in the soup. That's good. Jasper, I... I recognize your voice anyway. Would you, Shane? Maybe there'll be bells in your ears tomorrow, Shane. Maybe you won't hear so good. You're making a mistake, Jasper. You're getting me interested. You oh, shut up. They felt like little taps. Till I tasted shoe leather in my mouth. Blood again. Then I didn't taste or smell or think anymore. <laughs> the moon was gone and I was cold. My face felt stiff and every bone in my body hurt. I got to my feet and looked around. It was pretty dark. I thought about my nice warm apartment. Thought cheered me up a little. Then I saw him. It was a kid, Dick Kinney. He was lying on his stomach, face down. He wasn't breathing. I wondered briefly why I was still alive. Only it was too much of an effort. I wanted to lick my wounds and go to bed and sleep off the nightmare I'd just gone through. I kept telling myself as I started home, call headquarters, report the murder. But I don't think I did. Do a favor and get kicked in the teeth. I was so stiff the next morning, it took me five minutes to ease myself out of bed. I hobbled into my car and drove downtown, then hobbled up to my 10 by 14 office. I picked up a package the mailman had left with some circulars and bills and went inside. The cleaning woman had managed to make some sort of order out of the place. I eased myself into my chair, tossed the circulars and bills into the wastebasket, and turned to the package. It bore a New Orleans postmark, but no return address. I tore it open. It grinned up at me and seemed to say, Boy, are you stupid, Shane. It was a Colt 38, nice and clean and just oiled. I reached for the lower left-hand drawer of my desk, but I knew I was wasting my time. This was my gun. Yeah, empty. I hadn't checked it when I found my office torn apart. I thought, Shane, you're losing your grip. What's the angle? Not being knocked off last night, and then this. What's the build-up for? Well, I didn't have to wait for an answer. Hi, uh, Shane. Hello, Lieutenant. What happened to your face? I got a nervous barber. You want to take a little trip? No, I'm not up to it. Force yourself. 
And uh, that gun will take that along. What's up, Fletcher? A tip. And what? That kid was found shot to death this morning. Dick Kinney. Do you know him? Yeah, I heard of him. I had it in mind to call and report it. Yeah. Let's have a gun. Uh-huh. 38. Kenny was shot with a 38. Well, there were 38s and 38. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go. This tip was pretty definite. <laughs> thing was going too fast for me. Maybe I was wrong all along. Jasper wasn't that kind of an operator. He hadn't messed with murder before, as far as I knew. Maybe I'd stepped into something. That, that 38. Okay, Shane, let's talk. Did you test the gun? Yeah. Dick Kenny was killed with it. And I told you somebody swiped it from me. Yeah, yeah, you told me. But you didn't report it when it was stolen. I didn't know it was stolen. You didn't do better than that, Shane. Look, Lieutenant, I got it in the mail this morning. You said you were going to report the murder. You were with Kenny last night about 9 o'clock. I told you how it was. The marks on your face don't lie, Shane. Neither does ballistics. Two slugs and Kenny match with slugs from your gun. The gun was nice and clean and just oiled. But I tell you, it was in the mail. It came in the first delivery. All right, Shane. Let's go back to your office and take a look at that wrapper. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now you're using your head, Lieutenant. Thanks. Okay, Lieutenant, I threw the wrapper right into the wastebasket here now. Oh, no. What? The cleaning woman must have emptied it out. Oh, now, okay, Shane, I think we've reached the end of this little... Oh, wait, wait, we can try outside. Maybe they haven't picked up the trash yet. You uh, know that's against the law, littering the street like that. Yeah, yeah. Bend down and help me go through this stuff here. It's a brown wrapper. Okay. I don't know what this will prove anyway. All it can do is establish you getting a package this morning. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Yeah, let's see. Okay, Lieutenant, take a look at the postmark. Yeah, let's see it. New Orleans, 3 p.m., April 12th. And yeah, that's yesterday afternoon, all right? Yeah. The package with my gun in it was mailed yesterday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and I got it this morning at a quarter to nine. You know, Shane, ballistics is like fingerprints. No two of them alike. Then you made a mistake. I didn't make a mistake. Maybe you did. It just doesn't add up. It couldn't have been my gun that killed Kenny. The gun was in the United States mail at the time he was shot. That's what you say. How do I know your gun was in that package? But I'm telling All you... All I know is that in the history of the police department, ballistics has never been wrong. You admit being with him when he was killed, your gun killed him. There's only one answer, Shane, and you're it. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Phantom Gun. I was in a spot and I talked fast. I'd taken a little case and it had got away from me. Phyllis Kinney wondered whether her husband was spending his nights with other women after he got through with his chores as chauffeur for the Duvals. And because I felt sorry for her, and because I could use the fee, I looked into it. I found out he'd gotten chummy with a character named Jasper, who worked on the Deval estate as God. But Jasper's real trade was blackmail. I went to warn young Kenny to lay off and wound up with a headache. The kid was knocked off in an open spot on the bank of the Mississippi, and my gun apparently was a murder weapon. Only I didn't have the gun at the time. It was in the United States mails. Another item that kept my fat head in the fire was that I was along on the junket, albeit semi-conscious. Lieutenant Fletcher of the New Orleans homicide detail had a point. Look, Shane, the bullets that killed young Kenny came from your gun. You can't shake that. You say the gun came through the mail this morning and that it was in the mail since yesterday afternoon. I admit it doesn't add up, but Ballistics I'm... don't lie. You gonna book me? I'm considering it. What'll that get you? Look, I've got an idea. You can and... tell me your idea. Well, it's speculation. That's all it is. Now. We speculate fine downtown. Okay, Fletcher. If that's the way it is, I'm clamming up. We've been too easy on you guys. All we get is a swift... I don't know what you're complaining about. All I want to do is follow a trailer to wrap the whole thing up for you. All right, Shane. This is against my better judgment, but you've got just eight hours to find something. Thanks, Lieutenant. Just don't try to leave town. I might as well tell you, we're going right ahead, fitting your neck for a noose. <laughs> One thing I knew. One thing I was sure. That gun was in the mail when Kinney was shot. Like the lieutenant said, ballistics don't lie. No two bores make the same marks on a bullet. It's one in a a hundred billion. It just doesn't happen. Whoever figured this out was a smart cookie. The first thing I wanted to do was speak to old man DeVal. Yes, Mr. Shane? 
Mr. DeValve? That's right. What can I do for you? That's what I can do for you. Oh? Who's putting the bite on you? I beg your pardon? Did you know your chauffeur, Dick Kinney, was shot last night? Yes. The police been here? I don't see what business that is of yours. I got my fingers burnt. I was taken along for the ride. Oh. And that reference to, uh, to, uh... Blackmail. You're a private detective. That's right. I don't understand your connection. I was checking up on Dick Kinney. For what? Something else. It uh, doesn't fit in with your problem. Uh, Mr. Shane, I'm rather busy. You're not too busy, Mr. DeVal. Dick Kinney was blackmailing you, and Dick Kinney was killed last night. Go on, Mr. Shane. You want to tell me about it? Tell you. Tell you what? What the blackmail was about. It seems to me you've made a lot of suppositions. I don't know why you've got your information, but it doesn't resemble anything I am aware of. Well, okay, Mr. DeVal. You've got a right to your own mistakes. Good day, Mr. Shane. Oh, uh, where's your wife? Good day, Mr. Shane. Shane, you're a whiz bang, you are. And Armand Duval is charming. And Judith, his sprightly wife, is ugly. And Lieutenant is full of milk and honey, and the character Jasper is sweetness and light. And you, Shane, are the brilliant, the distinguished man about town, detective par excellence. Yeah, here you've been scouting the setup for four days. You had a seat on the 50-yard line. Even had your own head used as a football, and you still don't know the score. Oh, yeah, you're a sharp one. Now all you have to do is wait behind the potted petunias until the suspect plants his hoof print in the loan. Well, as I left the Duval Castle and started toward the back of the house to pay my respects to Jasper, Judith popped out from behind a weeping willow. You aren't leaving without uh, seeing me, Michael, were you? Well, leaving wasn't my idea. Your husband... Oh, yes. Come on, Michael. There's a bench behind this willow tree. I'd like you to uh, know me better. That sounds like a worthy project. What's happened to you? Your face looks like... toe of your gardener, size 11. Size but... 10 and a half, Shane. Ah, behind me again, huh? That's all right. Lift them. Jasper, what are you doing? Just checking, Mrs. Duvall. Ah, no gun, Shane? No gun. All the odds are with you again, Jasper. <laughs> yeah, I've been getting an idea, a swell idea. Yeah, you've had lots of them lately. Things are breaking my way for a change. Jasper, put that gun away. Uh-uh, Mrs. DeVal, this is the payoff. We're going to have an audience with the boss. Come on, both of you. Where'd you get that museum piece, Jasper? You like it? Just a shotgun. A little sawed off. Covers lots more territory that way. Let's go. <laughs> What is this, Jasper? <laughs> Little idea, sir. Everything was going so smooth and nice, I thought it's a pity if anything should happen. And then I thought this idea, I thought. And it's a pet. You, you, you've got a gun? Yeah. Sit down, Mrs. Duvall. I think you're making a mistake, Jasper. Mistake, mistake. I ain't made one yet, and I've been in the business a long time. I said, sit down. I refuse to have you. <laughs> Jasper, you... Here we are, Shane. There you are. You're real brave with a gun. Judith. Judith. She's unconscious. That jabbering was getting on my nerves. What do you intend to do? <laughs> it's a perfect setup. Shane is going to take the rap. For what? For Kenny's murder, Shane. Just like you're going to take the rap for Duvall's. Uh, you're going to kill me? Sure. You paid off Kenny five grand yesterday. That's chicken feed. Here. Yeah. Kenny was your go-between. That's why you bumped him. That's right, Shane. I don't like to think I got a split with anybody. Now, wait a minute, Jasper. We, we, we can come to terms, I'm sure. Uh -uh. This is too perfect. No. No, don't! Are you crazy? Are you mind, you're... Shane? This is an easy way for me to take care of you. You got careless just one second too long. Besides, you made a mistake. My gun is at headquarters. What's this one, eh? I knocked the gun out of his hand and it went skittering across the floor. But he was a lot closer to it than I was and on his way for it already. I thought he who fights and runs away and I slammed the door behind me and started for the front. I got lost or something, wound up in the kitchen. I went through it and out onto the rear veranda. I knew if I started across the lawn, I wouldn't have time to get the cover. I went back into the house through French windows with Jasper panning along behind me. 
through the library in a big double-width staircase that led up to the top floor. I took it three at a time. Jasper was just rounding the first bend behind me when I reached the top. It splendid, the beautiful wall paneling, but I didn't stop to survey the damage. I turned right and disappeared into the master bedroom at the end of the hall, just as another shot spurred me on. The room was done up in purple and rose. I guess it was very pretty under different circumstances. There was a door at the far end, and I scooted into it and threw it shut behind me, and then I turned the lock. The bathroom. I didn't even have time to look for an aspirin tablet in the medicine chest when the hammering started. I said to myself, all right, Shane, keep your head. You got to think yourself out of this one. Because on the other side of that door, Jasper's waiting for you. And the way that door is splintering up now, it doesn't look as if the wood is as stout as you're craving to keep on living. Gotcha, Shane. Gotcha. He splintered out the middle panel. Now his hand filled the hole and the gun filled his hand. Any second... I didn't feel anything. Maybe you never do. Maybe it was all over. Then the fingers of Jasper's hand got limp and... The gun fell onto the tile floor. I opened the door. It was Judith DeVal. She stood in the center of the room and a thin thread of dried blood was on her chin. And the gun in her hand was pointed at Jasper. Curled up on the floor. <laughs> In a moment, we'll be back with the thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, the bullets in Armand Duval came from your gun also, Shane. That's what I thought, Lieutenant. But your gun's been in my desk all afternoon. Just like last night when Dick Kinney was shot. My gun was in the mail. You got a theory? Sure. Well? I think you killed Duval. Huh? Now, you slay me, Shane. <laughs> Did you inspect that sawed-off shotgun? Yeah, the boys are going over it now. Why? And I told you my office was ransacked and my gun was stolen. What was to prevent Jasper from firing a half a dozen bullets into some pillows, cleaning the gun, and sending it back to me? Nothing if he wanted to. Sure he'd want to. If he figured on putting those bullets in a gadget that would fit into the chamber of the shotgun and hold the bullets, yeah. then he could fire them through a much larger bore than my thirty-eight. Yeah, hey, that would work, wouldn't it? The bore of a shotgun is so large that it wouldn't mark up the bullet. Yeah, and would leave the original rifling marks from my gun. The only reason Jasper didn't finish me off last night was because he figured I'd take the rap for Dick Kinney's murder. Yeah, that makes sense, too. And I wouldn't have had a close shave this afternoon if I'd ever learned to keep my big mouth shut. I told Jasper my gun was in police headquarters after he killed DeVal. Then he realized what I should have thought of, that I couldn't be framed for DeVal's killing through my gun. That's why he went after me. And hey, where are you going? I got a little unfinished business. I'll be back. <laughs> It was pretty simple when you knew the background. Jasper got a job as a gardener because he wanted to be close to his blackmail victim, Duval. He'd got Dick Kinney to front for him and then killed the boy so he wouldn't have to split. It all tied together that way. All except one little item. I was going to find out about that. Judith was waiting for me in the Duval library. Mike. Oh, Mike. Now, before we settle down and get comfortable, sweetheart, I got a little confession. Why do I care what you want to confess? Oh, my, it's going to be wonderful. Just you and me. Now, this confession's about you. All right, what? What is it? I thought for one solid three-minute period you were true blue and a yard wide. Hmm? When you shot Jasper. Oh, it wasn't so much to save my life, sweetheart, as it was to get rid of him. Tell me, did Jasper pick you or did you pick Jasper? Mike, what are you talking that about? That gun trick. It's way over Jasper's head. He could never think of a thing like that. Oh, let's not talk about Jasper. And why would Jasper kill your husband if he's the one who was being blackmailed? Was he, Mike? No dice, baby. What are you thinking? Pretty clear, Judith. You put Jasper up to getting money from your husband. And Jasper saw a wonderful opportunity. He didn't have to nibble at Duval. He wanted half of the money all at once. As DeVal's widow, you get the money, don't you? Mike. Maybe he'd even bleed you to death for the other half, too. He was sitting pretty until everything fell into place for you. Mike, listen. There are wonderful things from now on. I've got money. We can have all the good things. We can enjoy them, darling, together. Yeah. Let's go, baby. Oh, yeah. 
Where to, Mike? Police headquarters. This is where I came in. I always meet the right woman at the wrong time. I figured that tied everything up. But not quite. It turned out that the blackmail angle had to do with Duval not having a final divorce from his first wife when he married Judith. Judith was the only one who knew it. She contacted Jasper and worked him in on the deal. Very cute. Because when that came out, Judith lost her right to Duval's millions. But then, what could she spend money on where she was gone? The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure in mysterious and colorful New Orleans. Slip not more than a minute ago. I started around the corner of the warehouse after the killer. All of a sudden, I spread eagle in the air. Then my head splattered on the pier and a million stars exploded in front of my eyes. And then all the lights went out. <laughs> The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, back again at his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Generous Killer. Bill urged by the most difference does that make to a guy who's broke. Man hunt for a police slayer Victor Gross. Never any good news anymore. Now, weatherman predicts more rain. Well, maybe. I beg your pardon? I didn't hear you come in. I didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> the sign on your office door said enter. So I did. Oh. Yeah, well, have a seat. No, thanks. I always like to stand. Oh? <laughs> when you're only five feet tall, you prefer to stand. Suit yourself. What can I do for you? Uh, <clears throat> here. That's a hundred dollar bill. Yes, for you. Me? What for? I don't know much more about it than you, Mr. Shane. Look, you must, because I don't know anything about it. How come you're giving me a hundred dollar bill? Oh, I'm not giving it to you. It's not mine. Oh, wait a minute. Let's not play guessing games. This is that a man gave me this to give you and gave me one just like it for doing it. A man who? A passenger on the Star of Bermuda. Oh, the Star of Bermuda? What? Look, friend, I think you better start at the beginning. You're leaving me way behind. Well, I know it doesn't make much sense, but all I can tell you is what happened. I'm ship's cook on the Star of Bermuda. It's a tramp steamer. Yeah. Uh, we docked here at New Orleans yesterday, and we're shoving off at the Yeah, dock. yeah, yeah. Uh, just about an hour ago, a little before dark it was, uh, a passenger came aboard. Did he give you his name? No. Oh, fine. Uh, he just paid me to bring you this $100 bill. But didn't he say why? Didn't he tell you what he wanted me to do? I'm coming to that. Well, let's have it. What is it? Mr. Shane, he's paying you the 100 to come and arrest him. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the generous killer. since, up to now. I'd had my ham and eggs bright and early, spent most of the morning in the courthouse checking on some records for a client, most of the afternoon explaining them to him. 
So there I was, a little after dark, sitting in my office, peacefully reading the newspaper. When a pint-sized ship's cook from a tramp steamer eases into my office, gives me a hundred-dollar bill, and tells me a passenger on his boat sent it to me so I'd come down and arrest him. After which the little guy leaves, and I spend about half an hour trying to figure out the deal. Well, I finally gave up, because nothing about it made sense. Except, of course, one thing, the hundred-dollar bill. As far as I was concerned, that made very good sense. Seemed like a pretty good reason for me to mosey down to the star of Bermuda. So I slipped the hundred-buck bill into the solitary confinement of my wallet, went down to the waterfront. The star of Bermuda was just about the tackiest-looking tramp I've seen in a long while. I went up the gangway. The only sign of life was a deckhand lounging against the rail. Hello. Yeah? You, uh, got a passenger aboard? Yeah. Where's his captain? Aft. How far aft? Stern. Oh, look, Chatterbox, do you mind telling me just where? I'm no sea scout. Only cabin can't miss it. I'll be a light on it. Oh, wait a minute. Don't overdo. You better stop for a breath. Thanks. Welcome. I started walking toward the stern, my footsteps echoing on the deck. And then, sure enough, I saw a stab of light coming from under a cabin door. No answer. Still no answer. Hmm. Unlocked. Then I stopped. It looked like my client had decided he couldn't wait to be arrested. He was hanging at the end of a rope, swinging gently back and forth with the motion of the ship, and he was buried dead. I took a long look at the guy, and then I got a very smart idea, which was to get out of there and get out fast. But it was no good. When I got to the door, I ran right into something black and bullish. Only this bull didn't have horns. Who is he, Shane? You'll probably find this hard to believe, Inspector, but I don't know. Dykes, cut him down and search him. Yeah, okay. Now let's try it again, Shane. Who is he? I'm stuck with the same answer, Lefebvre. I'd never laid eyes on him until about ten seconds before you got here. Yeah. All I know is this guy sent me a hundred buck bill by way of the ship's cook to come down here and arrest him. Okay, so I came down. Here he was hanging. Didn't send word why he wanted to be arrested? Nope. Hmm. Wonder if he knew the net was closing in, thought he'd have a better shake this way. Hey, I don't follow you. You know who this guy is or was? Dykes. No identification, Inspector. Okay. There's your answer, Shane. Yeah, but maybe you got a hunch. This could be our boy. We don't know. No way to tell now. Well, he must have given a name when he reserved his cabin. Ziegler. Doesn't mean a thing. Might as well be who I am. You uh, wouldn't care to tell me who you think he might be? That's right. Huh? I wouldn't. Oh. Well, boys, this has been nice. I think maybe though I better be getting back to town. That is, of course, if you don't mind. No, we don't mind. We got nothing on you, Shane. Not now. Well, it might be a good idea for you to get back to town. Only just don't leave town. Hmm? Well, of course, all I could do at that point was send Inspector Lefevre an RSVP to his cordial invitation to remain in New Orleans. My RSVP read, yes, Inspector. About then, the coroner arrived, and I followed the inspector and Sergeant Dykes down the gangway and along the pier to the street at the end where their car was. There was a little lunch counter nearby with a few assorted floaters lounging around. Among them, a skinny, nervous, slippery character appropriately nicknamed the Weasel, a guy who made his living selling information and anything else he could steal. As I walked by the stand, Weasel looked at me, rolled his cigarette from one side of his mouth to the other... Let one of his eyelids droop a little. I got the message. I watched the two plainclothesmen drive away, and sure enough, pretty soon the weasel eased over to me. Hello, Mikey. What's on your mind? I want to talk to you. What about? It's big, Mikey. Yeah, and crooked. Nah, Mikey, you got it wrong. It's big and, uh, and level. Yeah, that'd be the day. Oh, I'm giving it to you straight. It's hot, Mikey. Okay, come on. We'll go have a cup of coffee. Nah. Too many people. Come on. I know where we can talk. I followed Weasel partway out on the pier again to a deserted warehouse. He slid the door open and motioned me to follow. It was dark as pitch inside, but that seemed to be the way Weasel wanted it. Now we can talk, Mikey. Okay, start. It's uh, it's about the guy hanging from the rope. Huh? What about him? That's what I'm telling you. I go aboard that boat to see an old pal, so I'm looking for him back aft. This, uh, 
this cabin door is open a little, so uh, I look inside and there's a guy swinging by his neck. Well, don't leave me there. Oh, gee, it really rocks you to see something like that, but then in a minute I, uh, I kind of got a hold of myself when I go on in. And I, uh, I sort of sights the guy. Why? Why? Because, well, I figured I... I want to find out who he is. Yeah, you mean you figure you'll lift his wallet? Oh, no, Mike. You know, that's about the one thing I figured you'd draw the line at, robbing a dead man. I tell you, I was... I was wrong, I guess. Now, quit trying to sell that yarn about wanting to find out who he is. Well, okay, okay, Mikey. Fellas got to make a buck somewhere, but... But I did find out who the guy is, Mikey. All right, let's have it, then. There were some papers in his wallet, letters, stuff like that, and they, uh... They show that this guy is... Dick Dick Crows. <laughs> The name hit me like a bulldozer. All of a sudden, a lot of things started making sense. His name was in the headlines because Victor Groves was a hired killer, but he was only a name. Nobody had ever seen him except his victims, and they naturally were never in a position to identify him. But why Victor Groves had sent the money to me to arrest him, why he decided to hang himself before I got there, still didn't add up. And neither did Weasel's angle in lifting the papers. Don't you get the pitch, Mikey? You and me... We're the only ones who know the stuff is Victor Groves. So? So? So there ought to be a payoff. The cops probably fork over something to find that out. So then they could call off the hunt. Got it all figured out, haven't you, Weasel? Sure, sure. I, uh, I don't dare go near the cops, but uh, <laughs> you can. So you handle the arrangements and, uh, and we split the take. Right down the middle, huh? I'll, uh, have to think it over. Think it over nothing. We gotta work fast. All right, give me the papers. Huh? Oh, no, no, no. Weasel, Weasel keeps the papers. Come on, come on, let's have them. No, Mikey. Give them to me or it's no deal. But, Mikey, I... Give them, say it. Okay, okay. We, uh... How do I know I can trust you? You don't. <laughs> always, always kidding. Huh, yeah, Mikey? Yeah, always kidding. Look, I'll get in touch with you tomorrow morning at a lunch stand. I'll give you my answer then. In the meantime, I'll keep the papers in a safe place. <laughs> my pocket and stepped back out on the pier. Weasel stood watching me as I started down the pier. I wondered if he had a hunch about what was going on in my mind. If he did, there was going to be trouble. Because what was going on in my mind was I was going to march right down to police headquarters and turn those papers in. Yeah, Michael was going to be very law-abiding this time. And then something happened that froze me in my tracks. There was a scream from 50 yards behind me, from Weasel. <laughs> I whirled around. The scream ended in a horrible gurgle. I pounded back toward him, but he had already crumpled up over on the pier. Even in the dim light, I could see his throat had been cut very recently. I started around the warehouse after the killer. All of a sudden, I was spread eagle in the air, and my head splattered on the pier, and a million stars exploded in front of my eyes. And then all the lights went out. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the generous killer. It all started when a hundred dollar bill was dropped on my desk by a five foot high ship's cook who told me a passenger on a tramp steamer wanted me to come down and arrest him. So I went and found the passenger swinging from the end of a rope. Inspector Lefebvre arrived about then and found no identification on him. And then pretty soon a slippery character named Weasel led me into a warehouse and told me he'd lifted the papers from the dead man. The papers had proved the guy was Victor Gross, a hired killer that nobody would ever seen. I got the papers away from Weasel and started down the pier. Weasel got his throat cut. I ran around the warehouse after the killer when a hand grabbed my ankle and I knocked myself out on the pier. And then, after a while, the hay started thinning out a little. And there I was, riding along in the back seat of a squad car with one of the fever's boys, Sergeant Dykes. Shane, what are you trying to do? Shake down the police force? Shake down it. Now, wait a minute, Dykes. Let's have it slow and clear and from the beginning. Okay. Only maybe I won't be telling you anything you don't already know. A couple of weeks ago, Victor Gross killed one of the boys on the force. Yeah, I read the papers. Then we find you standing in the stateroom watching a man swinging at the end of a rope. Look, Sergeant, I told you the ship's cook brought me a hundred buck bill from this passenger to come down and arrest him. Ah. Uh-uh. And we left you, we drove around the block and walked back to the ship. 
The cook tells us he hasn't been ashore all day. Well, he's lying. He says he hardly ever goes ashore. Hates land. Weighs a shade over 300 and has trouble getting around. 300? Oh, no. Oh, yeah. So we start down the gangway going to look for you. But you save us the trouble. There's a scream farther out on the pier and then someone running. We got out and find a stoolie named Weasel lying dead and you unconscious. Then we find Victor Gross' identification papers on you. I got them from the Weasel. He lifted them from the dead man. Oh, yeah. Look, yeah. Dykes, you got it all wrong. Gross committed suicide. You don't boil, Shane. The knots in the rope and some of the bruises on Gross's neck told us it was no suicide. It was murder. He was strangled. <laughs> Well, about that time, I was willing to sell my social security number very cheap. Two murders with me sitting in the chief suspect's chair on both of them. I guess it was a little after one in the morning when my cell door opened and clanged shut again. I looked up. Inspector Lefevre was standing there. Shane. Hello, Inspector. Let's talk. Why, it's been a losing game for me so far. Seems to be quite a case against you. Yeah, according to just about everybody but me. Look, Inspector, I didn't kill Gross. I didn't lift his papers, and I didn't kill the weasel. That might be kind of hard to prove. About the weasel, that is. Well, maybe somebody will tell me how I managed to slit his throat, get rid of the knife, and then knock myself out. Hmm. You could have managed it. <sighs> okay, okay. But I don't think you did. But what? No, I don't think you killed the weasel, and I'm pretty sure you didn't kill Victor Gross. Well... Well, what do you think I've been trying to tell you, boys, all night? Yo. You know, Shane, the passenger was choked to death. Yeah. I identified him. He is not Victor Gross. He's not Gross? Mm -hmm. Well, then... Then it adds up why Weasel was killed. Because the real Victor Gross found out Weasel had lifted the papers from the dead man and thought Weasel still had them. Could have been that way. It has to be that way, Inspector. Look... Victor Gross knows you're out to get him, so he gets a drifter from the waterfront into that stateroom on the tramp steamer. He kills the guy, plants his own papers on him, strings him up to make it look like suicide, and then he... Hey, wait a minute. That little guy who brought me the hundred said he was a ship's cook. He must have been the real Victor Gross. That's the way it's beginning to look, Shane. He wants you to come down, discover the body. Then everybody thinks Gross committed suicide, the case is closed, and the pressure's off the real Gross. That little guy. Oh, who would have ever figured that he... I can't even remember much what he looked. Well, try to remember, will you? Yeah, but I, I wasn't paying much attention. I remember he was very small. What about the face? Mm, thin face. Straight nose. Dark eyes. That's about it. Not enough. It's the best I can do. All right. We're releasing you, Shane. Well, I won't say it's about time, Inspector, but it is about time. I... Hey... Wait a minute. Hmm? Anyone besides the police force know that the dead passenger has been identified as someone other than Gross? No. That's what I thought. And something else. Does anyone know I've been arrested and don't have Gross's papers on me anymore? Nobody outside knows that. Thanks a lot. I'll stay here. Mm -mm. We're letting you go. I like it here all of a sudden. You can't stay here. Sheriff. Look, I know what you've been leading up to. As far as Gross is concerned, I've still got the papers. Mm -hmm. You think I'm going to walk the streets of New Orleans waiting for him to make a pass at me? We do. Uh -huh. Now get yourself another boy. This one just quit. One of my boys will tell you he'll grab Gross if Gross comes after you. Look, Inspector, you don't know what you're asking me to do. You're wrong there, Shane. I know just what I'm asking you to do. Make a target out of yourself. You know why? I don't care why. I'm not going to... Because a killer's still running around loose. A killer nobody can identify. And he'll strike again soon because he guns not only for hire but for pleasure. He's vicious. He's got to be stopped. And this is one way that might work. Now, how about it? Look, Inspector, you and your boys have been giving me a rough time. You throw me in the clink, you... Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> Well, this ought to do, Shane. Sure, thanks. One place is as good as another. You got it straight now. Too straight. Then to go back to my office building and start out alone, on foot. Right. Keep away from crowds and keep away from the brightly lit streets. Oh, fine. What am I supposed to do, roost in a dark alley somewhere? Just keep away from the bright lights. And get this. When you leave your office building, walk south the block. Then go any direction you want, because that's the point our boy will start tailing you from. One block south of your office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, just one more thing. What is it? <laughs> Good luck. I found an all-night cab stand and grabbed a taxi back to my office building. Just as I was going to start walking, a woman came out of the building and crossed the street. A short woman. And then as I stood there watching her, it dawned on me. 
As I turned north in sort of a daze, I was realizing my job was just twice as tough as I'd thought. Because it had just hit me that Victor Gross was plenty small enough to pass for a woman. <laughs> By the time I digested that pleasant thought, I realized I was about a block and a half from my office. I slowed down and looked around. The streets were pretty deserted. I spotted the car as soon as it turned the corner and came toward me very slowly. I stopped. The car kept coming. I was hoping Inspector Lefebvre's boy was awfully close and ready. Then the car was slowing still more. I got opposite me and it stopped. The window toward me started rolling down, but I couldn't see inside, so I waited, and then... Hey, Flat, how do I get to St. Louis Street from here? I told him. Stood there watching him drive away. Took out my handkerchief and mopped my face a little. Then I started walking again. A little lady with a tray of flowers had been standing in the entrance of a bar, started crossing a narrow street toward me. I stopped. She had a shawl over her head, and she was short. I stood there and watched as she came up to me. A flower, monsieur? A flower for your lapel, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, sure. You're working late tonight. Oh, oui, I always work late. Here, yeah, a nice carnation. Okay, thanks, yeah. Oh, merci, monsieur. Oh, but monsieur, it is too much. Monsieur! <laughs> I was already around the corner. I didn't somehow care about staying in one place too long. The thing was getting to me a little. It seemed like all the inhabitants of New Orleans that I'd seen in the last half hour had shrunk about six inches suddenly. Like like the guy coming down the sidewalk toward me right now. I couldn't tell where he'd come from. He was just suddenly there. I was right near the mouth of an alley, and for a minute I was tempted to dive into it. But I just stood there waiting. He was taking his time. Like the other people I'd waited for, I, I couldn't see his face. He was pretty close now. For the third time, I was hoping the Lefebvre's boy had the situation well in hand. And then the guy was right in front of me. Hey, pal. Happen to have a light on you? I still couldn't see his face. I couldn't tell from his voice, so I took a match out of my pocket. I held it out and scratched it with my thumbnail. A little flame spurted up and outlined his face. It was a wrong face. It didn't belong to Victor Gross. The guy... Puffed a couple of times on a cigarette. Frank Moore walked off. I leaned against the building for a minute. I was having that let down feeling of relief again. But when I heard the dog whimpering with pain in the alley behind me, I didn't even hesitate. I walked into the alley. As soon as I did, I realized there was no dog. There never had been. It was just a little too late, though. A hand shot around my throat. I could feel the point of a knife in my ribs. There was a soft voice in my ear. Well, Mr. Shane, do it again, don't we? <laughs> In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. told me I wasn't supposed to say anything. Victor Gross had gotten to me at last. Inspector Lefebvre's boy was nowhere in sight. Now, Mr. Shane, the identification papers, please. I don't have money, Victor. Please. I have very little time. I tell you, I don't have money. You're not in your office. I have searched it thoroughly. You do not have them on you. So I have wasted my time following you. But uh, perhaps it will not be entirely a waste of time, Mr. Shane. What do you mean? Simply that under the circumstances, I fortunately have no other alternative but to dispose of you. Oh, look, uh, quiet. I had heard the scuffling steps a second or two before. I was hoping Gross hadn't heard them, but he had. I just stood there in the alley, and I knew if I made a single sound, I'd get that knife, all six inches of it. The steps came nearer to the mouth of the alley, and they turned into the alley. And a little figure loomed up in front of us. The scream pulled Gross's eyes off me just long enough. I swung my elbow back hard. I was lucky. The knife went flying across the alley. Then I got hold of one of those fingers that were wrapped around my throat. I put everything I had into it. 
It was just enough. The fingers snapped. My hand fell away, and I swung my fist hard. I picked the ghost bounced off the wall and flopped to the ground and lay still. Just then, a flashlight stabbed into the alley. A big guy followed it in. It was a feverish boy. So everything was okay. And then, then I remembered the little old woman. She was cowering over on one side of the alley, trembling. I went over to her. It was a flower lady. Of all the people I was expecting, you weren't the one. But I was following you. I saw you enter the alley from down the block. Yeah, but why? I would not stop. I called to you. You gave me too much money, monsieur. What are you talking about? I gave you a buck and told you to keep but the change. But I just did, monsieur. It was not one dollar. It was a hundred dollar bill. What? I knew you had made a mistake. I had to return it to you. <laughs> well, I... <laughs> you know that... It's quite a nice touch. Grows his own hundred buck bill is the thing that traps him. What, monsieur? Uh, nothing, nothing. But, do my favor. Keep the door, will you? I kind of think you want it. Well, that was just about that. Except I had a bone to pick with Inspector Lefebvre. Later in his office, I brought it up. You know, that plain clothesman of yours who was supposed to be tailing me, Inspector, he wasn't exactly Johnny on the spot. I was beginning to think he'd never show up. He almost didn't, but it wasn't his fault. He was lucky to find you at all. What do you mean? You remember what your instructions were about leaving your office tonight? Well, yeah, I was to walk south a block, and your boy would start tailing me from there. Right. You, uh... Maybe you had a lot on your mind when you left your office, Carl? Yeah, I'll say. I just realized Groves might be disguised as a woman, I guess. It... Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I... I... You walk north instead of south. <laughs> you, you mean all the time your, your boy wasn't even close? That's right. You were all alone. <laughs> uh, the inspector, hmm? you were... Uh, Know where I could get a good compass? Cheap. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure from mysterious and colorful New Orleans. I'd have sworn someone was standing right behind me. I started to turn, and I heard something come down over me. I tried to duck. I heard a ripping sound and blood running wildly down my arm. A knife. I tried to grab the arm. I couldn't reach it. The knife was coming down again. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode with Michael Shane, that reckless, red-headed Irishman, back in his old haunts in New Orleans. We call it The Case of the Bloodstained Pearl. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Open up. Next time, why not bring along an axe? Lose it all quickly. Uh, sit quickly, ma'am. Where's the key? Key? I want you to lock the door. Now, look, I Papa. said I want you to lock the door, Mr. Shane. Well, let's just snap the double lock for now, eh, and hope for the best. Hey, hey, where are you going? I want to look down the street. I'm sure they followed me. A crafty scheming lot, I'll tell you that. Hey, who are you talking about, Pop? My friends, that's who. My dear, faithful friends. Faithful friends. They boil me in oil. They skin me alive. Cut me to ribbons to find out the hiding. Hey, look, you better slow down. You're going to burn out a berry. Scallions, scallywags, cutthroats, licks, fiddles. And chicken inspectors. What are these friends of yours trying to find? None of your business. You just keep that nose of yours out of our tears. Hey, Mr. hey, hey. Remember, you came to me. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. It's... Oh, it's just this all so infuriating. Makes my blood boil, I swear it does. 
three dear friends. For six years we've shared the same little houseboat, same skimpy fare. We've watched 2,000 sunsets. Yeah. We've talked 10,000 hours of the night away. And now, <clears throat> Mr. Shane, what are your rates for God in a man's life and positions? I kind of think I might be a little too rich for your blood, old timer. Oh, a little too rich for my blood. Well, now. You do indeed. Well, 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 Mr. Shane. Look, I, I suppose I... you've come to that remarkable decision just by looking at me. No, no, just a... coat, these patched pants, cardboard my shoes. I... Too rich for my blood, huh? Let's shed a tear for me, poor old man Pete. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, hey, but feelings. I... Feelings? Why the feelings? I come here on business. My life's in peril. My possession's in jeopardy. Despite your outrageous rates, I'll pay out of my meager safe. And just what are these possessions you want me to protect? Wait, wait. Hey, hey, leave those window shades alone. It's dark enough as it is in here. Stop it, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Now, Mr. Shane, now this is what I want you to protect. Yeah? The contents of this little leather bag. What? Yes, here's what this pitiful old man wants you to protect. Yes, Mr. Shane, yes. This is what they killed me for. In the palm of my hand, I hold three pearls worth a million dollars. In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the bloodstained pearls. It had started like any other day. A widow named Mrs. Coppolis had hired me to track down one of her boarders who'd run away with her copper samovar. And, I fear, the good widow's heart. A guy had called to ask my rates for getting divorce evidence against his blonde wife. And then an old man named Peters came in. The kind of old guy you might see in Jackson Square, sleeping on the grass with a newspaper over his face. Only this old man had a million dollars worth of the biggest pearls I'd ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> well, how do you like them, Mr. Shane? Well, you, you could use them for snowballs, Mr. <laughs> Peters. Where'd you get them? I found them three weeks ago, a little cove along the Mississippi. Not so many years ago, this part of the river was one of the favorite haunts of pirates. Like our feet. This might have been part of his treasure. Lost in the sea, washed up by the tides. Yeah. yeah. Give them back to me. Give them here. Give them here. You've held them long enough. Yeah, they're all yours, Pop. Hey, did you ever have him appraised by a jeweler? I wouldn't trust him out of my sight. Even my own friends would kill me for well, him. How do you know they're worth a million bucks? I've gone to the library, looked up pearls in all encyclopedias. I've compared them with the descriptions of the very finest. There is no comparison. <laughs> Mine are the most beautiful pearls of them all, and they take them from me. Imagine that, my own friends. You know, if you were smart, you'd sell them to a good jeweler and forget them. Never. I'll never sell them. What could anyone give me half so beautiful as these pearls themselves? Yeah, you know, I bet you a million dollars all stacked up real neat is kind of beautiful. Besides, looking in an encyclopedia, what's that? Hmm? For all you know, these pearls came out of a popcorn box, and you're all upset about nothing. Oh, you think so? You think so, eh? Nothing. Well, all right. Just go to a jeweler. I saw one down the street. Oh, yeah, Mr. Forrest. Mind you, I won't sell them, no matter what the price. But let him look at them, Mr. Shane. Let him tell you what they're worth. <laughs> Well, Mr. Forrester? Well? Go on, I'm... tell us, Mr. Shane, what they were. He thinks they might have come out of a, a, a what was it, a popcorn box. Tell him, go on, go on, tell him. I've never seen anything like them. Mm hmm. They're priceless. Ah, you hear, Mr. Shane? You hear, you hear? Now give them back to me. Give me here, give me here. Yes, of course. My beautiful little ladies. Now Mr. Shane knows your worth. Yes, now he won't mock you. Well, what would you say they were worth, Mr. Forrester? Well, I wouldn't even try to give you an estimate, Mr. Shane. Uh, thanks, Mr. Forrester. Come on, Pop. Back to my office. Okay, Pop, have a seat. Uh, uh, now you take me seriously, Mr. Shane. These people who you think are trying to take their pearls I from you. I don't think. I know. They give me for Yeah, yeah. All right. You say you live with them on a houseboat, huh? Yeah. Off Pier 22 on River Highway. And did you tell them about the pearls? No, of course not. But I know they're spying on me continually. And, and wait, and excuse me. Yeah. All right. Yeah? Mr. Shane, this is Foster, the jeweler. Yeah? I thought I'd better call you as soon as you got back to your office. Why? Is the old man still with you? Yeah. Then don't let Unruh's talking to you. What's that? I didn't want to break his heart. I could see what the pearls meant to him and... As long as he never tries to sell them, well, why should we hurt him? You 
You mean... They are paste, Mr. Shea. Nothing but paste. At the very most, they are worth five dollars. Well, how do you like that? Shane, I wish you'd hurry. I don't have all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for calling. Goodbye. Now, Mr. Shane, now we can talk business. I've already gotten a business. But go on, Mr. Peters. So old man Peters hired me to protect his five dollars worth of imitation pearls. I overcame the real Shane long enough to tell him he could pay me at the end of the month, by which time I was sure he'd be out of my hair. He left the office and I forgot about it. Then one night he caught me in one of my less happy moods. The office rent was two weeks overdue, three of my checks had bounced, I was stretched out on my couch feeling jollier than words can say, and the phone started ringing. Yeah. It's me again, Peters. Look, Peters, I wish you'd stop calling me. What kind of a detective are you anyhow? Threatening, falling day and night, and you wish I'd stop calling Oh, what is it now? I know who's been following me. I saw the day for the first time. Look, this is not good. It's bad for you and it's bad for me. You you come up to my office. I'm going to break it to you, gently. Break what to me? You just come on up, Pop. But don't you want to hear who was following me? You'll tell me when you get here. We'll trade little secrets. <laughs> Okay, Pop, okay. Do you always have to knock like that? Look, if you break the glass, you're going to have to hock all your pearls to pay for it. Come on in. Shane. Hey. Hi. Hey, hey, Pop, what's wrong? Uh, uh. Old man Peters was dead before he hit the floor. I don't know how he ever lived to reach my office. There were four bullet holes in his back. As he fell, his left arm flung out wildly. His left fingers doubled into a fist. I bent down to see what was in that fist. It was his most priceless possession bag of phony pearls. Before calling the cops, I put the pearls in my pocket, because now I was going to make it my business to find out who'd killed the old man. After the cops finished questioning me, I really felt beat. I went home to my hotel room and arranged my weary bones around the lumps in the mattress and drifted off to sleep. Then I had to drift right back again. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hello. Shane, this is Mr. Tompkins. Yeah, Tompkins. Yeah, watch me. Down at the office building. Oh, oh, yeah. I thought I'd better call you. Well, what happened? Uh, somebody broke into your office a while ago. Huh? Well, when was this? Well, it must have been between my rounds. I heard something. I came and looked. Everything sure was torn to pieces. Fine, fine. I hope they didn't get anything of value, Mr. Shane. No. No, that's what makes it so wonderful to be poor. Good night. I hung up and started going back to sleep. Just before I made it, I suddenly started thinking about the little bag of phony pearls that was right now in the rear pocket of the pants hanging over my dress. All of a sudden, I wasn't nearly as sleepy as I thought. I reached my cigarettes under my pillow, and then I heard the tiniest sound. Someone was trying to fit a key into my door. The tiny grating sound continued. A couple seconds more and the door would open. I started for my gun on the dresser. I heard the lock snap back. I ran for the dresser. Oh! Dog, I stumbled over a chair. I heard a quick move in the hall. I grabbed the gun and raced to the door. The hall was empty. Nothing but closed doors with numbers on them. The only sound was a guy in one of the rooms whimpering in his sleep. A nice, peaceful scene. Five seconds ago, I'd been close enough to death to smell it. Who had it been? Who had old man Peter's been afraid of? That was an easy one. His three pals on the houseboat. I remember how I'd laughed to myself when he told me they'd kill him for the pearls. Funny thing, I wasn't laughing anymore. I had the pearls now. In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the bloodstained pearls. It all started when a little old guy named Peters came to my office with a wild story of three pearls worth a million dollars. Forrester, a jeweler, said they were worth five bucks at the outside. Yeah, they were paste. Anyhow, somebody thought enough of the pearls to kill the old man. Now I had them, and somebody was trying to kill me. The next morning when I went down to my battered old office, I found a telegram among the ruins. Would like to see you this evening regarding the death of our friend George Peters. 
and there was an address. It was dark by the time we got there. The cab had worn out three maps and his smiling disposition. Five miles out of town, right in the middle of nothing. A rotting wooden pier sticking into the water maybe 20 feet. And at the end of it, a battered old tug. That'll be 275. Okay, here you are. I'm sure sorry I dragged you out this far. You ain't half so sorry as I am, friend. Oh, wait for me, will you? I'll be right back. Stop dead. Uh, hey, hey, wait. Hey. Wait. In the darkness, the lights of New Orleans seemed a thousand miles away. I started down the wooden pier. There were lights somewhere on the tug. There didn't seem to be anything living around here, except the mosquitoes. I hopped onto the tug and started looking for somebody. And I heard someone singing. Hello. I followed the sound. I found a stairway leading down into the hold of the ship. The old guys were sitting on orange crates near a big pot-bellied coal stove. The one who was singing looked like Moses must have looked. Complete with a flaming red beard. Thank you, Brown. Just hearing it makes me feel a little better. Uh, <clears throat> who are you? What do you want? I'm Michael Shane. Shane. This huh? is Shane Brown. Yeah. Mr. Brown was just singing Paul Mr. Peter's favorite song. Old George never got tired of hearing it. What can we do for you, Mr. Shane? I got a wire asking me to come down here. I sent the wire, Mr. Shane. Hmm, what, where'd you come? Oh, my niece, Mr. Shane. Why'd you send for him, Eve? To hear his side of it. His side of it. Mr. Peter died in your office, according to the papers, Mr. Shane. Well, that's right, Eve. The papers also say they can't seem to find a motive for the crime. He wasn't robbed. They said they found his wallet and his wallet. That's all they found. Oh, is there something else to find, Mr. Bryant? See, Eve, you see? Yeah. I think you better go, Mr. Shane. Well, I've got some questions to ask, too. Last it's night, somebody... long, long trail of... Hey, will you tell this guy to shut up? Get out, Mr. Shane. Get out of my sight. I can take a hint as well as the next guy. Besides, there was something in old Brown's eyes when he turned on me. Or maybe it was the crazy red beard. Anyhow, all of a sudden, I wanted to be in the open air again. With the cab gone, there was nothing between me and New Orleans but a long, long trail of winding, like the man said. I started hiking down the road. Must have walked two miles before I came to the gas station. It was all locked up for the night, but there was a phone booth outside. I called for a cab. Then as I hung up, I'd have sworn somebody was standing right behind me. I started to turn. I tried to duck. I heard a ripping sound, a knife. I, I tried to grab the arm. And instead, my fingers closed around the blade. I felt the blade cutting into the flesh. There wasn't any pain, just a warm wetness. I, I couldn't reach the knife. I, I found his wrist with my teeth. I bit down hard. Hard. The knife hit the ground. Then I grabbed for the guy. My fingers closed around a handful of hair. He, he tore himself free, ah. running off down the road. I just flopped down on the ground. After a while, I lit my cigarette lighter to take inventory of the wreckage. There was some mess. One hand looked like second-quality hamburger. The other hand was okay, and it still held a fistful of hair. Red hair. Yeah, I'd just given Mr. Brown's beard a trim. The hard way. The cab showed up about an hour later. But instead of going to the city, I headed back to Pier 22. I was just groggy enough and mad enough to want the rest of that red beard. I marched down the gangway again. This time, there was only Eve putting a coffee pot on the stove. She heard me and she turned. What? Mr. Shane. Where is he? I'm going to kill him. Where is he? You heard. Look at you. Oh, never mind. Now, just tell me where I can get my hands on that bearded old boy. you got to let me help you now. Here, sit down. Please. Yeah. Yeah, you're better. Only for a minute, though. Let me get your coat off now. Good heavens, Mr. Shane, just look at you. Yeah, nice old man, you're Mr. Brown. Hey, hey, easy with the coat. Here. Oh. He'll take the arm right with you. Well, Mr. Brown didn't. Yeah, he sure did. I've got half his red beard to prove it. I was afraid something like this was going to happen. I don't know what to say. You better say it with mercurochrome and bandages. Yeah, I didn't think it was this bad myself. <laughs> I think that'll hold you till you can get to a doctor. Yeah, yeah. 
Regular Florence Nightingale, aren't you? I, mean, I bet you Florence never wore blue jeans and a green sweater. You still look pretty weak, Mr. Sheen. I'll get you a cup of coffee. Yeah, good idea. Of course, I like my mama's way better. Huh? But when I got hurt, she used to kiss it better. I'll get the coffee. I was talking about mama. How much sugar? You really got a one-track mind, Eve. Two lumps. Well, as long as you don't want to discuss Mama, let's get back to old man Brown. Where is he now? I don't know. I haven't seen him since you left. Here's your coffee. Thanks. That's good and hot. You know, I'm glad you're not in on this. In on what? This whole business. Peters, Pearls, Brown. I don't understand. Oh, of course you don't understand. It takes a particular kind of woman to understand. Now, I've been in this racket so long, I can spot a wrong dame like that. That's remarkable. Oh, nothing remarkable about it, Eve. They'll they'll say something. Or look at you in a certain way. You get to know you. You get to feel. Uh, drink your coffee. It's getting cold, Mr. Shane. Yeah. Yeah, everything they do, the perfume they wear, the way they dress, everything's a promise. You fall for the promise and end up in the gutter. I understand people like that, honey. But you don't understand people like Mr. Brown. Do you, Mr. Shane? <laughs> What's that understand? A bag of pearls explains Mr. everything. Brown with his ferocious red beard. You know what he was? Milkman in Chicago. Yeah, he should have stayed there. Trapped in a dull, monotonous job. Year after year. Finally pensioned off so he could crawl into a corner and die. Yeah, I... My uncle and poor Mr. Peters. They're like that, too. Wasting the last precious years. But always dreaming of escape. He's... I didn't hear you. Well, they're skating this old house boot on the Mississippi. Who would have been in there to buy it? It was worth it. Look, I, I don't feel so good. Can't imagine how happy these three old men were. Can't imagine how fond they became of each other. <laughs> Something wrong, Mr. Shane? I'm sick. My stomach. What? what? Your faith in me was a little premature, Mr. Shane. I poisoned your coffee. <laughs> They started for the gangway, and then the gangway subdivided like something under a microscope, and there were two gangways, and then there were four, and then there were gangways everywhere. I, I hung on to all the railings, tried climbing all the stairs, and then barring my way was Eve's uncle, Mr. Johnson, only it was a whole row of Mr. Johnsons, and they were all holding ancient guns. I, I remember rushing past, rushing through the cold air. I remember falling to my knees just as I heard all the ancient guns go off. Last thing I saw in all the world were the headlights of the taxi cab I'd told to wait. My last thought was how funny. Uh, most taxi cabs had only two headlights, but this one had half a million. Well, it looks like he's coming out of it, Doc. Yes, he's a lucky boy. Jane, you must have cornered the market on four-leaf clovers. You had enough poison in you to... Oh, take it easy, Mr. Shane. You're going to be all right. Hey, who's this Eve? Eve. Eve talking. Eve, double-crossing dame. Oh! Ooh. Cab driver who brought you here gave us the address. Now, look, you go to sleep, kiddo. I'll pick him up. Oh, oh, wait for me. Uh, hand me my pants, Doc. Mr. Shane, I absolutely won't be responsible for what Hand happened. me my pants, uh... After what I've taken from those three, I wouldn't miss a payoff if it took my last corpse. But, Mr. Shane... Will you hand me my pants and... Inspector... Yeah? Since I'm the guy that ran through the meat grinder, will you let me finish it off my way? Well, what do you mean, Shane? On the way out to the house, board, I want to pick up a jeweler named Forrester. So we picked up Forrester. The poor guy was so scared to hear us pounding on his door at two in the morning, I thought he'd never live to make the houseboat. It was almost three when we got there. But Eve and Brown and Johnson were still up, sitting around the red-hot coal stove like they'd been expecting us right along. Eve jumped up as we clattered down the gangway. Mr. Shane, Mike, you're all right. Yeah, yeah, that coffee, it was better than tonic. You ought to bottle it, Eve. You really have something there. Mr. Brown, your beard doesn't look quite so flowing tonight. Okay, Inspector, take over. I'm arresting all three of you on the charge of murder. Murder? murder. Before you take them away, I want to show them this. Yeah, kiddies, here's a bag of pearls. I had them on me all the time. Mike. Yeah, here's what you killed old man Peters no, for. Mike. Shut up. You want all that corny talk about friendship? 
The three old buddies sitting in the sun. Yeah, blood brothers, until one of them found a bag of pearls. Then it was his blood. Don't you say that. Oh, I'm not through, baby. I'm just full of surprises. Like they say in the minstrel show, honey, you ain't heard nothing yet. Here's what you killed old man Peters for. A million dollars worth of pearls. Mr. Forrester. Yes, Mr. Shane? Tell them what these pearls are really worth. Five a piece. They're not worth five dollars. You hear that? That's what you shot the old man in the back for, a bag of phonies. And here's where the phonies are going, right where poor old Peter should have thrown them in the first place. Right into the stove. Right into the fire. Oh, don't be the scene. Hey, Forrester, what's wrong? Uh, the fire will destroy them. You stupid fool, I've got to save them. Hey, hey, get away from the stove. to save them. Get out your bird. A million dollars. Ah! In a moment, we'll be back with the thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Someone finally pulled Forrester's arm out of the fire. While we waited for an ambulance, Forrester blubbered out the whole story. How he'd killed Peters for the pearls. How he'd come into the hallway of my hotel that night and would have killed me for them. How he'd have killed a thousand times for such wonders as those priceless jewels. Now I'd destroyed them. I didn't hear much of it. I just flopped down let my head fall on my chest. All that had happened was finally catching up with me. And then as the inspector started up the gangway, I waved for him to come over. What is it, Shane? Here, Inspector. Give these to the museum or something. The pearls? Yeah, I don't understand. Well, the way Forrester acted when we picked him up tonight got me to wondering. I thought, why take a chance? So all I threw into the fire was a cloth bag. Shane, you know there are times when I almost wish you'd joined the force. Yeah. With all my other troubles, that's all I'd need. Okay, kid. See you around, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. Mike? Uh, hmm? Feeling better? Yeah, I feel beautiful. You thought we killed Mr. Peters for the pearls. Mm. We thought you killed him for him. We love the old man so much, that's why we tried to kill you. You know, Eve, you can be arrested for that if I want to press charges, that is. Do you want to? Ah. Oh. At least it wasn't all wasted. At least I met you, Mike. Yeah, they're yeah, a big deal. Well, I'd better be going. I'm pretty beat. Must you go, Mike? Mm-hmm. What cold air. It's down morning. Cut right through you. And if I stay, what would you do to keep me warm? I'll make you a nice pie of coffee. Yeah. Good night, kid. <laughs> This is your director, Bill Russo. Michael Shane is written by Larry Marcus and based on characters created by Brett Halliday. Music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don Sharp production transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, Mike Shane, against his will, gets involved in an exciting story of romance and intrigue. I hope you'll be listening. There he was, squinting down the gun barrel at my throat. I was wishing I'd taken the fever's advice and kept out of the whole deal. Then I saw his fingers start to tighten on the trigger, but all I could do was stand there, helpless, knowing that in one more second, death would be flying my way. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Jeff Chandler. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Phantom Neighbor. Mm. 
Oh, okay, okay. Quarter after one. Great time to be caught. Hello. Miss Michael Shane? Yeah, who's this? Anne Griffin, Mr. Shane. Anne Griffin? Yes, that's right. Who the... No, we've never met before. You don't know me and I don't know you. I'm in apartment 23 at the Bryant Arms and I'm sitting here all alone. No, oh, well, look. They tell me I'm pretty, Mr. Shane. They say I have a nice personality. Huh? I wear clothes well. I can play the piano a little. What? I dance, swim, ride, play golf, all in all. I guess I'm a rather desirable person. Look, so you're a real peachy kid. Do you have to wake me up in the middle of the night to tell me about it? I've an awful lot to live for, haven't I, Mr. Shane? I have a boyfriend named Tom and a car and everything a girl could want. Isn't that fine? Isn't that just fine? Aren't you glad for me? Look, maybe you know what this is all about, but believe me, I don't. Unless it's someone's quaint idea of a joke. A joke? Yes, I suppose it is a joke. A big one. So we both laugh together, Mr. Shane? Oh, now, look, let's both be calm. All I want to know is one simple thing, one little tiny thing. Why did you telephone me? I picked your name out of the book. Wasn't that nice of me, Mr. Shane? Because now you're lucky. Just think, you'll be the first one to know. Know what? I... I just killed a man, Mr. Shane. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Phantom Neighbor. I thought I'd heard just about everything, but when a bitter young lady named Ann Griffin telephoned me at 1 a.m. to tell me she'd just killed a man, I felt like I'd just been slapped in the face with a wet towel. I pulled on my clothes and beat it over to the Brian Arms. The door to apartment 23 was unlocked. I went in. Ann Griffin was sitting in a chair, staring at the wall. On the floor at the other end of the room, a man lay face down, dead. Hello, Mr. Shane. Hello, Ann. Thank you for coming. Who is he? Well, Metcalf. What happened? I... I'm not sure. What do you mean? I... I don't know. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. He's... He's dead. Dead. No, no, no. Get hold of yourself, Anne. Yes, I, I, I killed him. I, I didn't want to do anything like that. Anne, I, cut I, it out. Yes. Now, look, I... I don't know what you expect me to do, but there's nothing I can do except call the police. Mr. Shane, you... You probably won't believe this. I, I couldn't blame you, but... Deep inside, I can't believe I killed Al Metcalf. I, I can't believe it. Now look, Ann, I... I want you to tell me everything that happened. Don't leave anything out. I'll try to start from the beginning. This is Lyle Metcalf's apartment. I... I came to see him tonight. He your fiancé, a boyfriend? No. Or... I see. He sent for me, and I, I had to come. What time did you get here? About 11. Lyle insisted I have a drink with him, and I, I did. And then, then I started to feel very strange... Sleepy and dizzy. I told him I wanted to walk around and get some fresh air. He didn't want me to leave. I did anyway. You think there was something in the drink? Oh, there must have been. What time did you leave the apartment? Oh, maybe 20 minutes after I arrived. Well, then it'd make it about 11.20. Okay, then what? I, I'm not sure. I was in sort of a daze. I just wandered around up one street and down another. Now, look, try to remember what you did. I, I, I can. Did you see anyone? Talk to anyone? I, Wait a minute. Yes, the coffee shop. I went in. I had a cup of coffee. Where was it? Uh, I don't remember. Oh, fine. Anything else? Uh, yes, there was a man. He, he told me his name. I can't remember it. Jimmy, uh, something like that. You talked to him? He talked to me. He followed me for a while. And I just kept walking. And then I didn't see him anymore. I came back here. You don't know who he was or where he is, huh? No. Oh, great. I, I think... Oh, it's no use. Yeah, I'm beginning to think you're right, Anne, but let's have the rest of the story. You came back here to the apartment. Yes, it was a little before one. You're sure of that? I, I think I remember looking at my watch. You think? Look, Anne, you've got to do better than think. Well, I'm trying. I had a spitting headache. Yeah, and yeah, I... sure, no. All right, go ahead. I opened the door and I... I walked in. That's it. What do you mean, that's it? Well, th that's the last I can remember. What? Yes, every everything just sort of went black. Then after a while, I realized I was lying on the floor with a gun in my hand. There in front of me was Lyle. He was dead. Well, I don't know what to say, Anne. It's not exactly a convincing story. I know. Hey, hey, wait a minute. What is it? Look, did you telephone me as soon as you realized what had happened? Yes, why? You called me at a quarter after one. You probably didn't black out for more than a few minutes. That'd make the time of death not more than half an hour ago. 
Metcalf looks to me like he's been dead considerably longer than that. What do you mean, Mr. Shane? I don't know. Maybe nothing. I... And turn your head to the side a little. Huh? Turn it. Well, uh, that's it. Hmm. What's the matter? Sort of a whelp behind your left ear. Well, well... Oh. Yes, there is. I... Any idea how you collected that? No. Well, I told you I had a fitting headache while I was wandering around the streets. I think I remember stumbling and falling once, but I'm not yeah. sure. Well, it's just my luck to get mixed up with you, I guess. Of all the private detectives in New Orleans, you had to call me. What do you mean? I mean I could easily qualify for cluck of the year for doing what I'm about to do. I, I don't understand you. It's not surprising. I'm not sure I do either. Well, come on. I'm going to report it to the police, and then you and I are going to try and find one of the people who saw you wandering around. Oh, but Mr. Shane... Yeah. Yeah, I am. I'm just soft enough to hope there's a chance you didn't kill Metcalf after all. Sure, I should have had my head examined. But I called police headquarters, and then Ann and I started out. And it was a losing proposition. We wandered around for a while, and she did find the coffee shop where she'd been before. But according to the gent there, she only stayed long enough to discover that she didn't have a nickel with her, and then she beat it again. Which meant she had an alibi for exactly one minute of those two hours. We kept on a while longer, but I could tell none of the streets looked familiar to her. I... I guess it's no use, Mr. Shane. I, I don't remember anything around here. I think we might as well go back. Yeah. I want you to know how much I appreciate your help anyway, Mr. Shane. If you could only remember more about this gent Jimmy you say was following you for a while. The guy who wanted to make a date. What did he look like? Sort of tall and thin, I think. I know, Mr. Shane. I know it's not enough of a description to give you one chance in a million of finding him. What's the good of talking anymore? Look, Ann, before we go back, I want you to try just once more. Is there anything you haven't told me? Have you left out anything at all? I don't think so. At least, not that I can remember. Well, uh, okay, Ann, let's go back. We went back to the Bryant Arms, and neither of us was very talkative on the way. I opened the door to apartment 23, and we went in. Metcalf's body was still on the floor, but the chair right beside him was now occupied. Hello, Shane. Oh, hello, Lefevre. This Ann Griffin with you? Yes. Well, this is Inspector Lefevre of Homicide, Ann. Yes. That private eye badge getting a little heavy for you? What do you mean? I mean, maybe we could give you a lift and take it off your hands. Now, look, Lefevre, I reported the murder, didn't I? Yeah. And then you and Miss Griffin here decided to have an evening on the town, maybe. Please! Look, Lefevre, I was just I'll trying... I'll save a chain. I want to question Miss Griffin first, but I'll get back to you again. You can count on it. Lefevre questioned her, and she told him the same story she'd given me. About that time, the coroner arrived, and they took the body away. Finally, Lefevre motioned to Sergeant Dykes to take Anne to headquarters. She got to the door with him, then she stopped. Goodbye, Mr. Shady. Goodbye, Ann. Thank you. Everything. Okay, Shane, now let's have it. Let's have what? The reason you thought you had the right to start running this case. Oh, look, Lefevre, I wasn't trying to run the case. No, no, of course you were. You just waltzed off with the chief suspect, that's all, but you weren't trying to run the case. You weren't interfering with the police at all. Now, look, don't try to pin anything like that on me. I reported the killing, I haven't withheld any evidence, and I brought your suspect back. Yeah. And you beat your deadline by exactly five minutes. My deadline? I had a warrant for your arrest in front of me. Next time I'll sign it, remember that. Okay, LaFever, okay. So maybe what I did wasn't smart, but I think Ann's innocent. Yeah. Well, sure, her story sounds a little weak, but I think she's telling the truth. A little weak? Shane, a gentle breeze would blow that story over and nothing flat. But that part about going in a coffee shop's the truth. I talked to the guy. Oh, and... sure you did. She's got an alibi for one minute out of 120. This guy who followed her, if we can find him, maybe... Uh, uh, Shane. Look, what was the time of the death? Uh, we think between 11.30 and midnight. But she said he followed her for quite a while. Maybe it was for that half hour. Maybe... Maybe there was no Jimmy at all, Shane. I think you're wasting your time. Look, Lefevre, I don't get hunches often, but I've never had a stronger one than this. Well, don't try to do business on hunches, Shane. You'll go broke fast. I tell you, Ann's innocent. I'm going to prove it to you. Where is he? Uh, Where is the policeman? Well, I guess you mean me, sister. Who are you? I am Suzanne. Lyle Metcalf, the one who was murdered. He was my man. Yeah. I said him take his body away. They, they told me what had happened. All right, take it easy. Was she who did it, that woman? Eh? How do you know? I knew she was coming to see him tonight. I, I waited outside. I watched her. She was coming to see my Lyle. I saw her arrive. Then she came outside and down the street. But five minutes later, she came back. You, 
You sure about that? Of course I am sure. She went back into the apartment. She did not come out until the policeman brought her out a few minutes ago. She killed him. She killed my liar. All right, Shane. Look, I... Like I say, you've been wasting your time. But maybe there's still a chance. Uh No soap, Shane. It was a nice try, but you just lost yourself a client. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Phantom Neighbor. It all started when a girl named Ann Griffin called me over to Lyle Metcalf's apartment a little after 1 a.m. There was Metcalf dead and Ann pretty hazy as to whether she'd killed him or not. I tried to sell Inspector Lefebvre on the possibility that Ann was innocent. About then, the dead man's girlfriend, Suzanne, came barging in and said Ann had only been gone from Metcalf's apartment five minutes instead of two hours, all of which cut the ground right out from under my feet. Well, I left and started back to my office, but I hadn't gotten very far before a very rugged-looking guy collared me. Just a but, minute, Shane. Who are you? And get your hands off of me. Okay, private eye, open up. I said get your hands off me. Who are you, anyway? Tom Harris. Ann Griffin's my girl. Uh, well, so I still don't see where you get off shoving me around. I want to know who put you up to it. Who's paying you? What are you talking about? Paying me for what? For hanging this frame on Ann. Frame? Are you by any chance talking about the Metcalf killing? You know that's what I'm talking about. And the way it looks to me, somebody hired you to drag her into it. Oh, get this, Harris. I've spent most of the night getting my neck in a sling with the cops while I wandered around with your girlfriend trying to find an alibi for her. Because I believe she was innocent. Huh? Right up until a witness told us Ann was lying. So I'm in no mood to listen to you sound off about something you don't know anything about. Hey, wait, wait a minute. You were trying to help him. What did you think I was doing? Trying to see how mad I could get the cops at me? Well, look, Shane, I guess I got a couple of things wrong. And I guess you have, brother. So if you'll just get out of my way before I... Well, I'm sorry. I, I guess... Well, the whole thing has sort of knocked me for a loop. Hey, wait a minute. You said something about a witness contradicting Ann's story? That's right. Why, I can't believe it. I can't... And what trouble is, Harris, right now, the cops do believe it. Mr. Shane, I don't know what Ann was doing in Metcalf's apartment. I don't intend to ask her. But I do intend to stick with her. Yeah, I think you'd better. Because it looks very much like Ann's going to need all the support she can get. I left him standing there looking slightly sick. And I went home to bed. I was going to forget the whole thing. Matter of fact, I spent the rest of the night trying. I tried right up until the time I walked into Lefevre's office at 9 a.m. Now, oh, Shane, don't tell me that you still Look, Lefevre, all I want to do is ask a couple of questions. Okay. Ask. Who was Lyle Metcalf and what did he do for a living? He was a gambler. Incidentally, he was killed with his own gun. Oh? Well, who did he run around with? The usual crowd. Eddie Zerniel. A couple of lesser lights. Eddie Zerniel, huh? Oh, nice boy. Yeah. Rumor is that Metcalf had been pretty lucky lately. He went him big, huh? Anyone know who he'd won from or whether he'd been able to collect? No. Well, look, maybe that could have something to do with it. Maybe somebody paid off Metcalf with a slug instead of those. Someone like Zernio. Well, that's a pretty theory, Shane, but it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that Ann Griffin's our number one suspect. Okay, but maybe you won't mind if I sort of nose around a little. Still wasting your time, huh? No, I don't mind. Thanks, Lefebvre. Just put it down, I happen to have a little time to waste. My first stop was at Eddie Zernio's, Metcalf's gambler friend. Zernio was alone at his desk with a polite smile on his face and a coin in his hand. Call it, Shane. Heads. Tails. Tails it is. Lyle Metcalf got himself killed last night, Zernio. Or maybe you already knew that. Call it. Tails. Heads. I read the paper, Shane. Metcalf, a friend of yours? Heads. Tails. You don't call him so hard, do you? Maybe I'll get better. Hmm. I asked you if Metcalf was a friend of yours. I already told two cops he was. So I'll tell you two. Metcalf was a friend of mine. I'll make you happy. Heads. How can you be so wrong, so often, Shane? Dave. Metcalf owe you dough, Zerniel, or was it the other way around? I owed him dough. Oh? Yeah. Two bits. That sounds like a good reason for killing him. 
Tails. Well, you're consistent, Shane. You call him wrong every time. Maybe that means you should quit trying to call him at all. Get it? Yeah. On the other hand, maybe it means you should quit using that second coin you've been hiding in your hand. Get it? Well, aside from a lesson in coin flipping, I'd gotten nothing from Zernio. I went over to Metcalf's apartment and wandered around for a while. Just about to give up and leave when it hit me. I'd been in his bedroom, and all of a sudden I realized I'd been staring out the window. What was outside was a narrow air shaft, and four feet away was another window. The apartment on the other side of the building that backed up to the air shaft. I stared across the shaft, but there was no sign of life in the other apartment. I beat it down to the manager, but it got me nothing. The apartment had been vacant for three weeks. Well, about then, my head was feeling very bruised from the stone wall treatment. I started down the hall of the apartment house, turned the corner toward the front door, and ran right into Lyle Metcalf's girlfriend, Suzanne. Oh. Well, well, what are you doing around here, Suzanne? The way I live here. Here, in this apartment house? What is wrong with that? Nothing. What apartment you live in? 26. Now, I must go get out of my way. 26. That's around the corner from Metcalf's apartment. Why? Incidentally, there's something I wanted to ask you about the story you told Inspector Lefebvre last night. I have night. nothing more to say. You told him you've been watching Metcalf's apartment all evening. Where were you watching it from? Oh, let me Where go. were you? My apartment. Now, let go of me. Oh, no. You can't see Metcalf's apartment from yours. No, I mean it was from the street. Oh, I... no soap, Suzanne. The cop on the beach said there was nobody outside. I mean to tell you. Yeah, yeah. You were lying, Suzanne. No, I tell you, I saw You're her. You're lying. You weren't in any place where you could watch Metcalf's apartment. I say, let's go out of me. You have no right to I've me. even got it figured out why you were lying. You knew Anne was coming to see your boyfriend. You got jealous. You figured you'd try to hang it on her if you could, right? I, I have nothing more to say to you. Uh, uh, Lefebvre. Shane, you're a big bully. Look, did you hear what Suzanne just admitted, Lefebvre? She was lying when she said Anne was only away from Metcalf's apartment five minutes. Yeah. You probably caught her off guard with all that fast talk of yours and the bluff about the cop on the beat. Well, then that ought to prove it. It proves Suzanne was lying, Shane. That's all. But just... Shane, look. Anne still doesn't have any more of an alibi for those two hours than she did before. Now, if you can turn one up, good. I'll give it a listen. But don't bother coming around unless you can. All of which left me no better off than before. Obviously, the only alibi Ann could possibly hope for was the tall, thin gent, Jimmy, who'd followed her around for a while trying to get a date with her while she was out walking. But I'd realized a long time ago that the odds against finding this Jimmy were just about a million to one. So by the time I got back to my office and pushed open the door, I couldn't have been feeling any lower. I started for my desk, but the chair was already occupied. Hello. You're Shane, aren't you? Yeah, who are you? Name's Jimmy. You believe in making yourself at home or a... Hey, wait a minute. Let's have that again? I said my name's Jimmy. Oh, no. It just couldn't be. Sure. I'm the guy who followed Ann Griffin around the streets last night. Well, I'll be... So I break my neck trying to find you, finally give up, and you walk right into my office. I read in the papers what the girl said about a tall, thin guy named Jimmy following around. She's right. It was me. So I thought I'd better show up, help her out. Hey, look... Do you have any idea how long you were following her around? Sure. From a little after 11 till past 12. Are you sure about that? Sure. I'd stop her and talk to her a while, and she'd start walking again. I finally gave up. I figure when it's that tough to get a date, it ain't worth it. From a little after 11 until past 12. Yeah, that does it. Does what? It covers Anne for the time of the killing. Oh, brother, you don't know how glad I am you dropped in. You've done a lot more than just help, Anne. You've saved her life. <laughs> Jimmy and I headed for police headquarters. He told his story to Lefevre, and 20 minutes later, Ann was out of jail. Her boyfriend, Tom Harris, called for her, and it looked like my job was just about over. Come on, dear. I'll take you home. Never mind, Tom. I'll just get a taxi back to my apartment. Look, it's late. Please, I... Tom. I'd just rather be alone for a while. Oh. Well, sure, Ann. Okay. Mr. Shane, after everything you've done for me, saying just thank you is so inadequate. Thank you. Sure. You probably think I'm a prize heel, Shane, for acting the way I did after Ann was arrested. I can understand how you felt, Harris. You know, I'm really not such a bad guy when you get to know me. Oh, glad to hear it. And if there's anything I can ever do, well, you know. Yeah. Well, I uh, kind of like to get back to my apartment. I'm just a little tired. Goodbye, Mike, and goodbye. So long, Ann. <laughs> Tom put her in a taxi, and then he got in his car and drove away. 
I just stood there in the shadows, feeling tired, being glad that Ann was in the clear. I was just about to start for my car when a black coupe passed by, going slow. It looked like the coupe was following Ann's taxi. The guy in the coupe was Jimmy, the witness who'd cleared her a few minutes ago. All of a sudden, I got a real shaky feeling about Ann. I got in my car and followed Jimmy. He pulled up in front of Ann's apartment and went inside. Two minutes later, I followed. I climbed the stairs, went down the hall, and stopped in front of Ann's door. I could hear voices. Then I heard Ann say, it's all I've got right now. I opened the door fast. There were Ann and Jimmy, and Ann had some money in her hand. Mr. Shane! Well, well, so it's payoff time, hey, Ann? Oh, Mr. Shane, Congratulations, I... baby. You had me fooled, but good. Oh, I know what you're thinking, but you're you wrong. You really made a sucker out of me. So you're the one who owed Metcalf, though. You killed him and hired Jimmy here to be your alibi. Hey, that's not true. You've got to believe me. No. Look, baby, it doesn't matter whether Shane believes you or not. He's checking out as of now. Huh? Yeah. I got a real nice setup here, Shane. You and nobody else is going to spoil it for me. This gun is going to make sure you don't. Right now. In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, there I was in Ann Griffin's apartment with Jimmy, the bought and paid for witness, squinting down the barrel of a gun at me. I was wishing I'd taken Lefebvre's original advice and kept out of the whole deal. I saw Jimmy's fingers start to tighten on the trigger, but all I could do was stand there and then... I... I... Hey, what happened? Somebody shot Jimmy. Mr. Shane, the door behind you. Huh? Tom! Yeah. Tom. Wait a minute. I, I don't get it. I was trying to tell you, Mr. Shane. It's Tom. Tom is the killer. What? I just found out a couple of minutes ago. Oh, now, yes, look. She's you... right, Shane. My dear little Anne is right. So you're the one who owed Metcalf the dough, Harris. I didn't know that then, Mr. Shane. When Metcalf called me, he told me Tom was in trouble with him and I could help by coming to Metcalf's apartment, but... Then when he put something in my drink, I knew I had to get out of there in a hurry. Wait a minute. I don't quite get where this guy Jimmy fitted into the deal. He followed me while I was walking around. That was the truth. But what I didn't know was he followed me back to Metcalf's apartment. He started to leave, but then he saw someone crawling across the air shaft out of Metcalf's apartment. Namely me. Well, I guess when Jimmy read the newspaper the next morning, he could piece together what had happened. He, he was afraid to try to blackmail Tom. So instead he got you released from jail so he could blackmail you, huh? I didn't know what to say when he came to me just a few minutes ago. I thought if I could stall him... Yes, my dear, and speaking of stalling, there's been a little too much already. Well, Harris, it was a pretty workable idea, wasn't it? You watched Metcalf's apartment from across the air shaft. When Ann left, you crawled across and killed Metcalf. Then when Ann came back, you knocked her out and put the gun in her hand. Look, I said there'd be no more stalling. You know, Harris, you told me a little while ago you weren't such a bad guy when I got to know Don't you. Don't come any closer, Shane. You were right. You're a real keen kid. Framing your sweetheart for a murder you'd committed. Get back, Shane. Get back. He was still standing in the doorway with the door half open. It was now or never. I dove in low, hit the door, and it crashed into his gun arm. The slug whistled past my left ear. I brought my fist up and connected with the gun. It flew out of his hand and across the room. He turned and ran down the hall. I pounded after him. He went down the stairs three at a time and increased his lead. Then just as he got to the bottom and headed for the front door, a foot shot out of the shadows and hooked his ankle. He spread eagled in the air, came down hard and lay still. Uh, Lefebvre. Yeah, he was really in a hurry, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah, he had good cause to be. Well, it just goes to show you, Shane, never hurry. Harris probably got a broken nose right now because of that. Yeah, that'll be the least of his worries from now on. He's your killer, Lefebvre. Well, now, that's real interesting. Anything in the way of proof? Yeah, but why don't you find out for yourself? What do you mean? Well, after all, I'm just a guy who's been trying to run the case, interfering with police, and wasting my time, remember? Oh, now, look, So just go right ahead. Shane. Me? I've got some more time to waste. This time, it's going to be in bed. Shane. Good night, dreamboat. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday and written by Bob Wright. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chan. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Char production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. I turned around as soon as I heard the noise. There, standing behind me, was a... a thing. About my height, with a face that was almost human, but was covered with hair... There were two giant claws with blood on them. 
I started backing away, but my foot caught in the vine and I went down. The thing came at me and I thought, Shane, you should have started believing in ghosts before it was too late. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Bayou Monster. Yes, sir? Uh, my name's Shane. I'm supposed to meet a Mrs. Forsythe here. Oh, yes, sir. Mrs. Forsythe is waiting for you over at that table. That's Mrs. Forsythe? Yes, sir. Mm, thanks. Hello. Michael Shane? Mm-hmm. Please sit down. I'm Amy Forsythe. Yeah, I know. Pleasant surprise. Hmm? I guess I was expecting someone older. Oh? Look, I don't quite understand why you wanted me to meet you here. I usually transact my business in my office. Yes, of course. Mr. Shane, I'm hiring you for an indefinite period. You're, you're hiring me? Look, Mrs. Forsyth, people usually tell me what they want me to do, and then I decide whether I take the job or not. Well, I'm sure you'll take it. You are? You sound like you were used to getting your own way. Mr. Shane, the Forsyths have been getting their own way for something like 200 years. Three cheers for the Forsyths. That's what's made us so powerful and so decadent. It's very interesting, but as an unpowerful, undecadent Shane, I still haven't had any reason for you to be so sure you're hiring me. Fifty dollars a day, Mr. Shane. You're hiring me. That's better. Family plays bon chance is out in the bayou country. Bon chance? It, it means good luck. Yes. My great-great-grandfather had a very ironic sense of humor. The place has been atrociously bad luck for at least one member of each generation. Oh. But that's beside the point. What I want you to do, Mr. Shane, is come out to Bonchance. Stay there until you've found something or someone for me. And remove it. Something or someone? I don't get it, Mrs. Forsyth. That's not surprising. Because what I want you to find and remove is a ghost, Mr. Shane. A ghost. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Bayou Monster. Well, I've gotten a lot of strange assignments in my time. But when Mrs. Amy Forsythe hired me to run down a ghost in the ancestral mansion Bon Chance back in the swamp country, I set some kind of record for myself. Amy was sort of a strange girl. At first, you thought she was very pretty. But then you began to notice little things about her that weren't. Her mouth, for instance, cruel. Her nose a little too thin. Her eyes might have been just a shade farther apart. Yeah, she looked like the last of an old family on its way out. But that 50 a day she offered me spelled lots of good times for one Michael Shane, so I took the job. I was to drive to the landing and meet a boatman who'd take me to Bonchance that afternoon. But before I left, I dropped in to see Police Inspector Lefebvre. Hello, Shane. So what do I owe this, uh... uh honor's the word, Inspector. Honor. Oh, I, uh, just dropped by to tell you there aren't any dead bodies in my office today, Lefebvre. Well, things are slack all over. And to tell you, I'm going ghost hunting. Come again? <laughs> no kidding. I've been hired to find a ghost at a place called Bon Chance back in the swamps. Shane, you're a nice boy. Why, Inspector? I wouldn't want to see anything happen to you. Huh? So why don't you just stay away from Bon Chance? Bon Chance. Yeah. Hey, look, what is this, Lefebvre? Don't tell me you believe in ghosts. No, I don't believe in ghosts, Shane. I've lived around this part of the country all my life. Been in the force here in New Orleans 17 years. I've seen a lot of strange things happen, but I don't believe in ghosts. And why all of... The whole Forsyth clan is a jinx outfit from way back. Jinx? What do you mean? Something happens in every generation. Something bad. You know, Inspector, the more you talk, the more interested I'm getting in this new job of mine. I'll send you a full report. Okay, Shane. Okay. I just hope you'll be alive to sign it. Yeah, that's my friend, Inspector Lefebvre. Always there with a reassuring word. Well, three hours later, a little after sunset, I drove up to the landing where I was to meet the boatman who'd take me to Bonchance. He turned out to be a cajun named Akil, a thin fellow with a long mustache. I got in the parole, the long, narrow boat, and the keel shoved off. He sent the boat skimming along at an amazing clip. And pretty soon, we were deep into the bayou. 
A pale moon wasn't doing a very good job of piercing the misty haze that hung over the swamp. What with the matted trees and vines overhead, it was like a tunnel. A noisy tunnel at that. Sounded like the soundtrack to a jungle movie. Uh, you've been with the Forsyth family long, Akil? Me. I work for them long time. Since little children. Oh? You ever hear anything about a ghost at Forsyth? Yes. He's Luke Garou here. Luke Garou? You call him werewolf, hmm? A werewolf? Or... Look, you don't actually believe what... Did you ever see this werewolf? Oh, I think, yes. What? This long time ago, little boy me in Bayou. You actually saw it? I seen this thing. Tall with hair on face, long claws. I no wait for get good look. My teeth start to chatter. I run like wind. Yeah, but how... I tell Mama Cecile what I seen. She say is Luke Garuhi. Well, who's Mama Cecile? Old one who live in swamp, she. Hmm. Uh, we almost there? Yes. It's bon chance up ahead. See? Yeah. I see it. There it was, rearing up out of the swamp ahead of us. A rotting, gloomy mansion that sagged a little here and there, as if the ground below it was slowly sinking into the swamp. The whole place looked like an unburied corpse, and there was a smell of decay in the air. We tied up at the landing, and a servant waiting with a torch took me up to the house. The little breeze that had come up was pushing the flame back and forth, and in the flickering light, the whole place looked like something you might dream about after eating too much lobster. Amy Forsyth, two men, and a giant hound dog were waiting for me in the library. Quiet, dear. Quiet! Mr. Shane, I'd like you to meet my uncle, Edward Forsyth. Mr. Forsyth? How do you do, Mr. Shane? And this is my husband, Paul Forsyth. Mr. Forsyth again. Hello. And this is Dirk, my dog. Yeah. I thought it was a Shetland pony at first. <laughs> Dirk's been with the Forsyth since he was a pup. Lately, I've kept him with me. You know, I've made quite a discovery. Everybody around here seems to be named Forsyth. Amy and I are sort of third cousins, twice removed, I believe. Any more questions, Mr. Shane? Questions? Or am I free to go now? Huh? Paul, please. Yes, by all means, Paul. We mustn't upset dear Amy. That will be enough, Uncle Edward. We must wait here quietly, Paul, until Mr. Shane has finished questioning us. Then perhaps he will be kind enough to dismiss us. Hey, look, I'm afraid I don't get any of this. I part. must apologize for my husband and my uncle, Mr. Shane, for their lack of cordiality. That's one way of putting it. You see, I've told them why you're here, and they're not in sympathy with the purpose of your visit. Oh? There are some things, Mr. Shane, which are better left untouched. Uncle Edward feels this comes under the heading of skeletons in the family closet. I see. But he'll do nothing to hinder your investigation, will you, Uncle Edward? Oh, of course not, dear niece Amy. Anything you say. Don't you find this a refreshing change, Mr. Shane? The uncle obeying the niece? Well, I hadn't really thought much about it. Amazing what a difference money makes, isn't it? Money? Edward. Yes. You see, my dear niece controls the purse strings for what is left of us Forsyths. Something like half a million, isn't it, Amy? Her thoughtful father arranged it that way. Edward! Amy has been kind enough to put me on an allowance. So you see, I must always yield to her wishes, unless I want the allowance cut off. I hardly think Mr. Shane is interested in our financial affairs. On the contrary, Amy, Mr. Shane has cause to be very interested. What do you mean? Why, uh, Amy may be kind enough to put you on an allowance, too. So I merely wanted to point out the danger of, uh, crossing her. Otherwise, she might... Well, uh, Paul, remember that time you decided to go on a spree in New Orleans? You were gone a week? Amy cut off your allowance for a month. Yes, I remember. Stop it! Shut up! Both of you. Mr. Shane, you will kindly ignore everything that's been said. Again, I apologize for my charming family. Uh, maybe we just better sort of start all over. Yes, as I say, Uncle Edward will not hinder your investigation. I'm sure Paul will not either. No, of course not. Although I do think it's a shame. What is? Spoiling a family legend like this. Paul is spending his abundant spare time these days writing a history of the Forsyth family, Mr. Shane. Quite a scholarly picture it is, too, is wading through the bales of family papers and records he's unearthed. Yes, he makes quite a figure of an author, doesn't he? See how he stands majestically by the fireplace, pipe in hand? That's his favorite pose nowadays. Thanks. Uh, have you come across any mention of this ghost in your research, Mr. Forsyth? The Bon Chance Werewolf? Oh, of course, Mr. Shane. According to the legend, he, or it, has made an appearance at least once each generation. It makes a fascinating story. That's why I'm sorry you're going to spoil it. You think there's nothing to it, huh? 
I think the people living in the bayou around here feel it their duty to keep the legend alive. So one of them faithfully reports seeing the werewolf every 15 years or so. Oh, uh-huh. your yeah, boatman Akil told me he thought he saw it years ago. Oh, of course. Akil has been with the family all his life. He feels it his duty to help keep the story going. If it's just a legend, Paul, perhaps with your brilliant mind you can explain the moaning we've been hearing lately. Moaning? Yes, Mr. Shane. An uncanny moan which seems to float through the house some nights. According to what everyone says, it's the werewolf moaning. Very simple, my dear. It could be that horrible animal of yours. You mean Dirk here? Is that what you think, Edward? It's entirely possible, Mr. Shane. Dreadful beast. Well, it's late, and I, for one, am going to bed. Good night, sweet relatives, and good night to you, Mr. Shane. Pleasant dreams. We all went to our respective rooms after that, and I turned in. I lay awake a few minutes thinking about what a charming little family I'd stumbled into. Amy, her husband, Paul, and her uncle, Edward. After a while, I guess I drifted off to sleep. Of course, I started dreaming. Of course, the dream was about the werewolf. I dreamt he was here in the room with me, and I could hear him moaning. Then he came at me. I woke up on the floor in a cold sweat. Then I started sweating harder because I could still hear that moan. I pounded downstairs. The moan was everywhere in the house. Amy came running downstairs right behind me. Then we heard it from outside, the dog. We both ran out and down the path. The breeze was still swirling the mist around. Then we stopped. There in the pale moonlight lay Amy's giant hound, Dirk. Dirk! Holy... Mr. Shane, look! Look at Dirk! Look! Yeah. His throat torn open as if by giant claws. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the Bayou Monster. It all started when Amy Forsyth hired me to come out to Bonchance, the ancestral mansion back in the bayous, and run down a supposed werewolf that had been haunting the place for a couple of hundred years. Of course, I was pretty unconvinced. Inspector Lefebvre's warning to stay away didn't register. But later that night, after I'd heard a very uncanny morning, and after Amy and I had discovered her dog with his throat ripped open as if by claws, I wasn't so sure. The next morning, I remembered the boatman Akil telling me about Mama Cecile, the old woman who lived in the bayou. So I went to see her. It was a little shack almost hidden by moss and vines, and as I came up to it, I saw someone slipping away into the undergrowth. Akil! Akil! You... you call Rachid? Yeah. What are you doing here? Me, I come to visit Mama Cecile. Why? Now, Why? To tell her about Loop Garou, werewolf. What about it? Kill dog last night. He moaned like thousand devils. He, I hear, I see dog dead. Me, I come to tell Mama Cecile. I tell her. Why'd you tell her? Mama Cecile, she always say, when werewolf around, come tell Mama Cecile. Okay, Akil, I'll talk to you later. I let go of him. He melted away into the bayou. I went over to the hut and knocked on the door. There was a grunt from inside, which I took for come in, so I pushed open the door. Inside, it was dark and smoky. But after my eyes got used to it, I could make out a woman sitting in front of a small fire. She could have been 60 or 90, with a withered face that still showed plenty of power. She had the longest fingernails I've ever seen. What do you want with Mama, says I want to talk to you about the werewolf. I know nothing about werewolves. Come on, a kid told me you always wanted to know when anyone had seen it. Why? It's avenging spirit of my family. What, the werewolf? Yes. Now look, Mama says. Yes. Many, many years ago, before my great, great grandpapa was born, this land here was ours. Our family. Huh? Old foresight man steal it from us. Avenging spirit of us is werewolf. He killed one foresight each generation. You don't expect me to... Last of foresight now leave it. Bon chance. 
One day land will be mine. My last of my people. For years I live here in Bayou. I wait. Land will be mine soon. I wait. <laughs> I somehow got the idea Mama Cecile meant exactly what she said. And the picture of that woman sitting in our hut just waiting for 50 years or so chilled me a little. I went back to Bonchance. Amy and her husband were in the library. She was squirming nervously in a chair, and he was in his favorite pose by the fireplace. And both of them looked slightly green around the gills. Mr. Shane, what do you propose to do about this horrible thing? Well, I'm not quite sure yet. But you've got to do something. We can't go on like this. Yeah, I know. Paul, you're sort of a family historian. There's an old woman back in the bayou named... Mama uh, Cecile. Yeah, yeah. She claims the first of the Forsyth sort of stole the land around here from her family. What? As a matter of fact, she's probably quite right. What, Paul? What yes, you... I found an entry in old Josiah Forsyth's journal something over a hundred years ago. He practically admits it. Well, nice to know your ancestors were thieves. My dear, couldn't you tell? This is no time for your feeble attempts at humor, Paul. Mr. Shane. Now, where's uh, Edward this morning? My dear uncle informed us the occurrence last night was more than his delicate nerves could stand. He said he was going to stay in New Orleans a couple of days. I see. Well, look, I'm going to wander around here a little today, just sort of looking around. I'll be back around sunset. Well, I should think so, Mr. Shane. Not one moment later. I wandered around the back country most of the afternoon. And then just about sundown, when I was walking through some pretty slushy ground on my way back to Bonchance, I spotted a rowboat a little way offshore among some trees. There was a guy sitting in that boat who looked awfully familiar. As soon as he saw me, he rode over to where I was standing. Hello, Shane. Well, well, Inspector Lefevre, what are you doing around here? Fishing. Yeah, sure. See? Just caught it. Some fish. Any smaller, you'd have to hold it with tweezers. The big ones haven't started biting yet. Look, Lefevre, if you had a whale in that boat, you couldn't convince me you came clear out here just to fish. Unless it was to fish for the bon chance werewolf. Still hunting ghosts, eh, Shane? It wasn't a ghost that tore that dog's throat open last night, or maybe you haven't heard about that. Yeah. Shane, like I told you before, you're monkeying with stuff that could backfire. A lot of things could happen to you in this bayou, all of them bad. Is this a word to the wise day for you, Inspector? You can call it that. Why don't you stick to something safe? Fishing, for instance. Like me. Sure, like you. Look, when you're fishing, if you hook one that's too big for you, you can always break your line and let him go. Meaning I might not be able to, huh? Meaning fishing's a nice, safe sport. I'll tell you what. I'll sleep on it, Lefevre. Yeah, well, you do that. Just one thing, though. What's that? Be sure you wake up. I left Lefevre baiting a hook and went back to Bonchance. Dinner that night was real jolly. Amy and Paul were about as cheerful as people in a dentist's waiting room. They spent most of the meal saying nasty things to each other and tossed in a few choice remarks about the absent Uncle Edward. We all turned in early, and I must have fallen asleep right away. But not for long. Suddenly, I was wide awake. Everything was very quiet, except for a faint noise downstairs. I slipped out of bed and reached for the light switch. No lights. I opened the door softly and eased into the hall. Amy's door was open, and even in the darkness, I could see her bed was unoccupied. Paul's door was open, too, and his bed was empty. I went downstairs as quietly as I could, and I heard that faint noise again, like somebody bumping into some furniture. It came from the library. I got to the door and stopped. I could see the dim outline of something coming toward me. I held my breath and waited. All right, just stay where you are. Relax, Shane, relax. Inspector Lefevre, I thought you were fishing. At this time of night? Don't be silly. Nobody home, huh? I don't know. The room's got empty all of a sudden. What's the matter with the lights? You got any other questions I can't answer? Uh, look, there, there should be some candles over on this table near the fireplace. Yeah, here's one. You got a match? Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Hey, hey, listen. What's that? A fever, that's the moan they say the werewolf makes. What? It sounds way too close for comfort. Hey, what's the big idea of blowing out the candle, a fever? I didn't blow it out. Well, something did you? Feel a draft or something? Well, a breeze was starting to blow up when I got here. Maybe the walls leak. Funny, man. Oh, there's a damper on the fireplace somewhere. Like, just, oh, here it is. What happened to the moan? Well, what do you know? 
Here, light, light the candle again. Keep it away from the fireplace. Now look. This damper on the side of the fireplace, I'll turn it like it was before. Yeah. When the damper's in that position and the breeze is blowing from a certain direction, the air passing through the narrow part of the chimney makes that whirling sound. That's your werewolf's moan. It's not my werewolf, Shane. So what does all this prove? A couple of things. Right now, we better find Amy and Paul in a hurry. All right. You take one direction from the house, I'll take the other. Okay. And if you find anything, yell. I will, Lefebvre. Believe me. I started out. In a couple of minutes, I was out of sight of the house. It was pretty sloshy going along here, and I had to take it slow. Every now and then, a damp hanging vine would slap me across the face. A couple of times, I slipped and went down. And then up ahead of me, I heard it. It was Amy. She was in a bad way. I tried to run. Finally, I managed to get under drier ground. There was a faint trail in front of me, and I pounded along it. I rounded a bend, hurdled a fallen tree, and then I stopped. It wasn't a pretty sight. Amy was lying on the ground in front of me. And her throat looked like her dog's throat had looked. But Amy couldn't feel it anymore. She was dead. In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, there I stood, looking down at Amy lying there dead, hoping I'd never see a sight like that again. Then I heard a noise. I turned around. There, standing behind me, was a... a thing... About my height, with a face that was almost human, but was covered with hair. And there were two giant claws, and there was blood on them. I started backing away, but my foot caught in the vine, and I went down. The thing came at me, and I thought, Shane, you should have started believing in ghosts before it was too late. Then the thing dove at me, and one of those claws came whistling through the air at my throat. I got my arm up just in time, and the claw bit into my shoulder. Then I realized it was an iron claw. I got one fist loose and pumped it into the thing's face a couple of times. Then I got both hands around his throat and squeezed. The other claw was coming down at me closer and closer. I, I squeezed harder, and then suddenly, suddenly the monster went limp. I, I pushed him off me. He was just getting slowly to my feet when the fever pounded up. You all right, Shane? Yeah. I guess so. Can't say as much for my friend here. He a big enough fish for you? Yeah. I used to dream about things that looked like that when I was a kid. I never thought I'd see one. Yeah, well, this one's human. That's a mask, and those are iron claws. Yeah. Pull the mask off him. Yeah. Well, you know him? Yeah. Yeah, I know him. It's Amy's husband, Paul Forsythe. Yeah, Paul Forsythe. This generation's edition of the Bon Chance Werewolf. An edition that Inspector Lefebvre promptly put out of circulation. I was happy to let him take over. Then later, Lefebvre and I left Bonchance and started for home in his rowboat. And I, having lost the toss, was rowing. Some boy, Paul Forsythe, huh? Yeah. He told me he kept those props of his, the mask and the claws, hidden out in the bayou. wonder how I got a hold of him in the first place. I think I know the answer to that. Paul spent a lot of time digging through old family papers. He was going to write a history of the family. Probably came across the secret there, where the mask and claws were hidden, how to work the damper on the chimney. Uh, that's probably it. I guess one member of each generation knew about the mask and claws. Probably used to put them on now and then to scare all the bio people. You know, Shane, the foresight certainly must have been a pleasant lot. Yeah. That'd be their idea of a joke, I guess. Only Paul decided to revive the legend for more practical purposes. They fill you in on the motive? Yeah. Money? Mostly. He would have gotten control of the half million Amy had. Add to that, he had a girl in New Orleans. Add to that, he hated Amy. That's funny. What's that? Oh, just that the legend of the Bonchance werewolf's been going on for over a hundred years. All there really was behind the legend was a mask, a pair of iron claws, and a howling chimney. And the fact that most of the people around here believed in it. Don't forget that. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, I can see how you can get believing almost anything out in this bayou. 
Look, I'll be glad to see the last of him. It gives me the creeps. Shh. What? Stop blowing. What's the matter? Shh. Hey, what are you reaching for, you gun? Now, now, look at the big one. Big what? Fish. I'm going to hook him. All the fever. Quiet, Shane. I told you I came out here to fish, didn't I? <laughs> This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday and is written by Bob Rice. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy. And Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. into the alley and waited. Pretty soon, a side door opened and out came Helen. Just as I got to her, I heard a noise behind me. I started to turn around, but too late. A king-sized comet exploded over my right ear and the ground came up and hit me in the face. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Gray-Eyed Blonde. Be Trinidad. Yep. And then, now, yeah, where's that folder on the Virgin Islands? Uh, yeah. Here. Yep. Uh, come in. And then maybe Havana on the way back. Sloppy Joes. Girls. You know. Well. Hello. Michael Shane? Mm hmm. Hello, Mike. Oh. Helen. Helen. Uh, sit down. Thanks. From the looks of all those travel folders on your desk, I'd say you were planning a trip. No, I was just taking a poor man's vacation. Reading travel folders? Well, probably almost as much fun as actually taking the trips. I doubt it. Is uh, something the matter? Matter? You've been looking at me sort of... Uh, I've never seen gray eyes like that before. Oh. Make quite a dent. Gray eyes, red lips. You uh, come to talk about trips? In a way, short ones. Oh, cigarette? Thanks. Well, I have a match. Thanks. Uh, trips? Yeah. You on errands, Mike? Errands? It depends what kind. Well, I made a mistake quite a while ago, Mike. Big mistake. I've been paying for it ever since. Regularly. Blackmail. Mm-hmm. One more payment, the account's closed for good. So? So, I want you to make that last payment for me. Tonight. Uh, just for my own information, Helen, you're not by any chance asking me I'm to... not asking you to kill anyone, Mike. That's good to know. No, this is all on the up and up. Here are two envelopes. The instructions are in this one. Instructions? Yeah, where and how you're to meet the uh, man you're to meet. Uh-huh. When you do meet him, you hand him this other envelope. In return, he'll give you a small package. You bring that back to your office, I pick it up here. Uh, how would I go about getting in touch with you if anything went wrong? Well, I don't expect anything will, but in case of emergency, try my hotel. The Donna. Uh, you know, I just remembered a charge I might have to make in this particular case. Oh, what is it? It might be for you to have dinner with me or something. Dinner or something might be arranged, Mike. You'll take the job? Sure, why not? I'll pay you $100. I'm sure you'll earn every penny of it. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the gray-eyed blonde. <laughs> Well, maybe it 
was those gray eyes of Helen's, I don't know. At the time, there was something awfully compelling about them. Plus everything else about her, from a honey-colored hair to her alligator sling pumps. Plus, of course, the fact that I'd just gotten my license reinstated a couple of weeks before, and that hundred she was offering looked like a lot of good living for a change. So when she asked me to take the job of making a blackmail payment for her, I said yes. After she left, I opened the instruction envelope and read them over carefully. They were so thorough, I knew whoever this guy was, he wanted to be awfully sure he had the right party. I arrived at the indicated corner of Barrack Street ten minutes before midnight. Ten minutes early. The street was deserted except for a little red and white peanut wagon that a small olive-skinned gent was pushing down the street toward me. When he got to me, he stopped. A peanut, senor? Uh, no, thanks. They are fresh, senor. You're working kind of late, aren't you? Si, senor. These peanuts, senor, they are the best. Uh, tell me, you uh, seen anyone around here in the last ten minutes? A man? Oh, you are looking for someone? Yeah, in a way. Then perhaps while you wait, senor, some peanuts. Uh, no, no, not now. Thanks. He gave me a very unhappy stare and then shrugged his shoulders and pushed his cart around the corner and out of sight. I started walking down the deserted street. My footsteps echoed on the pavement. It was darker than I thought it would be. No streetlights in this section. I kept trying to look over my shoulder, but I couldn't see anything. I knew that somewhere in that block, somebody was supposed to tap me on the shoulder, and I was wishing he'd hurry up and get it over. I was almost at the end of the block now. Still, nothing had happened. The building ahead of me on the corner was getting some work done on it. They had the front boarded up and had a boardwalk in place of the sidewalk. The street side of the boardwalk was boarded up, too. It was like a tunnel. I took a few steps into the pitch black tunnel and stopped. Something started bothering me. For a moment, I couldn't figure out what it was, but then I got it. Somebody was in that boarded tunnel with me. Before I could do or say anything, a hand stood across my mouth and I could feel the muzzle of an automatic against the side of my neck. Brilliant boy that I am, I got the idea that mum was a word. Then the hand left my mouth and slid down and started going through my pockets. Pretty soon it came to the envelope I was supposed to deliver. Patted the envelope and slipped it back into my pocket. Well, that I didn't get at all. Then the gun pressed a little harder out of my neck. I suddenly knew that his finger was tightening on the trigger. I dove for the ground, the gun went off. Red hot poker seared the top of my head and then blackness. After what seemed like about a month, blackness started to fade. It faded still more, started turning to white. I knew I was in a hospital. Then I spotted some bars across the windows, and I got a strong hunch it was the receiving ward of the prison hospital. I tried to open my eyes more, which was pretty hard to do, because my head at this point felt like two little men were playing ping pong with a hunk of hot lead. But I did manage to see someone bending over me. It was Police Inspector Lefebvre. Not going to die after all, hmm? <sighs> what odds could I get? You were lucky. This got creased. That's lucky. Looks like you had a little argument with your sidekick. Pretty one-sided argument. Look, Inspector, maybe you wouldn't mind telling me what this is all about, huh? That's funny, Shane. I was just going to ask you that. Huh? Mr. Graber, will you step in here now, please? Yes, Inspector? Mr. Graber, I want you to take a good look at this man. He the one? I can't be sure. He might be. It might be what? Look, I'm the one that got shot in the head, if that's... Just a minute, Shane. I'm going to tell you something you might possibly already know. At this point, what I know is just a drop in the bucket of what I don't know. Mr. Frank Graber here is a vice president of a South Atlantic exporting syndicate. Ever hear of him? Yeah, yeah, they shipped to Cuba, South America, lots of places. I did some work for him last year. Yeah, I know. Well, what's that got to do with... Coming to that. Day before yesterday, there was an unusually large deposit to be made. So large that Mr. Graber here himself started out with it. Something like uh, 60000 wasn't it, Mr. Graber? 62 In $1,000 bills. Yeah. Well, Mr. Graber never... Suppose you tell him what happened, Graber. Well, I went out the back door of the office building, and it wasn't until I opened my car door that I saw the man sitting inside. Had his hand up to the side of his face so that I couldn't get a clear look at it. But in the other hand was a gun. 
He forced me to drive down near the river, made me get out of the car and go into an abandoned warehouse. There he hit me over the head with his gun and took the money. That's too bad. But outside of welcoming you to the battered heads club, I still don't see that what... That guy could have been you, Shane. What do you mean? We found one of those thousand dollar bills in an envelope. In your pocket. <laughs> About then, a lot of things started making sense. Why that guy in the dark wanted to be sure the envelope was in my pocket before he tried to kill me. Yeah, it looked like somebody was very interested in having me found dead with some of that robbery dough on me. Thus getting me elected as chief suspect. But I knew it was going to be a tough story to sell the inspector. He ushered Graber out of the room and then came back and stood beside the bed, slowly shaking his head. No, I don't get it, Shane. Not three weeks ago, you were telling everybody what a good boy you were going to be if you could just get your license back. So they give you your license back, so here you are, right in the middle of something that smells to high heaven. Look, Inspector, I'm going to give it to you straight. It was a frame. No sale, Shane. Believe me, it's the truth. A girl named Helen... Yeah. Oh, I know it sounds phony, but it happened. She gave me a song and dance about hiring me to make a blackmail payment for her. But what she really wanted, she and her boyfriend, I guess, was to have me found dead with some of this dough on me, thereby taking the heat off. Oh, I suppose you can back up your story by producing this girl. I can try. Still not buying. Look, Inspector, I've always cooperated with you. Yeah, well, that's the only reason I'm even listening to you. So now I need a break, a big one. You can give it to me. The only thing I can give you is time. Not much of that. How much? Well, my next way out. I know that. You're not exactly alone, though. Well, it's 7 a.m. I'll give you until 10 o'clock tonight. Huh? Tonight? Have a heart. That doesn't give me... I said 10 o'clock tonight. Make it midnight, then. 10. Okay, 10 o'clock tonight. And Shane. Yeah? That's it. One way or another. Funny thing about the inspector... He always meant just exactly what he said. So I had something like 15 hours to find one woman in a city as big as New Orleans. A beautiful woman with gray eyes who had almost done a very neat job of fitting me for a coffin. I lost two of those 15 hours getting part of my strength back and talking the doctor into giving me my pants. The only thing I had to go on was what Helen had told me about reaching her at the Hotel Donna. The desk clerk there remembered her just as soon as I mentioned the gray eyes. Oh, yes, sure. Let's see. Helen Collier she was registered under. Not bad. No, not bad at all. Uh, was registered? Yes, checked out first thing this morning. About six, I guess it was. No forwarding address, huh? No, asked her, but she said none. Well, thanks anyway. Might ask one of the cab drivers out front. Yeah, I'm going to. Thanks. It didn't take me long to find out that none of the three cab drivers in front of the Hotel Donna could have taken Helen, because none of them came on until seven. But I did get the address of the driver who worked nights there, and ten minutes later, I was pounding on his door. What do you want? Are you Joe, the cab driver? Yeah, why? You have a fare this morning about six? You woke me up to ask me that? Beat it. Hey, hey. Come on, Joe. Open up. Look at friend. I don't know who you are, and it's just the way I want to keep it. Now, suppose I'm you... I'm not just... leaving until I get an answer from you. A girl about 5'4", gray eyes at the Hotel Donna. Where'd you take her? I don't know what you're talking about now. Beat it. Get your foot out of the door. Okay, we'll go inside. Hey, hey, hey. What's the... Now, look. The more you talk, the more I'm convinced you did take her somewhere. Now, open up. I've been through too much on account of that Look, trade. I, I... I don't know what you're talking about. If you're trying to cover for her, you're making an awful big mistake, Joe. A mistake that could put you behind bars. Uh... She paid you to keep your mouth shut, huh? Okay, here's ten to open it. Look, from a friend. Be smart. Keep out of this deal. It's too late, Joe. Here's the ten. Open up. I got more than that for promise. Look, I... I haven't got all day, and ten's all you get. Maybe that's too much. Maybe I could beat the answer out of you and save myself a tense point. Uh, now, which is it going to be? Okay, okay. All right, now, you picked her up at the Hotel Donna at 6 this morning. Yeah. Where'd you take her? From a friend. Let me give you a tip. Don't hold your breath till you see her again. What do you mean? Where I took her was the airport. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane, 
and the case of the gray-eyed blonde. It all started when a gray-eyed blonde named Helen hired me to make a blackmail payment for her. Only I found out too late it was a frame. I got shot in the head and woke up and found myself accused of a $62,000 robbery and was given just 15 hours by police inspector Lefebvre to find Helen and clear myself. So far, all I'd found was she'd left the Hotel Donna at 6 that morning to go to the airport. Well, I was out there now talking to all the ticket clerks. Finally, I found one who remembered her. Oh, yes, uh, surely. Uh, those eyes of hers would be hard to forget. Well, which plane did she leave on, do you remember? Let's see, I... Uh, New York? No, that wasn't it. Uh, come on, come on, try to remember. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I, I remember now. Don't tell me it's that plane that's taking off out there. No, she didn't leave at all. What? No, I bought a ticket to Havana. Midnight plane. Tonight. <laughs> Well, at least I knew she was still in New Orleans. Of course, finding would be something else again. And then I got an idea, a long shot maybe. But right now, the welcome mat was out for anything would pass for a starting point. I went back to the Hotel Donna and over to the desk clerk. Yes? You uh, remember me? I was in here a couple of hours ago asking about that girl with... With the gray eyes, yes. You uh, really got it bad for her, hmm? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but she hasn't come back, and I told you she didn't leave a forwarding address. I know. Look, uh, her room, has it been straightened up yet? Well, probably not. Cleaning girl's a little slow. We're thinking of letting her go at the well, end. How about letting me in the room for a look around? Oh, now, wait a minute. Well, why not? You've got it bad for the girl, and that's tough, but we can't have you traipsing through that room looking for her forwarding address. It's, uh, <clears throat> against the policy. Whose? Mine. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll make a deal. Deal? Yeah. Now here's a five. Let's just say I'm engaging the room for a couple of hours as is. Oh, well, now, why didn't you say so in the first place? Here, I'll get the key. My only chance was that Helen wouldn't feel any reason to cover her tracks too carefully, since according to her plan, I was to have been long dead by now. I practically tore the room apart. Nothing. Then I thought of the wastebasket. There were two things in it, a piece of Kleenex with the imprint of a mouth and lipstick, and a torn half of a paper match folder. There was some printing on it. All I could make out were the first two letters, R.A., and below was the word cocktails. The name of a bar. And possibly, just possibly, a hangout of Helen's where she might be passing time and keeping undercover until that midnight plane to Havana. Oh, but which bar was it? How many of them started with R.A.? My guess was quite a few. But it didn't matter how many. I had to try all of them. I went back to my office. That was a mistake. I dropped into my chair and propped my feet up on the desk. That was a big mistake. I figured I'd just rest a few minutes before I started out. That was a bigger mistake. I closed my eyes. That was my biggest mistake. When I opened my eyes again, I thought something had gone wrong with them. Everything was dark. And then I looked at my watch and almost went right up through the ceiling. Ten minutes to seven. I'd slept all afternoon. I had three hours left. I started out. The nearest bar on my list was a place with a quaint name of Rat Race. When I got there, things were already in high gear. I went in and then I knew how the place got its name. The music was tailgating loud. And it all came from five guys in the corner. A few couples were dancing, I guess you'd call it, on the floor about three sizes larger than a phone book. And the bartender sat at the end of the bar near the musicians reading a paper. I had a tough time making myself heard. Well, it be, Mac. Uh, you happen to know a girl What's named... that? I say to you... Uh, Can't hear you. A girl named Helen. Gray eyes, five feet forty. You know her? Oh, yeah. Lots of girls around. I don't know. I don't think so. I suppose you've been asking too much to hit the jackpot on the first nickel. Well, uh, talk louder, will you? Oh, skip it. I shredded my way through the dancers in the smoke and went out. One down, eight to go. I checked the rat race off my list, went to a place called Rady's in a pretty seamy neighborhood. It was a lot darker than the rat race here and a lot quieter. Hospitable, too. I'd hardly gotten inside before a furnace-eyed brunette sidled up. Hello. Hello. Hey, you. Looking for someone? Yeah, yeah. Here I am. Uh, no, no. The girl I'm looking for is named Helen. Gray eyes. Oh, no, 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 Helen. What's wrong with my eyes? They're brown. They're nice. Yeah, so I see. Would you like to dance? Have a drink? Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, anyway. 
So I crossed off radies and kept going. And I kept drawing blanks. Rays, ravaccinis, radio room. And it got to be after nine, and I could practically feel the inspector's official and heavy hand on my shoulder. My head was throbbing again, and I was getting weaker by the minute. So I guess I was none too steady as I walked down the street. And then as I passed a little red and white peanut wagon parked at the curb, an olive-skinned little gent darted out in front of me. Hey, senor. Uh, oh, you again. Senor, is something wrong? You... Uh, no, no, I'm just tired. Uh, here, senor, have some of my nice peanuts. Nice fresh peanuts. No, thanks. Now, you kind of get around town, don't you? See, si, but, senor, they're the most delicious peanuts. They will help I you. don't want any peanuts, now. But I tell you, senor, they're fine peanuts. They're best peanuts this side of Havana, senor. Can't you understand it? What about Havana? Senor, what have I done? What have I said to a friend? Please don't let me go. What'd you say about Havana? Nothing, senor, nothing, nothing. It's just a place where I was born, senor. Havana, my home, that is all, senor. You know Please. anything about that midnight plane to Havana tonight? No, senor, I swear it. I know nothing about the midnight plane to Havana, except I would like to be on it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I let go of him and he dotted around to the other side of his wagon. I staggered on down the street. I still wasn't sure whether he'd been trying to tell me something or not. I didn't have time to figure it out. I had to keep going. Then I went to Raymond's, the next place on the list. It was a small place, no music. Only a couple of people at the bar, and the bartender was watching me very carefully. Hello. What can I do for you? You uh, happen to know a girl named Helen? Gray eyes? No. Uh uh-uh. I see. Uh, you you happen to have a light on you? Light? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I walked back to the door and went out. I was trying hard not to tremble. Because the trail had gotten hot, very hot. That bartender had been just a little too quick to say he didn't know Helen. If I needed any more proof, he'd given it to me. The matchbook he'd used to give me a light was the same kind as a fragment I was carrying in my pocket. Yeah, I knew I'd finally found the place. I went around the corner, eased into the alley, and waited. Pretty soon, a side door opened, and out came Helen. Hey! Hey, wait a minute! Well, hello, Mike. You really shouldn't have, you know. Found you? Mm Mm-hmm. Better look behind you. Oh, no. That's too old a gag to... In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Yes, the business of one thing canceling out another is true. That hit on the head sort of blotted out the throbbing of the wound. When I came to and found myself lying on the floor in a little room, my head was a lot better than I'd figured. Numb, I guess. I could hear voices. Oh, Two of them. Stupid things to do. I told you. And to suddenly they began little. registering. I couldn't help it, Helen. I had to oh. see you. Well, it's a good thing I did, too. Shane was almost ready to grab you when I hit him just now. Oh, you're falling away. Why didn't you finish the job last night when you had him on the board? I wall? tried oh, wait to. Oh, he's coming to. Yeah. Yeah, I've come to. So, the trustworthy vice president, Mr. Frank Graber, is the big boy of the deal. Now, you shut up, Shane. I might get an argument as to who the brains really was, Mike, but it doesn't matter now. Pretty neat. Graber walks off with the money and tells the police a fairy tale about being robbed. Then the two of you nominate me for the fall guy. Graber's supposed to kill me, so I'll be found with some of the dough and therefore become the chief suspect. Only Graber misses. Figured it all out, didn't you, Mike? Well, Frank, I guess there's only one thing to do. Yes. And I knew what that one thing was. I knew I had to think fast and act fast to prevent that one thing from happening. If I could just divert their attention from me long enough for a dive at the window or door... And then I thought of something. Something that might possibly take their minds off me for just a second. Come on, Frank, get it over with. I, uh, I suppose you've told Graber about that plane ticket, Helen. What? Uh, to Havana on the midnight plane. What ticket? Why, he doesn't know what he's saying, No, no, Frank. no, wait. What ticket? Don't you see, he's just trying to upset you. You bought a you. ticket on the midnight plane to Havana. Frank, I you think... You were going to run out on me. Oh, don't be You were going to take all that money and run out on That's me. That's not true. I told you I wasn't. I guess I knew all along, Helen. If only I just wouldn't face it. But I guess I knew all along. What are you talking about? I knew. 
All the time you were telling me you loved me. What? Oh, we'd wait until the heat was off, and then I'd retire on account of ill health, and no, we'd take the money and go to South America and have a wonderful time. Frank, All the time you were telling me those things, I, I knew you didn't mean them. I knew it. I wanted to believe it. I wanted you're to. you're all wrong. You kept I, I working on me. You finally got me to do this thing. Because you were like a disease. Well, you were in my blood. Uh, now you were going to run out on me. But I won't let you. No, Frank, that's not true. It's too bad. No... You won't get to use that ticket. Helen, my darling. Frank? Suddenly there was a gun in his hand. It was pointed at Helen, and I could see she didn't believe it, but I did. I dove at him, and just as I hit him, the gun went... Helen slowly sagged to the floor. I got hold of his wrist, but I was off balance, and he was bringing the gun slowly around toward me, and, and then just as it got to me, I twisted as hard as I could, and we both went down, and the gun went off again. <laughs> then the gun... Dropped out of his hand. He just sort of crumpled over and lay still. And I stared hard at the widening red stain on his coat. Right over his heart. Well, I got a call through to the inspector right away, and he sort of took over from there. And that was just about that. With all the loose ends tied up one way or another. Oh, yeah, except one, that plane ticket to Havana, the one Helen had bought. Nobody seemed to know quite what to do with it, because she'd bought it with her own money instead of the robbery dog. Of course, I had an idea what to do with it, but, well, I gave it up after a while. I, I guess the little peanut vendor needed it more than I did. Of course, I didn't just give it to him. It was strictly a business deal. Yeah, I traded him the ticket for his peanut wagon. So now, if the detective business ever gets too tough, well, I've always got a sideline. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure from the mysterious and colorful New Orleans. <laughs> Before I knew it, my back was against the wall. Jeremiah kept coming slowly. I was watching his hands, and that was my big mistake. Because all of a sudden, he pivoted and swung his peg leg at me. It caught me in the stomach. Down I went. I got to my knees. This time, the peg leg crashed into my jaw. Once. Twice. Three times. The third time was a charm. I went out. <laughs> The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Jeff Trent. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of Polani's Tears. <laughs> Same old stuff. Never anything new in the papers anymore. Oh, well, it's time for dinner anyway. Hey, Mikey! Mikey! Oh, Benny! What's the big idea? Trying to break my office door down? Mikey, you gotta help me. Huh? Yeah, I'm, I'm in trouble. Oh, so you're in trouble, Benny. That's news? Oh, you don't get it, Mikey. This is big trouble. I tell you, you gotta help me. There'll be something in it for you, too. Oh, no, not that again. Huh? Now, look, Benny, you've been a waterfront drifter for longer than I can remember. But, Mikey... So half the time, you're getting yourself into space by picking the wrong pocket or listening to the wrong conversation, then you yell for help. No, 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 this is nothing like that, honestly. The other half of the time, you spend making phony pitches to people, namely me. I tell you, this is on the level, Mikey. Now, go on. Will you beat it? Mikey, Mikey, listen to me. The tiger shark's after me. If you don't help the me, tiger I... tiger can... shark? Benny, you better lay off that kind of stuff. Okay. I'll spill it to you, Mikey. It's Talani's Tears. That's what it is. Talani's Tears? 
Lenny, you take a lot of convincing, but I'll try once more. One, I don't care who your girlfriend is or why she's crying. Two... No, no, Talani's not my girlfriend. Two, if you don't get out, I'll throw you out. I tell you, you gotta help me, Mikey. It's all I did try to con you once or twice, but I'm leveling now, honestly. Get your hands off of me. Come on, get them off. Okay. Okay, Mike. Now go on, get out. But Mike... Get out! Okay. Anyway, just coming to see you here has helped me. Huh? Yeah, maybe maybe the tiger shark will lay off for a little while. Now. Well, don't start that again. I'll come back when the heat's off, Mike. Maybe in an hour or two, then we can do business. Benny, I'm through talking. I'm going to come around this desk and... Okay, Mike. Okay. But you'll see, Mike. Be careful what you throw away, huh? What? So long, Mikey. Be careful what I throw away. Lonnie's tears, tiger shot. <laughs> the boy better get himself on the wagon and stay there. My friends! Benny! Benny, what? Benny! Mikey. Mikey, the tiger shark. Tiger shark, I. Hey, Benny. Benny! In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of Talani's Tears. Well, it isn't every evening that a seamy waterfront character comes to my office with a wild story about Talani's Tears and Tiger Sharks and then leaves and promptly gets shot. When I sent for the police and told them Benny's story, they couldn't make any more sense out of it than I did. After they left, I sat in my office, fishing the last cigarette out of the pack on my desk while I tried to fit the whole thing together. But none of the pieces were the right shape, so I gave up, started out to get some more cigarettes. Then half a block down the street, a little gent with a face like a chipmunk fell into step. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Sheen. Who are you? <laughs> it's a dark night, Mr. Sheen. I'm afraid of the dark, so I thought I'd walk with you a little. You mind? Yeah, look, Chuckles. <laughs> Not Chuckles, Mr. Shane. Alex. My name is Alex. Okay, Chuckles. Now beat it. And Mr. Shane, you have something which I wish. Please give it to me. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, you know what I'm talking about, Mr. Shane. Oh, yes, indeed. Look, I'm in no mood for rhythm. Shove off. Mr. Shane, I do not think you like me, Mr. Shane. Nobody likes me, I guess. I can understand that without much trouble. <laughs> But I do have one friend, Mr. Shane. Congratulations. Yeah. He is right here with me. My knife. And all of a sudden, the knife was headed for my ribs. I brought my elbow down hard and it hit his wrist just in time. The knife cut through my coat and the flat blade slid across my back. It was cold. Alex jerked his hand back for another try, but he never made it because right then my fist landed between those chipmunk cheeks. His knife flew into the street and Alex bounced off the wall behind him. He shivered a little and started to sag, but as I started toward him, he suddenly darted into an alley and disappeared. So I headed back for my office. I was one bewildered guy. All of a sudden, life was full of surprises. Like the one that was waiting for me in my office. Surprise had black hair, green eyes, and a very red mouth. Hello, Michael. Oh. Hello, who are you? Margot. Yeah. You know, you're the best news I've had all evening. Thanks. I hope you'll turn out to be good news for me, Michael. Look, uh, would you mind telling me why I'm so popular all of a sudden? You're very good looking. Thanks. But I'm pretty sure my manly beauty isn't what brought you around. Michael, did a man named Benny come to see you? Yeah, why? What did he want? What did he say to you? Well, he... Wait a minute. How come you're so interested in Benny, Margot? Where do you fit into this deal? Benny stole something that belonged to me, Michael. Well, what was it? I don't know. Huh? But I think you have it now. I have it. Oh, now, look, I've had nothing but double talk thrown at me all evening, and I'm sick of it. But really, I don't know what it was this man Benny stole from me, Michael. It was a small package, I think. You think? Yes. Michael, do you have any idea at all where Benny went after he left here? Yeah, I got a very good idea. He went to the morgue. But you mean he's dead? Very. But how? Murdered. I don't know who killed him, and I don't know why. 
Oh, maybe I'll never know what it was he stole from me. Now, wait a minute. I still don't get what you mean by that. I'll tell you all I know, Michael. It isn't much. Okay. Hey, look, you get a cigarette? Uh-huh. Yeah. Thanks. Started out to get some a while ago, but I never quite made it. Here's a light. Thanks. Mmm. Oh, what? Never seen eyes quite that green in all that. You're an authority on the subject, Michael. Well, at times, namely now, I'd like to be. Oh? The, uh, the story you were going to tell me. Oh. Oh, yes. Well, my father spent his last few years traveling, Michael. Right up until he passed away last month in India. Oh? Uh-huh. Just before he died, he wrote and told me he was sending something very valuable to me. A man was coming from India with it. You mean somebody came all the way from India to bring it to you? Yes, but I was late meeting the boat, and when I reached this messenger, he told me he'd been attacked and robbed. Well, didn't he tell you what was in the package? Well, he didn't know the package had been sealed. But some men at the waterfront told me the man who attacked the messenger was this man, Benny. One of them said Benny was coming to your office, so I kept up your address. Here I am. Mm. Michael. Yeah? He said Benny didn't give you anything. You weren't lying to me, were you? No, I wasn't lying, Margot. Look, in the morning, I'll nose around a little down at the waterfront. I can't guarantee anything, but maybe I'll find some crony of Benny's who can throw a little light on the subject. I hope so. And there's any, Michael? Yeah. I'm sort of glad I met you, even if it was this way. You know something, Margot? I'm sort of glad, too. Uh, maybe, uh... Maybe, Michael. We'll see. I sat at my desk for maybe five minutes after Margot left Trying again to remember if Benny had said anything that might make sense All I could come up with was Talani's tears and tiger shock Neither of which did So I gave up for the night and walked out of my office Just as I closed the door behind me, I stopped Coming slowly down the hall toward me was one of the biggest guys I'd ever seen on his head was a wool stocking cap. He had a peg leg, and his voice was like an overworked foghorn. Well, uh, good evening, Mr. Shea. Good evening. My name is Jeremiah. Oh, no, not again. What's that, Mr. Shane? Look, don't tell me I've got something you want. I don't know about that, Mr. Shane. Come along, let's get underway. Huh? The skipper wants to have a little chat with you. Oh? Uh-huh. Just who is the skipper? Mr. Sick is his name. Mr. Sick? That's right, Mr. Shane. Oh, he's not really a skipper. That's just a nautical figure of speech. Yeah, I know. I was once a sea scout. Now, just what does this guy Sick have on his mind? Mr. Shane, all I'm to do is navigate you to Mr. Sick. It's up to him to tell you what he has on his mind. Oh? Well, look, Jeremiah, supposing I decide I don't want to have a chat with Mr. Sick. What then? Well, Mr. Shane... With this belay and pin I've got in my hand, I think I could stove in your skull like an eggshell. Then I could trice you up like a furled mainsail and lug you there under my arm. Yeah. Yeah, you probably could and would. Okay, Moby Dick. Let's go. <laughs> King-size escort and I went down to the waterfront and out on one of the piers to a sleek-looking 60-foot cruiser tied up there. We went aboard and down the ladder to a very luxurious cabin. And there was Mr. Sick, who was without a doubt the flabbiest-looking gent I'd seen in a long time. Good work, Jeremiah. Good work. Good evening, Mr. Shane. Hello, Mr. Sick. Would anybody mind telling me what this is all about? Not at all, sir. Not at all. It's very simple. You have something which I desire. You know something? This is only the third time tonight I've heard that little refrain. It's getting sort of monotonous. The difference is, Mr. Shane, that I intend to be much more persuasive than anyone else. Oh, now, look, before you toss any polite threats this way, maybe you better tell me just what it is I've got that you want. Obviously, the tears of Trelawney. The what? Mr. Shane, I seldom repeat myself. I will make an exception in your case. It is the tears of Trelawney which I desire and will have. Hmm. Maybe Benny was making more sense than I thought. Sir? Ah, skip it. Well, just what are the tears of Talani? <laughs> Your uh, pretended ignorance amuses me, Mr. Shane. So I'll indulge it. Tears of Talani, as you know, are six matched and priceless rubies. Huh? Talani was an ancient Indian goddess. The rubies were kept in a shrine and guarded by a native priest. That is, until they were stolen. I see. 
And just where do you come in, Mr. Sick? Let us simply say that I'm a collector, my dear sir. Uh-huh. A determined collector. When there is the air of forbidden fruit involved, my determination knows no bounds. What do you mean, forbidden fruit? Well, legend has it there is a curse on the rubies. The priest who was killed while guarding them told his attackers they would not profit by their sacrilegious theft. It is told he even smiled as he was being killed. Sounds like a pleasant pastime, robbing shrines. The initial theft of Talani's tears does not interest me, Mr. Shaden. What does interest me is that I have good cause to believe you now have them. Uh, you're just bubbling over with answers, Mr. Sick. Maybe you can give me one about a tiger shark. <laughs> An erroneous legend, my dear fellow. Tiger shark is supposed to be a mysterious killer and jewel thief from the Middle East. No truth to the story. Oh? Enough of this question and answer game. Rubies, please. Well, look, this may come as a shock, but I don't have them. Mr. Shane, to refer to my previous dissertation on the art of persuasion... I still don't have them, Mr. Sick. Do not intend to waste time, sir. The rubies at once. Look, I can't give them to you if I don't have them. Must I ask my friend Jeremiah here... For the last time, I tell you I don't. Very well. Jeremiah, you may proceed at will. The big guy started for me, and I edged away. I was trying to locate the door out of the corner of my eye. But before I knew it, my back was against the wall. Jeremiah kept coming slowly. I was watching his hands, and that was my big mistake. Because all of a sudden, he pivoted and swung his peg leg at me. It caught me in the stomach, and I went down. I got to my knees, but this time, the peg leg crashed into my jaw. Once, twice, three times. The third time was the charm. I went out. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of Talani's Tears. It all started when a waterfront drifter named Benny charged into my office, mumbled something about Talani's Tears and the tiger shark, charged out and promptly got himself killed. Well, shortly afterward, a number of people started telling me I had something they wanted. The last of these characters was a Mr. Sick who told me I had the tears of Talani, which were six rubies, and that he wanted them. When I told him I didn't have them, he sent his boy Jeremiah after me. Jeremiah's peg leg was harder than my jaw, and I went out. And then after a while, I could hear water lapping against the pier. And there I was, lying on hard planks, all except my head, which was held by two soft, cool hands. Mm. Poor Michael. Mm. What? Margot. Uh-huh. Well, what, what are you doing here? I'm afraid I wasn't sure you were telling me the truth earlier, Michael. So when you left your office with a big sailor and came down here, I, I followed you. Oh. You want to get up? No, I don't ever want to get up. I just want to lie here. Yes, sweet. Mm, you know, that makes my head feel a lot better. <laughs> Mm, you're the best doctor I've ever had. You, uh, you got a cigarette? Ah, uh, still out of them. Still out of them. Michael. Hmm? Get out of it. I don't want you to get hurt anymore. You don't believe me. It's mutual, Margot. How can I get out of something I've never been in? Incidentally, you ever hear of the tears of Talani? Tears of Talani? What's that? Six rubies stolen from a temple in India. Rubies? I don't understand. Now look, that package which your father sent you from India just before he died. Mike, could you... you think the rubies were in that package? Yeah, I don't know yet. You know, Marco, you told me to get out of this deal. Now I'm telling you, you better do the same. None of it smells good. I'm going to get out of it, Michael. If it's those stolen rubies that were in that package, I... I don't want any part of them. Well, that's good to hear. Michael, please... Don't get mixed up in any more of it. Please. Mm, you're so convincing. Okay, baby, I'll tell you what. As of tomorrow morning, we'll both of us forget the whole deal, huh? That's a promise. Mm hmm. That's a promise. After all, there are a lot pleasanter things you and I could concentrate on. Aren't they? <laughs> Well, as far as I was concerned, that was it. I was through. 
I went out home. Just as I got there and started down the hall to my room, my landlady's door opened. She came out with a couple of milk bottles in her hand. Why, Mr. What? Shea, what in the world's happened to you? Huh? Your coat, there's a button missing and a tear in it. And your face, will you just look at that lump on the side of your Yeah, door? yeah, yeah, Mrs. Wilkins. Just, uh, just put it down that I've had a bad night. Honestly, Mr. Shane, why don't you find something else to do for a living? Something safe. You know, I think you got something there. Hey, look, would you mind sending this coat out to be fixed first thing in the morning? I'm going to sleep late. Sure, you just leave it with me. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll empty the pockets. Fountain pen, wallet, couple of bills. That's funny. Hmm? What is? There is cigarette package. I don't see nothing funny about a package with two cigarettes in it, Mr. Shea. But all evening I was sure I was out of cigarettes. I remember I had a pack on my desk and I smoked the last one right after Benny got killed. Benny killed? Mr. Shade, what are you talking about? I'm sure about? I only had that one pack when I got to the office today. Well, anyway, these aren't my brand. Of... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mr. Shane, what is Oh, never mind, Mrs. Wilkins. I'll see you later. <laughs> It had hit me all of a sudden. Benny had grabbed my arm while he was in my office. He'd slipped the cigarette package in my pocket then. And he told me to be careful what I threw away. Yeah, it all made sense now. In my room, I tore the cigarette package apart, and there it was, tucked behind the foil. A little piece of tissue paper. The diagram of a deserted warehouse down on one of the piers, and an X in one corner of the warehouse. I had a very strong hunch about what I'd find at the X. I let myself into the warehouse a little after midnight. It was dark inside. I went to the corner marked by the X on the diagram. There was a little pile of rubbish there. I poked around and I pulled out a small leather case. I opened it and held it up to the window. There were six flashes of red. Yeah, the tears of Talani. I stood there a minute thinking of a native temple and a priest who'd put a curse on the rubies and died with a smile on his lips. And then I quit thinking about anything because I heard a sound. Somebody was opening the warehouse door. You're in here somewhere, aren't you, Mr. Shane? I'll find you, Mr. Shane. Yeah, it was Alex, the giggling knife thrower. He was silhouetted against the open doorway for a second, and then he started slowly across the warehouse toward me. I began circling around to my left. The idea was to try and get past him to the door, and then I stumbled into a crate. A knife plunked into the wood an inch from my ear. Well, at least my boy had lost his sting. I straightened up, and it almost cost me my life. And then I realized Alex probably had a year's supply of cutlery with him. So I started circling again, and this time I didn't make any noise. Finally, I got to the open door and eased outside. But as soon as I hit the pier, something very familiar came flying through the air at me. It was Jeremiah's peg leg. Oh. Well, now, Mr. Shane, you shouldn't be trying to leave in such a hurry. There. Oh. This hammerlock ought to keep you nice and peaceful, Mr. Shane. If you move, your arm will snap like a masthead in a hurricane. Jeremiah, you... Don't try to talk just yet, Mr. Shane. Just get your wind back. Getting hit in the stomach's kind of hard on a man. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're so right. Jeremiah, Jeremiah. Mr. Shane is with me, Alex. Good, good. Oh, yeah. I was afraid. He outmaneuvered you, Alex. You will please not tell Mr. Sick that, Jeremiah. So, you and Alex are on the same team. Hey, Jeremiah. Shipmates, Mr. Shane. Shipmates. Come on, time to shove off. To see Mr. Sick again, of course. <laughs> Of course. And with that small package that's sticking out of your pocket, Mr. Shane, I can tell you'll be a very welcome visitor. Come along. So I came along. I didn't exactly have much choice. But much to my surprise, we didn't go to Mr. Sick's boat. But to an apartment a few blocks away from the waterfront. Mr. Sick was waiting for us there with a broad, yellow-toothed grin splitting his purple lips. And uh, now, Mr. Shane, kindly hand me that leather case. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. At last. You'll be happy to know you've saved Jeremiah's life, Mr. Shane. What do you mean? It was Jeremiah's blunder which lost us the map to your friend Benny. I don't get it. We've been on the trail of these rubies for some time. Jeremiah finally persuaded the original thief to give him the map showing him where the rubies were hidden. Then he was careless enough to lose it to Penny before we'd even gotten a look at it. I see. I, uh, I do not tolerate blunders. 
If Jeremiah had cost us the rubies, he'd have paid with his life. Well, you tell him I'm very happy for him, Mr. Sick. Oh, but I do not intend to see him again, Mr. Shane. Or uh, Alex, for that matter. Oh, you're quite the cagey kid, aren't you? A quaint way of putting it. But fairly accurate. So this jewel thief and killer called the Tiger Shark is just a legend, yeah? <laughs> oh, I could see you were not convinced earlier this evening when I told you there was no such person. Yeah. Well, you don't mind me asking one more question. Not at all. What happens to me? Mr. Shane, within the minute you will discover that any encounter with a Tiger Shark is inevitably fatal. <laughs> In a moment, we'll be back with the thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, there I was in six apartment. I'd handed over the rubies, and according to him, I was about to hand over something else. Namely, my life. Mr. Shane, time is a fleeting thing. And right now, it is a luxury which you can no longer afford. Therefore... Drop the gun, what? Mr. Sick. Margo. Drop it. Baby, am I glad to see you. Margot, my dear, I'm glad you got here. I, I bet you're glad, sick. Hey, wait a minute. I told you to keep out of this, Michael. I was beginning to like you. Yeah. Uh, Margot, we, we we have the rubies now. We oh, can... no, sick. I heard enough to realize you were going to double-cross me and keep them for yourself. Why, you, you've got it all wrong, my dear. I, I wouldn't think of double-crossing you. I, I was just amusing myself at Mr. Shane's expense. Then amuse yourself with this. Oh, no, Margot, no. Margot! Don't move, Michael. So all along you were running the show, Marco. That's right, Michael. Sure, I should have figured it. I guess I forgot there are female sharks, too. Yes, and the pity is you never see a shark's teeth until it's too late. Now I have them at last. I spent a year following this little leather case around the world, Michael. And now they're mine. The rubies to lie's teeth. Yeah, there they are. There. What? What's the matter? No. No. What? The the paste. Paste! Paste! The weapon! She stood there with that beautiful red mouth hanging open. Her eyes riveted on the imitation rubies. The guard was down. I dove for the gun and wrenched it away. She didn't even struggle. She just sort of sagged slowly to the floor. I called the police, and they were happy to take over from there. Well, that's about it. It's been over for some time now, but I can't seem to forget it. Because it's made me think about a lot of things. About a native priest. How he protected his temple's treasures by substituting imitations. How he smiled as he told Achille you can't profit by stealing from a temple. About the real tears of Talani, still safe in that temple. And about Margot and her outfit lying, stealing, and killing to get their hands on six globs of red paste. Yeah, I've been thinking about all of that. Because, you know, it's occurred to me that there just might be a lesson in it somewhere. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday and written by Bob Wright. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chan. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Char production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. smashed through the wind. I just held my breath and said a few appropriate words to any archangels that might be listening. I felt something bite into my neck. I thought, so long, Mike. It's been fun. New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode with Michael Shane. 
that reckless, red-headed Irishman back at his old haunts in New Orleans. We call it The Case of the Hunted Bride. Michael Shane, the, the private detective. Yeah, you have a chair. I'll be finished shaving in a second. Thank you. You always shave in your office. Yeah, usually. Yeah, oh, that, that's good enough. You know, it's a funny thing about this razor. For years, it hummed Jeannie with the light brown hair. The last couple of days, just can't seem to carry it to him. I had no intention of seeing you when I came to New Orleans. I just wanted to see the city again. To perhaps to capture some of the pleasant memories. You see, I grew up here. That's so? Yes. And I wanted to see it just once more. Before I die. Which should be sometime around 1990. Which will be tonight. What's wrong with waiting till 1990? It's my husband, George. Yeah, yeah, it usually is. No, you don't understand, Mr. Shane. I love George. He's my whole life. Well, then why end it? Knowing what I do, I... I can't go on. I don't want to live. Yet, what if I'm wrong? What if none of it is true? I want you to find out the truth. Just what do you think is the truth, dear lady? That my husband, George, is a murderer. <laughs> In a moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the hunted bride. Her name was Grace Morris. Mrs. George Morrison, to be exact. She lived in the capital city of a neighboring state, and she was so madly in love with her husband, she was about to drop dead. If that's that love they write those beautiful songs about, I'll stick to my electric razor. Anyway, I told her to go back home, that I'd take a run up and see her as soon as I cleared up a few things around the office, and that we'd soon find out whether her husband was a murderer or not. In either case, I was to get my usual 20 bucks a day. Lovable little me. As it turned out, I didn't arrive in her city until early the next evening. I registered in a little hotel, and then I telephoned her. Phone seemed to ring forever. And just when I was about to hang up. Hello? Mrs. Morrison? Hello? Mr. Mr. Shane. Hey. Hey, what's wrong? Hey, Mrs. Morrison. Hello? Hello? Twenty minutes later, a taxi let me out in front of a small bungalow. A guy was standing on the front porch, fumbling in his coat pocket. He heard me coming and spun around. What do you want? Morrisons live here. What did they do? Oh, I just talked to Mrs. Morrison on the phone. She sounded like she was in trouble. What is this? Another one of their tricks? Whose tricks? Come on, get this door open. I'm warning you, if you try anything... You may be dying in there. Will you open this door? Dying? Oh, step on it. Hey, hey, what are you shaking for? Well, I, uh... Hey, hey, give me that key. They've done anything to Grace. Grace! Grace, where are you? <laughs> Wait! Yes! <laughs> found her on the floor in the hall with the telephone receiver still in her hand. The guy who turned out to be her husband carried her to a couch. I headed for the gas heater, shut off the gas and started opening windows. When I got back to the living room, Grace was coming out of the fog. You're going to be all right, sweetheart. You're going to be okay. You better call a doctor, Mr. Morrison. She looks okay. Call a doctor. But... But what? If we can work it without a doctor... What's the matter? Don't you trust anybody? Look, mister, I don't know who no, you let's are. let's not start that again. See if you've got any spirits of ammonia in the house. I think we have. All right, put a spoonful in the glass of water and make it snappy. All right. I'll get it right away. Hey, Morrison, don't close the front door. We need air in here. There's plenty of air coming through the windows. I'll get the medicine now. Friendliest man in town. George. <laughs> George. Quiet, it wasn't you. George. Couldn't have been you. George. You just take it easy, Mr. Morrison. Mr. Shane. 
Yeah. Well, that was kind of foolish, sweetheart. What do you mean? I'm the old-fashioned type. In my book, turning on the gas is foolish. But I didn't turn on the gas. What? No. I guess I dozed off. The phone woke me up and the house was full of gas. I didn't realize how bad until I answered the phone and everything started blacking out. Well, then who did turn on the gas? Uh, I don't know. You think it was your husband, don't you? I don't know. Well, I don't think so. Not the way he acted when he came in here. Oh, Mr. Shane, I don't know what to think anymore. What makes you believe he's killed anybody? I'll talk to you later. Now, while he's still upstairs. No, Mr. Shane. Come on, come on. The telegrams. That's what started it. Telegrams? The first one came six months ago. George had been out of work for so long, and he was desperate. As soon as he got the telegram, he went away without saying a word. He came back two days later with $250. Well, that doesn't mean anything. He, could he wasn't the same, George. He began having terrible nightmares. He'd wake up screaming he didn't want to kill. And that's not all that happened. Someone's Wait, trying... Rich. How are you feeling now, Grace? Better, George. I don't know what happened, George. It's okay. Okay, we'll talk about it later. Here, take a drink of this. If they've done this... Who's they, Morris? Huh? Oh, nothing. Come on, Grace. I'll take care of you. He carried her upstairs, and the way they looked at each other, I wanted to whip out a violin and play gypsy music. What was going on here? Well, I lit a cigarette and wandered through the house trying to make sense out of what Grace had told me. Trying to understand how that fitted in with the hemstitched God bless our happy home that hung over the sofa. Then the phone started ringing. Hello? So you got home in time to save your wife. All righty, we'll try again. What? How does it feel wondering when it's going to happen? Wondering if it's going to be you or your wife. Joe Blake didn't have to wonder, did he? Joe Blake? Wait a minute. Who is this? This is Mike Shane. Now, hello. Hello. Put the phone down, Shane. Yeah, but, but I look. said put the phone down. Sure. Some woman, she sounded like... I know how she sounded. Hey, who's Joe Blake? It's getting late, Shane. You're so subtle, Mr. Morris. Who's Joe Blake? Good night, Mr. Shane. Before I go, can I ask you one final question, Mr. Morrison? Well, who's Joe Blake? You ask a silly question, you get a silly answer. I heard the lock click behind me. Then the lights went out inside the house. It was a cold, black night. A couple of blocks away, I saw a lighted street, and I heard a streetcar. I started walking toward it, and then... Then I stopped. Not a sound. Not a... Sound was light. Might even have been a twig falling, only twigs don't wear shoes. The sound of the streetcar was louder now, but so were the footsteps. I'm a nervous guy. I put a cigarette in my mouth and struck a match, giving him a chance to pass me. I flicked the match away and watched it make an arc of flame. Before it could complete the arc, a bigger flame exploded in my head. No! How long it lasted. It was like spending the summer in a cement mixer. The pain didn't mean anything after a while, and I stopped trying to crawl away. All right, Ralph, that's enough. I said that's enough! Suddenly, everything stopped. Then I heard a nice, friendly sound. A gun getting ready for action. Turn the flash on him, Ralph. You can see him all right, Ruthie. I want to see him better than all right. I want to watch his face when he gets it. Ruthie, okay, somebody might see us. Go on, get it over with. I said turn the flash on him. All right, all right. I had the lights on Joey when he died. All right, now you got your light. Hey, wait. Huh? This guy ain't Morrison. No. No, he isn't. How do you like that? The punk. Oh, punk. Oh. I guess eventually Ralph's foot started hurting him. Anyhow, he stopped kicking, and they left. For a long time, I lay there, snuggling up to a couple of rusty garbage cans. 
The moth-eating tomcat came up and stared at me for a long time, but he figured I was too big to eat, so he moved on, too. Outside of that, I was left all to myself, at peace among the melon rinds. It wasn't all wasted, though. I was beginning to fit things together. It sure looked now like husband George had killed Joe Blake. But finally, I was able to get to my feet and find a taxi and get back to my hotel. As I walked through the lobby of my hotel, somebody climbed out of an overstuffed chair and started toward me. It was George Morrison. I've been waiting for you, Shane. Oh, it's too bad. What happened to your face? I ran into some friends of yours, Morrison. I want to see you upstairs. Well, I hope that's a first aid kit you're holding in your pocket. Upstairs, Shane. <laughs> What do you want? Grace finally admitted what you really were, Shane. Oh, people have been calling me that for years. We don't need any private detectives around here. Start packing. You're going back to New Orleans. But I just got here. Start packing. Suppose I don't. You'll find out you were wrong about what I got in my pocket. Okay. Yeah, this suitcase sure gets a beating. There's a train leaving here at midnight. I've already made your reservation. Well, that's mighty friendly. What's the matter? Someone on the fire escape. Take a dive. Now. I took a dive to the floor myself, knocking over the lap, plunging the room into darkness. Half a dozen bullets smashed through the window. I just held my breath and said a few appropriate words to any archangels who might be listening. I felt the splinter of glass bite into my neck. I thought, so long, Mike. It's been fun. moment, we'll return to Mike Shane and the case of the hunted bride. Life was getting complicated again. Here I leave the peace and quiet of New Orleans to come to this town because Grace Morrison had decided her husband George was a murderer. And everything that had happened since my arrival had convinced me that the lady was so right. Now I was nibbling the rug on my hotel room floor while someone on the fire escape kept pumping bullets through the glass at George and me. Finally, I realized that the shooting had stopped. Then I heard footsteps down the fire escape. I raced to the window just as some guy reached the yard below. At the edge of the yard, a girl huddled against a fence trying to keep out of range of the street lamp. She was wasting her time, though. Even from where I stood, I recognized her as Ruthie, the little sweetheart I'd met in the alley earlier in the evening. As I watched, the guy on the fire escape joined her. He turned out to be Ralph, the happy-go-lucky chap who tried to dropkick my head into the Gulf of Mexico. They hurried away. Then I remembered George Morrison. Oh, what's the matter with you? Yeah, let me get the light on. Where are you hit, Morrison? In the shoulder. Yeah, yeah, let's draw the gun. What a good it did you. I didn't get a chance. Time killer like you doesn't look too good. What are you going to do? Call a doctor? No. What do you got against doctors? You know, some of those guys are pretty talented. Shane, put the phone down, please. Operator. Operator. Shane, I beg you. I don't care about myself, but for my wife's sake. What do you mean? If we get a doctor, he'll have to report it to the police. Everything will come out in the open. You know, I think I'd like that. Well, Grace wouldn't understand. Never be the same with us again. Now, please, Shane, give me a break. It's been tough enough. Why are those two gunners trying to kill you? Because they don't understand. Because they're blaming me for something I couldn't help. For killing Joe Blake. Did you kill him? Shane, you don't understand. Just answer me. Now, listen, you... Answer me. Did you kill Joe Blake? Yes, but you... Shane. Who's there? The house detective, Mr. Shane. Shane, if you'll let me explain, you'll understand everything. All right. Stay here in the bedroom. Huh? What is it? Now, some of the guests report hearing shots. They say they think they came from your suite, Mr. Shane. My suite? Well, man, I, I was just taking a nap. <sighs> nice mattresses you got in this hotel. You didn't hear any shots? <laughs> when I sleep, I don't hear nothing. Huh? <sighs> now, how come you heard my knock? Yeah, that's right. You know, science has a lot of things to explain. Uh, shots didn't come from your bedroom. No, no. Well, all right. 
Sorry to have disturbed you, Mr. Shane. Oh, it's okay, officer. Well, come around any time at all. Okay, now, George, start to... Hey, George. It wasn't really George. It was only a little trail of blood leading to the window. For the second time that night, somebody clattering down the fire escape. Leave it to a house stick to knock on the right door at the wrong time. After that, I did the only intelligent thing I'd done all day. I went to sleep. Early the next morning, I called Grace Morrison. She told me that George had come home late with his arm all banged up. Said he'd bumped into something. Then I went over to the police department. Being as coy as possible, I tried to find out if the cops were looking for George Morrison or a reasonable facsimile. They weren't. I went to the public library and got out all the old newspaper files. You know, I didn't find Morrison's name, but Joe Blake's name was scattered through the crime news like confetti. A cheap little hoodlum who'd done everything in the books. One picture showed him and Ruthie smiling at each other across a nightclub table. Ruthie looked better in those days. The last item said Joe was being sought in connection with a gangland murder. That was six months ago. There were no more papers. The librarian told me the other issues hadn't been bound yet, but she'd get them for me. I couldn't wait. Something was clicking in my brain. I left the library and headed for the corner drugstore. I found a phone booth. Dial the Times Express. I know a guy on the crime beat. Pete? Yeah, hiya, kid. Long time no see. Oh, it's Mike Shane. Yeah. Hey, uh, hey, Pete, can you give me a little information? Yeah. Ever hear of a guy named Joe Blake? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Oh, tell me, what finally happened to Joe? There comes the dawn. And the guy who pulled it? Yeah, I know it's supposed to be confidential, but... Well, was his name George Morrison? Yeah. Hey, Pete, tell me something, will you? Where do I go to donate my head to the fat drive? <laughs> I'll explain later. You know, right now i got to make another call, quick. Oh, shame, when they were passing out brains, you must have been out to the uh, uh, Just a minute, Mac, I'll be right out. Hey, will you stop pounding up? Oh. I looked out to see who was making like a woodpecker on the glass, and I found myself looking into the little pink eyes of Ruthie's friend, Ralph. He motioned me to come out of the booth. Well, at the moment, there wasn't any place else to go. Come on, Mr. Shane. Oh, sure, but where? Back to your hotel room. Why? You got company. Uh, not interested. Get interested real fast. I got a gun right on your spine. So we went back to my hotel room. He waited in the hallway till I unlocked the door and closed it behind me. Then I heard him going back down the hall. I stood for a moment in the darkness. Then I saw the glowing cigarette. I snapped on the light. It was Ruthie making herself very comfortable on the sofa. She sat up, smoothing her dress down with one hand and holding a gun in the other. Nice couch. Nice room. Mine. I know. That's why I came. I'm only paying for a single. They'll have to raise the rent. Would you mind? Yeah. You see, I can never be myself with a girl when she's holding a gun. I want you to do something for me, Michael. Sure. Coax me, Ruthie. Get on the phone. I'm going to give you a number to call. Swell. If a man answers, I'll hang up, huh? I want you to call Brighton 4506. Brighton 45... That's George Morrison's number. Uh-huh. I don't think I want to, Ruthie, honey. It's a shame, Michael. And I'm going to have to kill you. Go on, get on that phone. Brighton 4506. Yeah. Operator. Uh, Brighton 4506. 4506, thank you. What do you want me to say? I want you to tell George Morrison to come over and see you right away. Tell him it's very urgent. 
As the phone rang, I glanced out the window. Down on the sidewalk, I saw Ralph leaning against a lamppost and reading a paper. I guess it was then that the idea came to me. It wasn't great, but so what? I had about as much chance as a guy buying a ticket on the Irish sweepstakes, only if I lost, I couldn't just tear up the ticket and try again next year. Hello? Oh, hello, Grace. This is Mike Shane. Oh, Mr. Shane, I'm so glad you called. I'd like to speak to your husband, George. He's on his way over to see you at the hotel. I don't know what for. What? Yes, he... Oh, fine. Well? You're in luck, Ruthie. Morrison's on his way over here now. Isn't that nice, Mike? You must have gone for Joe Blake in a big way. We were so right for each other, Joe and I. When that happens, you don't want to lose it. Where are you going? Open this window. It's stuffy in here. Sit down. You get nervous, Mike. Me fresh out of Broma. I said sit down. But I didn't sit down right away. Now the plan had to work. There was nothing else. I looked down at Ralph again. While I watched, he looked up. I sat down on the windowsill, lit a cigarette. Ruth was thinking about Joe Blake. You could tell it by looking at her eyes or lips. She didn't even notice me. I signaled to Ralph with my head for him to come up. He dropped the newspaper and looked confused, but he didn't move. Now, the plan was no good. I started walking again. I told you, sit down, Mike. Okay, Ruthie, but I've seen it work in a lot of bad pictures. What are you talking about? Nothing. nothing. You get it. Okay. Yeah? Let me talk to Ruth. Oh, you better tell her that yourself. Huh? I told you. Hello? Uh, Hello? Uh, What's going on up there? I'm coming up. Hmm, he hung up. Who was that? It was your friend Ralph. What did he say? Uh, George Morrison just came into the lobby. He's on his way upstairs. All right. Sit down on that chair. It's funny about love, isn't it, Ruthie? When it's right, you're singing in the rain. When it's wrong... There was nothing wrong with Joe and me. The only good thing that ever happened to me. Morrison had to destroy it. It wasn't Morrison. He just did what he was told. Did what he was told? Ruth, there's only a few seconds left. This is the last chance you're ever going to have in all this world. Give me that gun. No. Open the door for Morrison and then duck. No. Hurry up. Suppose it's your boy, Ralph. Are you kidding? Open that door, Shane, or you'll never open another one. No, Ruthie. All right, Mike. In a moment, we'll be back with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. The first shot, I ducked fast. Then I realized that she wasn't shooting at me. She was shooting through the door. And even before the smoke cleared away, a trickle of red began slipping in from under the door like a calling card. (laughs) She started for the door, chuckling to herself, like she'd suddenly gotten the tagline of a joke that had been bothering her for weeks. Then she opened the door and saw her pal Ralphie crumpled in the hall. She stopped laughing. She stood in the doorway, her head thrown back like she was going to sing grand opera. Only all that came out was one piercing, crazy scream. Yeah, it was all over. All the way around. I called Grace Morrison from the railroad station. I only had a couple of minutes, so I told her to her fast. I guess a little too fast. But I... I don't understand, Mr. Shane. You say I was wrong about George? Yeah, completely wrong. Those telegrams. His nightmares. Those people who tried to kill him. Well, I haven't time to tell you everything, Mrs. Morrison. Just take my word for it. Those jobs he's been going on, they're so legal, it hurts. You know, sometimes I think a lot of marriages would be better off if they change that love, honor, and obey routine to just love, honor, and trust. You know what I mean, Grace? Yeah. That's just about the whole story. Except for one little footnote printed in small type and strictly between us boys. What I told Grace was partly the truth. Those jobs George Morrison goes on are perfectly legal. But her one big fear is absolutely correct. Every time George gets one of those telegrams, he does kill a man. Just as he killed Joe Blake. Still, if George doesn't want her to know, well, then I guess that's his business. Because, you see, George Morrison is the official state prison executioner. Yeah. The guy who pulls the switch. <laughs> Michael Shane is written for radio by Larry Marcus from characters created by Brett Halliday. 
The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another suspense thriller. It's a story you'll long remember and one I will never forget. dark except for a ray of moonlight coming through the window. I started reaching around for the light switch. Then I saw something glinting in the air. It was a knife blade that was headed straight for my throat. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Jeff Chandler. Michael Shane, reckless, red-headed Irishman, is back again in his old haunts in New Orleans. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to another transcribed episode, which we call The Case of the Mail Order Murders. Who is it? Shane, Mike Shane. Oh, Hello, Mr. Shane. Come in quickly, please. Yeah. Hey, look, what's all... Did the... anyone follow you here to my apartment, Mr. Shane? Follow me? Well, not that I know of. What's this all about and why the hocus pocus routine? I can't afford to take any chances. Oh? Can you afford to tell me what it's all about? My name is Kinsella. William Kinsella. Yeah, I know. You told me that over the phone. You're sure no one followed you here? Sure enough. Now, you're going to let me in. I, I want to go... hire you, Mr. Shane. Ah. Ah, that's the first thing you've said that makes sense. What do you want me to do? Protect me. Well, from what? I... Don't know. You don't know. Now, now, let's not start the double talk again. Oh, please, Mr. Shea. I... Well, to tell the truth, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Yeah, I can see that. But what of? I tell you, I don't know. Sure, it sounds insane, but... But here, Mr. Shea. I received this through the mail this afternoon. Yeah. Four names at the top of the page. Yes. William Kinsella, Ellen Dant, Joshua Jaffet, and Tom Swigers. Yes. Now, read what's written underneath the names, Mr. Shea. Those who have sinned will be punished. It may come swiftly or slowly or by an unknown hand, but punishment is inevitable, and the punishment is death. (laughs) Yes. Yes, you see now why I'm terrified. It's a death note, Mr. Shane. A death note. And my name is at the top of the list. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the mail-order murders. It started out as a pretty routine day. I'd helped an elderly lady find a necklace which turned out to be mislaid instead of stolen. I'd spent the afternoon at a pretty stuffy wedding reception guarding the gifts. But then in the evening, a jittery little guy named Kinsella called me over to his apartment and showed me a death note he'd just gotten, listing his name with three others. One look at Kinsella's face told me he thought the guy who'd sent the note meant business. Mr. Shade, you've got to protect me. Money's no object. First, I... Uh, Now, now, just a minute, Mr. Kinsella. Let's slow down a little. Uh, Have you any idea who might have sent the note? None. Not at all, Mr. Shane. It's a complete and horrible mystery to me. Hmm. Sounds like some kind of fanatic or crank. Those who have sinned will be punished. Yes. It does sound like some sort of fanatic, but... But who? Is this the first notes you've gotten? No, there have been others, but I never paid much attention before because the notes were vague. But this note mentions death, and it lists names. Yeah. I wonder if the boy who wrote the note is after you himself or if he's thinking of sending someone. What do you mean? Well, the note says death may come by an unknown hand. But that's the terrible part of this whole thing. I don't know who sent the threat. I don't know who's after me, and I most certainly don't know why. The uh, note says something about those who have sinned. That's ridiculous. There's nothing, absolutely nothing in my past that would possibly warrant such Yeah, a... yeah. Well, what do these friends of yours say about it? Friends? What friends? Well, the other names on the list. Here, let's see. Uh, Ellen Dant, Joshua Jaffet, Tom Swagger. They're no friends of mine. Well, acquaintances, then. You don't understand, Mr. Shane. I don't even know these people. Huh? I've never heard of any of them. Their names mean nothing to me. You sure about that, Mr. Kinsella? Absolutely. 
Yeah, that sort of complicates things. I thought maybe if I could find something to connect you with these other three, some link between you, we might have something to go on. But Mr. I... Shane, please stay here with me and protect me at least long enough for me to wind up my affairs so that I can leave New Orleans if necessary. Well, I... I don't know what your usual rate of pay is per day, but I'll double it. You know, you're getting more convincing by the moment, Mr. Kinsella. I have plenty of room for you here. Okay. I'll go home and pick up a toothbrush and be back here in an hour. I went outside and down the street. I was thinking about how terrified Kinsella seemed to be about the whole thing. I was wondering if maybe he knew a little more about why someone wanted to kill him than he'd told me. And then about half a block away from Kinsella's apartment, I spotted what was undoubtedly one of the last of its kind in existence. An organ grinder man. He was a stocky, barrel-chested gent. And the hand organ he was cranking sounded as if it was protesting against overwork. On his shoulder perched a little monkey dressed in a red corduroy suit and a green hat with a feather. And the whole sight took me back about 20 years. So I fished around in my pocket for a coin and waited for him. Hello. Mr. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Well, I... I guess you didn't see me. Sort of a dark night. Yes, a darker night. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I haven't seen an organ grinder since I was a kid, practically. So? There's not many of us left now. No, I guess not. You're working kind of late tonight, huh? Night or day makes no difference. Yeah, yeah I guess you're right. Hey, it's a monkey you got there. It's a fine monkey, Pepe. You want to see Pepe do dance? No, I'm afraid I haven't the time. Uh... Name is uh, Dimitrius. Uh, Dimitrius. Some other time. Huh? Here's a little something. You throw to Pepe. He catch. Okay. Hey, he could play shortstop on a few teams I know of. Where'd you get? Must go now. Thanks, Mister. Good night. <laughs> started cranking the hand organ again and moved on down the street. Pepe turned around, stared at me a moment, and then delicately stuck out his tongue. <laughs> Such gratitude. I went to my room, picked up my things, and went back to Kinsella's apartment. He showed me to my new room. I suggested he lock his door and also his window because it was a ground floor apartment. Then we both turned in. I guess it was a little after midnight when something woke me up. I couldn't tell just what it was, but I remembered vaguely hearing some kind of sound. I got out of bed and went out in the living room. I turned on the lights. <coughs> Nothing there. Then I went to Kinsella's bedroom door. Mr. Kinsella? Mr. Kinsella? Hey, Kinsella! Huh? Well, uh, what is it? Shane, open the door. What's the matter, Shane? Had me worried for a minute. I guess I was sound asleep. What is it? Uh, something woke me up. A, a slight noise. I thought I'd better check to make sure you're okay. Oh, yes, I'm all right. Matter of fact, I was having a very pleasant dream. I could hear some sort of strange music. Uh, seemed like it was right under my window. Music? Uh, yes, uh, like, a, like a calliope. I, I could hear... A calliope? Oh, sort of. Hey, wait a minute. Could it have been a, a hand organ? What? Yes, yes, that's what it was. Uh, I, I dreamt I... Maybe the music but... wasn't a dream. Mm, Demetrius really does work late. Huh? What are you talking about? Skipper. Well, let's turn in again. Nothing happened the rest of the night except that I had a long dream about perching on a guy's shoulder dressed in a red corduroy suit while people tossed nickels at me. Yeah, it might be an easier way to make a living at that. The next morning, bright and early, I told Kinsella to lock himself in for the day. And I went down to police headquarters and in the door marked homicide. Hello, Shane. Good morning, Inspector. How's the mastermind of the homicide bureau these days? Thanks. You looking for a job, Shane, or you want to borrow some dough? No. As you sometimes say, LaFever, wrong twice. I already have a job. Matter of fact, that's what I came down to talk to you about. I'm all... Years. I know. Talk, funny man. I've been hired by a guy named Kinsella who received what looks like a crank note. He was taking the whole thing very seriously. So... So the note has four names on it, Kinsella. Ellen Dant, Joshua Jaffet, and Tom Swagger. May not be anything to it, but I just thought I'd drop in and let you know. Let's have it again. Have what again? The list. William Kinsella, Ellen Dant, Joshua Jaffet, and Tom Swaggers. Yeah. Why, do you know any of them? Uh, how about Ellen Dant? Kinsella said her name meant nothing to him. Or me. How about Joshua Jaffet? Mm-mm. 
And I've never heard of your client, Kinsella. Only one we have a line on is this Tom Swigert. Swigert's his last name on the list. What about him? Shane, did you ever hear of the gouge killing a couple years back? The gouge killing? No. What was that? Well, there was a rich old gent named Daniel Gouge. He used to live on the island of Capri in the Mediterranean. One day he turned up dead with quite a few thousand of his dollars missing. This guy, Tom Swigert, was on the island at the time. He was questioned about the killing, but he was released later for lack of evidence. Hmm. Do you think this Nod Kinsella guy has anything to do with the gouge killing? I don't know, yet. Do you suppose maybe there's some connection between Swigert and the rest of the names on the list, then? That'd be a guess, Shane, and right now I'm not in a guessing mood. Of course, the whole thing could be some crackpot's idea of a joke. It might. You don't think so, huh? Nope. Hey, incidentally, how come this Tom Swigert's the only guy on the list you know anything about? Do you friend of yours or something? Not exactly a friend right now. He's sort of a special project of mine. What do you mean? We found Swigert down near the waterfront last night. Had a knife in his back. Very dead. In a moment, we'll return to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the case of the mail-order murders. started when a guy named Kinsella hired me to protect him from an unknown killer who'd sent him a death threat. On the note were listed four names. Kinsella, Ellen Dant, Joshua Jaffert, and Tom Swigert. Kinsella said he didn't know any of the other three. So the next morning, I wasn't sure just how seriously to take the note when I went down to police headquarters to tell Inspector Lefebvre about it. But Lefebvre took it very seriously, and with good reason. He told me that the last man on the list, Tom Swigert, had been murdered the night before. So, like I say, Shane... Whoever wrote that note means business. You know, the favor, it'd be interesting if it turned out that the reason Swigert was killed had something to do with that gouge killing. I don't feel like playing guessing games. Well, maybe we'll find out before long, huh? Shane, you're a real nice boy. The favor, there's only one reason you ever say those sweet things to me. That's when you want me to keep out of something. Yeah. Why? Because whoever wrote that note wasn't kidding. He's vicious and deadly. He's already killed once, and there are three more names on his list. So? So if you get mixed up in it and get in his way, you could get burned bad. Thanks for the advice, Lefevre. No charge. Tell you what, I'll carry my little fire extinguisher with me full time. You do that, Shane. Just one more thing. Oh, no, Lefevre. You're not going to give me that don't leave town routine again. I was going to suggest that you do. That evening, I decided to pay a call on Ellen Dent whose name was right under Kinsella's on the death list. I looked up her address and went over. Ellen lived in an expensive-looking apartment, and she was a very smooth-looking creature. She wasn't very impressed when I told her about the note Kinsella had gotten. Mr. Shane, I've never heard of this man, Kinsella. Why should I be concerned about his getting threatening notes? I got one of them, too. But I think it's probably somebody's feeble idea of a joke. Uh, Not much of a joke, Miss Dent. Kinsella says he doesn't know you. That makes it mutual, then, as I've been trying to tell you. How about a gent named Joshua Jaffet? I'm afraid I don't know him, either. Or Tom Swigert? Really, Mr. Shane? That's just as well you didn't know Swigert, I guess. He got himself killed last night. Oh? But that doesn't concern you. No, it doesn't. Now, if you'll excuse me. Sure, just one more thing, Mr. Ant. Ever happen to hear of a rich old guy named Daniel Gouge? Gouge? Yeah, I used to live on the island of Capri. Really, Mr. Shane? Running around asking people about names they've never heard of before. Haven't you anything better to do? Not right now, Ellen, but maybe I'll think of something. See you around. My next stop was at the home of Joshua Jaffet over on the other side of town. He was a tall, thin guy with thick glasses, a sharp nose, and a sharper tongue. They kept the nose buried in an enormous stamp album. Mr. Shane, must you stand in my light? I can't even see these stamps, let alone get them in the right place. I'm sorry. Is that better? A little. Quite a collection you got there. One of the best. You seem to specialize in stamps from the Mediterranean. Area. Any law against that? Not that I know of. Uh, ever done much traveling around there? None. Now, where did I put that Malta step? Now, now, look here, Shane. I'm looking. This is all foolishness, complete, utter foolishness. Just because I got a crackpot note from some tanks, there's no reason for you to come around and bother me with your silly questions. I've told you I don't know any of the people on the list. 
Now, if you guide oh, maybe I Mr. Figure. Shane, will you stop standing in my life? I got out of Joshua's light and out of his house. But outside, it occurred to me friend Joshua had been just a little too quick to say no when I asked him if he'd ever been in the Mediterranean. So I went across the street and waited in the dark. I didn't know exactly what I was waiting for, but I waited anyway. And then about ten minutes later, I heard someone coming down the street. Yeah, it was my old friend Demetrius, the organ grinder man. Hello, Demetrius. Uh, oh, you see you again. Yeah. Hey, you really get around, don't you? You... You maybe follow me, mister? Me? <laughs> no, matter of fact, I was beginning to wonder if it wasn't the other way around. I don't know what you talk about. Oh, no, no. Of course not. Uh, where do you usually hang out around town? The, the street they call the San Louis. You, uh, been in this country long, Demetrius? No. Not so long, mister. Where do you come from? <laughs> it's a long way from here. Sunny land, blue water. It sounds like the Mediterranean. Yes. It's a beautiful place. That's what they tell me, Demetrius. Good night, Demetrius. Demetrius disappeared around the corner. I stood there a while longer across the street and up a little way from Jaffet's house. It was about ten minutes later that a dark-colored coupe turned the corner and eased to a stop in front of the house. Someone got out and headed for the door. I couldn't see very much, but it looked like a woman. Then as she opened the door, the light from the hall outlined her face. It was Ellen Dant. Yeah, the girl who said she'd never heard of Joshua Jaffet. She closed the door behind her, but not more than two minutes later, she came flying out again and jumped into a car. I started across the street toward her. Hey! Hey, wait a minute! Ellen! Hey! Ah, but I was too late. I crossed the street and walked in the open front door of Jaffet's house. There was no one in sight. I started down the hall, and when I got to the library, I stopped... Yeah, there was Jaffet, all right. Sitting at his desk, his nose still buried in the stamp album. And like Tom Swigert, he had a knife in his back. And also like Swigert, Jaffet was dead. I stood there a minute or two looking at the charming sight in front of me, and then I went over and picked up a telephone. Calling me, Shane? Lefebvre. like the boy we're after is quite a knife artist, huh? Yeah, but I'm not so sure he's a boy. You know, the more I think about it, Lefebvre, the more it looks like these killings are tied up with the one over in Capri two years ago. Mm-hmm. You found out any more about what really happened over there? A little, not much. This rich old guy, Gouge, lived alone, except for one combination servant and secretary. Looks like now there were several in on the killing. Maybe it was a hired job, huh? Mm-hmm. Shane, I told you once to get out of this deal. Now I'm telling you twice. I think you're biting off a lot more than you can chew. You forget, Inspector. I have a real strong jaw. Mm -hmm. Just be sure you don't lead with it. The famous boys arrived about then and went to work. I left, and I went straight to Ellen Dance's apartment. Because it looked to me like this case was going to wind up real fast, and I couldn't think of a better place to wind it up than at her apartment. I didn't even bother to knock because the door was unlocked. I pushed it open with my foot and waited. Nothing happened. I went in. The room was dark except for a ray of moonlight coming through the window. I started reaching around for a light switch. Then I saw something glinting in the air. It was a knife blade that was coming down at me fast. I lunged to one side and the blade ripped down through my coat sleeve. I tried to grab it, but I was off balance. And then the knife came down through the air again. And this time it was headed straight for my throat. <laughs> We'll be back in a moment with a thrilling climax to tonight's Michael Shane adventure. Well, there I was in Ellen Dance's apartment, in the dark, with a knife coming down on my throat. I managed to get one hand up just in time to grab the knife blade. It cut into my palm, but I held on and grabbed the killer's wrist with my other hand. It was a small wrist, but strong. The knife started twisting up at me, so I put everything I had into one wrench and dove for the floor, twisting the killer's wrist as I fell. Suddenly, the knife went skittering across the floor. I jumped to my feet just as a door slammed. I went out in the hall, but whoever it was had been too fast for me. There was no one in sight out on the street when I got there. So I gave up the chase and headed for Kinsella's apartment. And I wasn't in a very pleasant mood. Look, Kinsella, I'm getting awfully tired of this whole deal. But, Mr. Shane, you... You lied to me when you said you didn't know what this is all about. Oh. All right, Mr. Shane. 
It's true. I can't lie to you. But you apparently know a lot of the story already. I might as well tell you the rest of it. Spill it. I was Daniel Gouger's secretary in Capri. He was murdered for his money. I found out who the killer was. I've been running away ever since. The killer has been following me and has had someone else after me. Someone I don't know. Yeah? Why didn't you tell the police who the killer was? I... I know I should have done that long ago, but I... Oh, I don't expect anyone to understand, but... It was because of the way I felt about the killer. I, I couldn't help myself. I see. Just one more question. Did Daniel Gouge have any particular girlfriend? Yes, Mr. Shane. Okay. We're going to set a little trap. Here's a pencil. I want you to write a note to Gouge's girlfriend, Ellen Dan. Mr. Shane. Tell her you'll turn her in unless she meets you on the corner in front of my office at midnight with some dough. But I couldn't do that. Look, I'll be there with you. I wasn't thinking of myself. I, I just... Look, couldn't... you want to go on this way forever? No, but... Write it. Very well. What are you going to do with it? Going to use it as bait. Mm, you're not exactly the world's best pen, are you? Well, I'm sorry. It's because I'm nervous and upset, I guess. I'm having a hard time forming the letters. Yeah. I'll write another note. Ah, never mind. I think I won't be able to read this one all right. Okay, Kinsella, stay here in your apartment until quarter of twelve. Then take a cab to my office and meet me on the corner in front. I think maybe we'll get this whole thing wound up. I put the note in my pocket and left. I went over to St. Louis Street and hung around until Demetrius, the monkey organ man, came along. I made a little conversation with him and invited him to the party in front of my office. Then I called the Fever's office and left an invitation for him, too. I was hoping it would be quite a gathering. Kinsella was the first to arrive, right on the dot at midnight. Mr. Shane. Yeah, hey, you're right on time, Kinsella. Yes, I've been riding around in the cab for a few minutes, waiting until 12. Has she shown up? Not yet. We'll just stand here in the shadows and wait. Uh, Mr. Shane, would it be all right if I sort of kept out of sight when she comes? I just would rather not see her after all that's happened and, well, because of the way I feel about her. Yeah, I think that'd be okay, Kinsella. Uh, I'd appreciate it very much. It isn't easy for me to do this. Uh, Mr. Shane, someone's coming. Relax, it isn't Ellen. Shane? Hello, Lefevre. I got your message. Now, what's this all about? Just giving a little party, Lefevre. I knew you'd never forgive yourself if you missed it. Mr. Shane, who's this? A Lefebvre, a friend of mine. Lefebvre, this is Mr. Kinsella, my client. Hello? I'm afraid I don't understand this, Mr. Shane. I thought just you and I were to be... Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, here he comes. Here who comes? The guest of honor. A guy named Demetrius. Why, it's an organ grinder. Mm-hmm. Mr. Shane, do you think that he is working for Ellen? Well, we'll soon find out. Hello, Demetrius. Hello, Mr. This supposed to be the floor show, Shane? You never can tell, the favor. Mr. Shane, will you kindly explain... Mr. This is... Mr. Oh, what's the matter, Demetrius? Who, who is this man with you? Well, he's my client, Mr. Kinsella. Why? He, he's the one, mister. He's the one. Huh? Yes, he's the one I saw leave his apartment the night the first man was killed. Yes, this is Kinsella. Let the, let's have that again. Why? The man's insane. Yes, I saw him. And then when the second man was killed, I was near his house. I looked through the window. I saw this Kinsella stab him to death. I tell you, he's crazy. And then tonight, when you were at the woman's apartment, mister, this Kinsella was there too. He attacked you. Oh, you Kinsella's got a gun. I see it, Lefebvre. I see it. Oh. Well, I think that'll keep our friend Kinsella on ice until your voice and cut him away, Lefebvre. Yeah. So Kinsella was the knife artist, huh? Sure looks that way. Now, if we only had the girl, we'd be... She's able... been in jail for an hour, Shane. We picked her up. Oh? Did she get a story out of her? Yeah. From what she said, it looks like she, Jaffet, and Swaggart hired a guy to kill Gouge over on Capri. The three of them then decided to cross the killer. They took the dough and left in a hurry. So now it turns out that Kinsella here was the killer, and he's been looking for them ever since. That sounds logical. He put his own name on top of the death list to take suspicion off of him. Well, all I can say is you're longer on luck than you are on brain, Shane. Oh? Arranging this little trap to pick up the wrong girl. Bloody lucky for you this guy Demetrius spilled what he'd seen and broke the case for you. I guess you're right, Lefebvre. Yeah, maybe next time you'll remember to keep out of these things. I'll try to, sir. Uh, me, sir. Oh, yeah, Demetrius. I'd almost forgotten you were here. Thanks. Thanks a lot for all your help. Well, that's all right, Demetrius. Uh, here's a little something for your trouble. No, no. Over here. Uh, uh, 
Thank you, mister. Thank you. Uh, hmm? Demetrius uh, didn't see that dough you held out to him. No. He's blind. Mm-hmm. Demetrius is blind. Shane... Like you say, Lefevre, it's lucky he broke the case for me, isn't it? Good night, genius. This is your director, Bill Russo, again. Our story is based on characters created by Brett Halliday and written by Bob Wright. The music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chan. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure, a mysterious and colorful New Orleans. Thank you.